so now they are completely up to speed and we're mm -hmm. looking forward to their hitting the ground running. Yeah, I believe um, they'll be signing in later. Uh, okay, great. All righty, so um, first item now is public open time. I don't know if we have any members of the public, but if we do, this is your time to make a comment if you would like to. And Darlene and Enyo, I hope you can see people because I sure can't. If you are wanting to make a comment, you can use the raise hand function and we'll make sure your uh, audio is enabled. Not seeing anyone though. All right, point. well, it may be a little bit early and maybe we'll have some folks uh, join us later. So, okay, I sort of, I wanted to get us going with just a few opening remarks and I think, um, at least for, for me at the county, and I think probably for many of you, you know, we spend so much time focusing on our obvious challenges of 2020, uh, the pandemic, uh, economic and budget issues, racial equity issues, um, the fires, the potential power shutoffs, the heat wave we had, the terrible smoky air, all of it. Um, it goes on and on and on and on and on, and, um, and it's been a challenging year. And in the midst of that, um, MCE has just done a lot of great work, and I'm just going to sort of tick through a list. And I think, um, you know, MCE's always prided itself on being nimble uh, and being able to adjust to new circumstances, and I think that this year has probably proved that. Uh, more than some of our years in the past. So it's a, it's a, this list, I think, at least for me, was a great opportunity to get into, be reminded of all the positive work that we are, we are able to do um, despite the challenges out there that we often get distracted and discouraged by. So here's the list. So as you know, uh, we celebrated our 10 year anniversary this year, which is really a landmark uh, both for us and for the C CCA movement in California as a whole. We enrolled new customers from Solano County and welcomed two new communities into our family, Vallejo and Pleasant Hill. We were able to maintain stable and healthy operations despite the PG&E bankruptcy, which ended mid-year. And honestly, I, since I have no sense of time, it seems like that PG&E bankruptcy was years ago, given everything that we've been through since then. But if you remember, that was indeed a big deal um, earlier in this year and something we were quite concerned about. We increased our proactive customer outreach, resulting in a stable and increasingly engaged customer base. We were able to pivot quickly to all remote work during the shelter in place while growing programs and activities. And you're gonna hear a lot more about that as we go through the program today. We launched an energy storage resiliency program to help folks with outages and emergencies. We continued installing EV charging stations at businesses and multifamily properties, reaching the milestone of 500 installations so far with 400 more on the pipeline. And I think this is so fantastic because I remember over, the, over recent years um, meeting with EV activists who, who were talking about how many inst EV charging installations we really needed if we were going to have the kind of future that uh, we want to have. And it just seemed like a daunting number that we would never get close to. And we've made tremendous progress in that direction. Uh, we've also deepened our commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion through ongoing staff trainings, an internal steering committee, and targeted community activities. And on the financial front, we received an upgrade to our Fitch credit rating from triple B to triple B plus with stable outlook. B plus is always a good thing, and I'm really looking forward to A minus. This kind of takes me back to high school in terms of what seems like a really good thing. Um, in that uh, that move up we made, Fitch cited, quote, stronger than expected financial performance last year, sound energy risk management practices, and the resolution of rate and regulatory uncertainty that existed during the PG&E bankruptcy. This is really an important statement about MCE, and it's really, it's a statement about the maturity of our business and the excellence of our staff and the, the close attention that's paid to making sure that our business is strong and thriving. So I think we really have a lot to celebrate 
um, this year, despite all those challenges around us. And I look forward to kind of diving into more of the details on many of those topics as we go forward. Um, so that's it for my opening remarks. And one of the things that we're going to do that we haven't done in past years, because there are so very many of us, is have a little bit of a board member round robin where we really do board member introductions. And if everyone would say your name and where you're from, and then just a short statement about why you're here. And you don't get to say it's because my council made me be the rep. You need to come up with something else. So we're gonna do about half the board now and, uh, and the rest of the board after lunch. Um, so Darlene is gonna lead us in that. And off we go, Darlene. All right, thank you, Kate. Um... I'm going to, for your convenience, since each of you understand and know your, the order in which we take the roll call, so I'm going to use that same format, and I will um, do half, and I've moved up one person because uh, Director Thier will need to sign off in about an hour or two, so uh -oh. I've made a couple of adjustments, but as I call your city or your town, Feel free to start your little spiel. Belvedere. Wow, uh, a little warning, I get to go first. My name's Bob yes. Haskell. Uh, I'm, I'm from the small little hamlet in Belved in, uh, known as Belvedere in Marin County. Um, I suppose probably like virtually all the directors, I, I, I'm here because of my interest in green energy and, and all all the things that uh, MCE has been a leader in. Um, and unfortunately, uh, after eight plus years on the board, I'll be leaving the board uh, next month because I'm not standing for re-election at the Belvedere City Council. But uh, it's been a great eight years and uh, Don, it's been fantastic seeing all the things you've led this agency to accomplish. Thank you. And we do not accept that resignation or that stepping down. We anyway, okay, Benicia. Hi, I'm Elizabeth Patterson, and I'm the mayor of the city of Benicia. And I've been working on environmental issues since 1968ish, and it was really important uh, for me to work with my community to uh, get on with MCE, so we would make a major contribution to reducing the carbon footprint. And, um, and uh, like, um, I, ha I am not running for re-election, but I, my intention is to, I know, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> my intention is to continue attending because I, the reason I'm not is because I feel I can accomplish more not being on the Benicia City Council. Thank you, Elizabeth, I guess. <laughs> yeah, the, nobody that. else gets to say that they're not going to be longer. <laughs> After know. two in a row, that's just enough, enough. Mm. <laughs> Concord. What about you, Kate? Well, oh, I'm, well. Eddie I'm Eddie Bursan, and I actually have the distinction of running unopposed. So you're stuck with me for a while, as long as my council wants to put up with me on this board. Um, um, very look, we've had some changes in the Concord Naval Weapons Station. And I want to reinstitute the concept of trying to get a uh, 100 acre solar park going on the base now and uh, look forward to engaging with you all and uh, advancing the project. Thank you. Quota Madeira. Well, good morning. David Coonhart. Uh, I am on the town council from Corte Madera this year, serving as vice mayor. Uh, I was in the finance area, community development finance, affordable housing finance for over 20 years and switched gears 13, 14 years ago because of the seriousness of climate change uh, into the solar industry. 
And just this year, count myself now as retired from the actual business of doing solar so that I can contribute to what I think is one of the most exciting and value uh, aligned organizations in the, uh, in the marine environment uh, from my perspective, MCE. So I'm absolutely delighted to be a part of it and to be able perhaps to make objective contributions now that I no longer have a direct financial interest in some projects. But we did recently complete City Hall in San Rafael with a beautiful big uh, long-lasting and money-saving system. Thank you. Here, Contra, here. Costa, Contra Costa County. Hi, I'm John Joya. Uh, I live in Richmond and I've had the honor of representing most of West Contra Costa County on the Board of Supervisors for the last 22 years, but really started doing uh, at least public service uh, sustainability work when I was first elected to the East Bay Municipal Utility District Board back in 1988. Um, and I really am excited to be part of uh, an effort as we really green our, our electricity sector. And really, for me, what is important about this is achieving environmental justice and just transition objectives. And I get to do this work on the California Air Resources Board. Um, so I feel this, the, the local work really does complement the state level work, the county work, and the regional work that we do uh, on the Bay Area Air Quality Management District. Thank you. El Cerrito. Come on, there we go. <laughs> um, sorry, Greg Lyman, uh, mayor of El Cerrito, and I have, um, I joined the MCE board. I'm a civil engineer by training, and so I wanted to learn more about some of the things that was electrical, uh, plus it fit in with my uh, career of working in uh, the industry uh, to save the planet. I, at the time, I was a um, uh, habitat restoration engineer doing uh, creating habitat to to protect endangered species associated with large infrastructure con uh, projects so um, was familiar with some of the infrastructure projects that uh, support uh, uh, power um, I know Darlene knows this already but I am also not running for office so I'm one of those that uh, it has will not be serving um, in the future, Mayor Pro Tem uh, Fideli, who is running for office this November, is, is also here. He can wave his hand. There he is. Um, will likely, hopefully, be uh, my replacement next year. Thank you for that. Fairfax. And I just got a message that Director Kohler is trying to get in, but um, is mm -hmm. not showing up yet. So um, I'm sure Anya is helping with that. Maybe we can skip to the next person and come back to Director Kohler in a moment. Sure. Yeah. Pleasant Hill. No, Pleasant Hill's not here yet. Uh, Tiburon. Oh, good morning, everyone. Um, uh, I want to thank you very much for moving me up on the list. Uh, I would be with you all day, except today is Rosh Hashanah, the most important Jewish holiday of the year. So unfortunately, I do have to leave before the meeting ends. Um, I want to thank uh, MCE. I am actually a brand new board member. Um, I'm not leaving, so that's the good news. <laughs> and um, I have a long history actually of supporting cleaner, greener power. I helped uh, San Francisco uh, Clean Power SF set up and we actually used MCE as a model for that. Uh, I'm currently vice mayor in Tiburon. When I got on the town council, I started working very closely with the Sierra Club to have Tiburon go deep green. So I want to applaud the efforts of MCE and say I'm absolutely thrilled to join you. I'm a new board member and I'll be here for a little while. Thank you. Thank you, Holly. Fairfax, Barbara, are you in yet? We're still no, working yeah. on that. 
Yeah. Not yet. Okay, we'll come back. Lafayette. Okay, Mike's not here yet. Larkspur. Oh, good. Hi, it's Kevin Haroff. Um, I'm the current uh, vice mayor of the city of Larkspur and have been on uh, MC's board now for, I think, seven or eight years. Can't remember. Um, and I'm just really glad to be a, a part of this organization. Um, I've had the opportunity to see it grow and prosper. Uh, and thanks to um, all, all of the members of the board and, and staff and management. Uh, I'm uh, unhappy that some of our board members, um, like uh, Greg and Bob and Ray, are departing. <laughs> Um, but we will uh, we will we will manage with their um, hopefully with their side conversations to help guide us through uh, our future. So I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you, Kevin. County of Marin. So I'm Kate Sears, uh, Marin County Supervisor. I've been on this board for over nine years, and my predecessor. Uh, Supervisor Charles McGlashan was really um, the leader, uh, along with a lot of help from good folks in getting MCE Marin Clean Energy at that time started. And so it was a logical step for me when I first came into office as a county supervisor to <clears throat> join the board. I had no idea at the time how incredibly interesting and exciting um, this assignment would be and how much I would love I would love chairing the technical committee that really I keep trying to get more of you to join um, but you know uh, it's been a fascinating fascinating ride for me with over the last nine years to see how this organization has grown and developed and matured and prospered and the fantastic team of people that we've grown from I think Don probably when I first got on maybe we had 12 people uh, in the organization. It's just been uh, incredible. And obviously, ever since the beginning, MCE's really been at the forefront of, of progressive change in the energy sector, and, and that's where all of us want to be. So I'm going to violate my own rule and tell you that I, too, decided not to run for re-election. And so I will be stepping off at the end of the year. There's many things I will be glad to be letting go of as a retired former county supervisor, but MCE is not one of them. I'm gonna miss you all tremendously um, and keep a close eye on all the good work you're doing. And I think with the fantastic people on this board and the wealth of talent, both on the board and the staff, it's gonna be 10 more years of, of really exciting success. So. Thank you, everybody. Dar Darlene, it, it's Kevin. I don't know if you can hear me. Yes, I can. Um, but I, 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 I was remiss in not expressing my great appreciation for Kate and the role that she has played um, throughout the history of this organization. She has guided uh, us in so many ways for years, mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. and we will miss her greatly. Yes, definitely. Thank you, Kevin. That was very thoughtful. I thought maybe you were going to celebrate my mom being here. It's like, thank God somebody else at that gavel. No, you don't understand, Kate. I actually like you quite a lot. So. Who knew? I'm, I'm, I'm not going to celebrate anything about any of this stuff. I'm just, I'm disappointed to see all these folks going off. I know, I know. Okay, um, I think we can probably take two more and then everyone else will be shifted to the afternoon intro. Um, Napa and all five Napa cities. Good morning. Where am I? Where am I? <laughs> you got me? Good morning. Um, yeah, Napa is so happy to be part of, I'm Brad Wagon Connect. I'm the Napa supervisor, um, one of the Napa supervisors. And um, we've, we, we in Napa have, have put us put us all in the same boat. Um, I'm, I get to work with all of our cities and, and they, you know, I, I get to visit with all of them and make sure that, make sure that we're following, that we're doing the right direction for the community. But MC is one of the better things that, 
that uh, we're getting to do. And so we enjoy our relationship with MCE and um, look forward to more and better projects. We've, we've got one, one um, um, solar project that we've done in, in Napa in the last while, and we've got another one coming in the near future. And so we're, we're very excited about um, our relationship with MCE and moving forward. Thank you, Brad. Novato. Um, hi, Denise Athis. I'm currently mayor in Novato. And I think looking at everybody, I think I may be the OG of the group. <laughs> <laughs> I should start, I think it was, well, we were the last to the table in Novato, um, but I was so thrilled to be part of getting us to the table. And I've been on the, um, uh, been on the board of directors ever since and been on the executive committee. And it has been truly something that has um, given so much to my life. Um, we're deep green at our house. And every time I talk to somebody, I try to get them on board and to watch us go from those 11 people at the table and just Marin cities to where we are today is, is just so amazing to watch. Um, we're now respected and because of Dawn and all the work that's been done, Darlene, definitely an OG to the group, um, and uh, so appreciative of, of everything and everybody that, that I've been able to work with all this time. So I'm still here for a couple more years, so, <laughs> and proud to do it. And then I'm hoping we can upgrade Amy Peel. She's my alternate, but she's also on the call, and I'm hoping we can get her up to the panelist position. I think uh, I'm on. I believe you I'm are on. on. Yeah, so I'd love Amy to introduce herself. Hi, I'm Amy Peel, and I'm a new city council member to Novato. I think that Kate Sears' new career will be in radio because I love your voice. It's so melodic and calming. So there's the next step. Uh, I'm very excited as a new council member and new to MCE to be um, part of this group. And just so grateful when I tell people that I'm on the board, but knew how many smart, dedicated people are making things really happen with MCE. Uh, so I'm in awe. I've got a learning curve and I'm just uh, grateful uh, to be here and be part of this bigger effort. So um, thank you so much for all your hard work. And Kate, thanks for your leadership. I wish I had more of it, but uh, I'll, look, I'll look to listen to you on the radio. It's a great suggestion, Amy. <laughs> now, w wait a minute. I, I am texting illiterate. OG stands for outstanding gal, right? <laughs> so cute, David. No, original, meaning old. <laughs> but thanks. I like and here it. I thought it was old guard. <laughs> <clears throat> All right. Um... I believe that will be all for the morning intro oh, session. Cool. Yeah, and that was really fun. I wish we'd done do this. We should do this more often. Turns out we're a lot well, more interesting than stay, we knew. If you would stay, maybe we would. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> all right, that was great. Really appreciate it. And looking forward to the afternoon and the second half of the board. So I'm hoping that Senator Mike McGuire has joined us so we can move on to the yes, next nice. item. Oh, good. Yeah. Um, the next item on our agenda, which is our inaugural MCE Climate Action Leadership Award presentation to Senator Mike McGuire. And Dawn and team, I don't know if there's anything that you wanted to say about that award. Do you want me to just jump right in to our slightly outrageous list of laudatory comments about Senator McGuire. Yeah, we, we do have a, um, an image of the award, which we're going to put up on the screen for you um, and uh, while you're speaking. Um, but yeah, we're, we're very excited about this award and um, uh, happy to have you do the honors, Director Sears. And where is the senator? I can't see him on my screen. Can we hey, drag morning. him in here? There you are. You hey, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> thanks for being thanks for being here i wanted to be able to see you while i went through this whole thing yes, all right so this is the senator mike mcguire 2020 climate leadership award uh, the mce climate leadership award recognizes individuals who have made significant impacts on policies benefiting cca customers advancing efforts to combat climate change 
and leading the way to a more sustainable and equitable world for all. Senator McGuire has been a champion of the CCA movement since his election to the Senate in 2014, when CCAs were still a relatively new development. At that time, only two CCAs were delivering service to customers in California, both of which are located in his district. Since his election, Senator McGuire's leadership has helped to build a critical base of supportive champions within the Senate and have fought off countless threats to CCAs. In 2019, Senator McGuire was instrumental in the defeat of AB 56 in the Senate Energy Utilities and Communications Committee, a bill that would have threatened the local governance of CCAs. Most importantly, Senator McGuire is a tireless champion for the rural communities that have been heavily impacted by wildfires in the last several years and has been at the forefront of the calls for reforming PG&E. He's authored many bills to improve emergency response systems, refine wildlife mitigation plans, demand a higher standard of wildfire survivors assistance, and strengthen the electricity grid through grid hardening, undergrounding, and infra infrastructure accountability. Senator McGuire is a powerhouse for climate advocacy and an inspiration change maker in Sacramento. The CCA movement will continue to flourish and our customers will continue to receive clean and locally controlled electricity thanks to efforts of Senator McGuire. I hope everyone will join me in congratulating Senator McGuire on receiving the inaugural MCE Climate Leadership Award. I cannot imagine a better recipient for this reward. Thank you, Mike. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, I just wanna say how grateful I am uh, to work with you uh, and to your entire board, Vice Chair Butt, thank you so much. Uh, Madam CEO, thank you. It is an honor to be with you today. Um, but, but I gotta tell you, all the thanks goes to MCE. Uh, MCE really has been the trailblazer on this movement for community choice throughout California. Uh, the work that all of you have done and what started in Marin is now spread across the Bay Area and the state uh, has now paid incredible dividends for millions of Californians. I'm a firm believer doing what's right in life is never easy. And that's the path that each of you have taken. Uh, due to your perseverance, due to your vision and knowledge that we could do better for consumers and knowledge that we could do better for our climate, community choice is now firmly, firmly established here in the Golden State. And it all started in Marin and now has spread across the Bay Area. And I just wanna take a moment to look at what you have all done due to your bold leadership. Number one, millions in profits, millions in what would have been profits for PG&E now are being reinvested back into the community to be able to assist low-income families as well as seniors on fixed incomes to be able to do what's right and to be able to advance energy savings projects. Uh, you are reducing greenhouse gas emissions with significant strides. This is amazing to see what you've done over this past decade, but MCE has reduced 350, nearly 350,000 metric tons of greenhouse gas emissions. This would have never happened without each of your bold visions. And you're creating family sustaining jobs, over 5,000 jobs. I know I'm preaching to the choir, but over 5,000 jobs has been created through MCE and your locally sourced energy projects. Finally, Madam Chair, I just wanna say this. All of you on this Zoom today, who are on the board of directors and your very capable staff, you're the ones who deserve thanks. We need to say thank you for stepping up to do the right thing. Uh, we're here because of you and because you have all done what's right for Californians and you're doing what's right for our climate. And there is no greater priority right now than focusing on climate change here in California and throughout the United States. So uh, today, uh, very grateful. Thank you so much uh, for allowing me this. It's beautiful. Uh, it is gonna go on my Zoom desk right here uh, next to me. And I just wanna say again, I am truly appreciative uh, and I love working with you. And Don, 
You and your team have been fabulous. Shalani is just, she is, she carries a two by four when she comes into the office, uh, wanting to be able to get things done. Uh, and I just want to say how much I appreciate it. it makes me emotional uh, and uh, very grateful to work with each and every one of you. Thank you, Senator. I really appreciate it. And I, you know, if there's any sort of testament to, I think, how far MC has come as an organization, it's that we have people like Senator McGuire on our side fighting for us. Um, we couldn't, we couldn't do what we're doing and, and be able to have the future that we hope to have without your support. And we really appreciate it. And you're a lot of fun too. So that's what really matters. Well, Madam Chair, you've been an absolute pleasure uh, to be able to work with um, on your time with the Board of Supervisors. We work on many issues together um, and I've learned so much from you. And I just wanna say thank you for your tireless service, not just to the people of Marin, but to the people of Northern California. Uh, and you, as you know, I'm one of your biggest fans. I'm gonna miss you. Uh, and I just wanna tell you what an honor it is been uh, able to work with you. Thank you, Mike. I really appreciate it. Okay. Big hugs. And if anyone, if any other board members would like to say something nice to Mike, you're welcome to do so. I, I don't know if this is going to be nice, but I definitely have something to say. In my very first conversation with you, Mike, about seven years ago, um, you asked me about batteries. And I thought that was ironic because I've come to think of you as being the energizer bunny of politicians in our uh, whole environment. What I need to know, since M one of MCE's highest priorities is clean resilience and continuing in power when the, when the grid goes down, I need to know the source of your personal energy, which is so phenomenal. We have to harness that in MCE. I, I love it, Councilman. It's so good to see you, sir, and uh, so happy you're in Corte Madera. Uh, hitting the coffee hard these days. So <laughs> here we go. Uh, thank you uh, very much. And the occasional margarita with Supervisor Sears. Uh, yep. So <laughs> <I'm> Direct to <laughs> Joya. <laughs> here we go. But uh, it's so good to see you, David. Thank you so much. And love working with you, sir. Okay, Direct to Joya has his hand raised. Oh, well, he should speak up for sure. Well, yes. um, Senator, I mean, you may not represent Contra Costa in the East Bay, but I want you to know, and you know this, you have lots of fans and in the East Bay and in Contra Costa. Um, your work uh, affects all of us, not just the district you represent. And you go above and beyond the call of duty. And I just wanted to express that on behalf of those of us in, in Contra Costa. Uh, and that's, you know, we, we joined MCE because of the great work that's been going on. And I do need to say uh, about your going above and beyond the call of duty. I was sitting next to uh, Supervisor Gorin who recounted the time when she was back in, I think out of state during the fires and she got a call from you uh, in which you said, Supervisor, I'm outside your house. It's about to burn down. What do you want? I'm here with some firefighters. What do you want me to get out of your house for you? And I think that just reflects, you didn't publicize that. That was just something, right? You, 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 you yeah. were helping her on. And I think that reflects your, you're just going the extra mile above and beyond the call of duty so often. So I just wanted to express that. Supervisor, it means so much uh, to me, those words, thank you. Uh, Supervisor Joya is a, a legend here in the Bay Area. Um, as a former member of the Sonoma County Board of Supervisors, what we were always told is you want to look uh, to do what's right, you look towards the supervisor's way and your track record uh, is impeccable. And I just want to say thank you so much for those words. I want to say thank you for your amazing work over these past many years. And that was a, a hell of a night. And um, uh, we were able to get most out, but not everything before the fire got there. And uh, Supervisor Gorn, the good news is she's starting to rebuild uh, as of this year. So it's good right. to see you. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor. It's wonderful to see you. Director Thier. Uh, Senator McGuire, I just, <laughs> hello. I just want to congratulate you on being the first recipient of the Climate Action uh, Leader Award for MC. I think it's very significant and it's a tribute to that hard work you've done and the commitment you've shown to climate and environmental issues. So I really wanted to congratulate you and uh, say I'm very pleased that uh, you were chosen. Holly, it's so wonderful to see you. Thank you so much uh, for those words. 
Uh, I'm honored to work with you each and every day. And we got a lot of work in front of us. Uh, and uh, I think our next goal, as we've been talking with Don and all others across the state, is we now need to be uh, getting off that defensive footing and start moving proactive legislation forward and holding these IOUs accountable and going to bat for consumers. So uh, really grateful, Holly. It's wonderful to see you again, and uh, it's been too long. Thank you so much. Super. Great. All right, yeah, Senator. Oh, yeah, Sh Shalini, yes. <laughs> I'm, I know I'm not a member of the board, so I'm asking. No, you should speak up. Should, yeah. Yeah, um, you know, Senator McGuire, when we created this award, you were part of the inspiration for it. We know that you've gotten to bat a million times, and we literally couldn't think of any way to, pr like, correctly thank you for all of the work that you've done. And creating this award was inspired by all of the the countless hours and fights that you've had on our behalf. So I really wanna say not only are you the you know, first recipient of this award, but you're really part of the inspiration for the creation of this award. And I know you're always telling me, I can't be the only one. So we're hoping that the creation of the award means that your legacy will go beyond you more than it already has. And I just wanna, uh, and Madam Chair, through you, if it's all right, I just wanna say thank you. Uh, you are in the offices of the Capitol constantly. You are working on behalf of senators and on behalf of this board. Uh, and I just wanna say thank you for your advocacy. And you may not be a member of the board, you may be part of this amazing staff, but I gotta tell you, you have been the leader that we should be saying thank you to as well. Uh, you have uh, the smarts, you are innovative, and you also hold us accountable, by the way. So just want to say thank you very, very much. Uh, and we are now building a, a great coalition, and it's done because of the work that's happened with MCE. You've been able to prove that doing what's right for the people and for the climate works. And by the way, for the most part, we're able to be able to beat those prices with pg &E. Not always a promise, but we're able to most... Uh, most of the time beat those prices of pg &E. And it's because of the trailblazing work that's done with all of you. I was on the Board of Supervisors in Sonoma County. We were the second when we created it. And you took a look, uh, you take a look at the arrows that each of you faced to be able to get this off the ground. And now we go fast forward 10 years. It's incredible success. Thank you so much. And we really owe all of you, the board and the staff, the thanks this morning, because we would not be here today without each of you. Thank you, Mike. And um, we're going we're gonna to let you go. I know you've got a lot on your plate all over the state of California as, as well here as here in the North Bay. And we mm -hmm. appreciate everything you do. Keep drinking that coffee. God damn. And, uh, and we're going to have a margarita soon. That's what I'm saying. Thank you again. I'm really grateful. Thank, Thank you, you so much, much Senator. Thank you. Take care. Take Thank you. Big hugs. Thank you. Bye. Yeah. Great. All right. Fantastic. I feel like we're done. We've done the most important stuff, except we still have to introduce the second half of the board. But otherwise, um, we do have a few things to do between now and then. Um, but that was terrific. So we are now uh, going to move on to item five on our agenda, which is a report on MCE's fiscal 2019-20 financial audit. And I think this presentation is going to be led by uh, Bob McCaskill. Hi, Bob. Uh, thank you, Kate. Good morning. Um, Kevin Haroff, Ray Whitby, and I were the three board members who sat on the audit committee this year. Uh, and we met uh, with our independent auditors, Baker Chile, last month to discuss their findings from the most recent audit that they had completed. Uh, this was the third year that Baker Chile served, served as our independent auditors. Um, just a few quick points, uh, the highlights of that meeting that we had with Baker Chile. Um, they issued a clean opinion on MCE's March 31st financial statements uh, and reported no exceptions or major issues. Um, they also reported... Wait one minute. I'm gonna mute that. That's when we get these things up. Um, 
They also reported that they had identified no material weaknesses in MCE's accounting procedures and internal controls uh, during their, their audit procedures. Um, auditors frequently include suggestion for improvements to a company's procedures and controls, but this year Baker Tilly uh, again said that they had identified no recommendations for improvements. Uh, they also advised us um, that uh, in their final audit report, they did not require uh, any adjusting journal entries, uh, meaning any changes to the audited financial statements that had been prepared by MCE. Um, the audit committee did inquire about MCE's creation of an operating reserve fund uh, in March of this year uh, that allowed MC to defer recognition of about 10.5 million of revenue to a later year. Um, the representatives Baker Tilly indicated to the committee that MC followed all required accounting rules and procedures uh, in establishing this rate stabilization reserve. Um, a final point I'd make is that uh, for, for non-accountants, uh, the numbers, meaning the balance sheet, the income statement, so forth in, in the audit report are challenging to understand. Um, but what I would encourage all board members to do is to look at the notes to the financial statement, which start on page 13 of the audit report. Um, they are generally written in layman's terms, easy to understand, and, and I've, uh, they're, they're worth reading. And that's all I have to report, Kate. Great, thank you, Bob. And I, you know, I just want to make a quick comment and appreciation and thanks to you. You have really played an important role um, at MCE of, of making sure that we were we were keeping a close eye on finances, that we were really following best practices, that we had the staff that we needed to make sure that we were doing all that, and then of course we're very generous with your own time. Uh, in in paying attention to financial issues in the audit, and uh, I really appreciate it. And we're hoping that you know we are going to need to find somebody to take on all that good work that you've been doing because it's it's really made a difference to the organization. So thank you. Great, thank you. You're welcome. Um, and so Dawn, I don't do we have is this are we done with our audit? Do we have anyone else from the staff who wanted to comment or? We do not have anything uh, okay. beyond Super. that report um, unless um, the board would like to make any comments. And this is not an action item. Just okay. Don, Don, this is Ke this is Kevin. If I could just inter interject and um, express the same level of appreciation that Kate just offered uh, for Bob's role, uh, who's been playing this role for some period of time and has provided a level of expertise that um, uh, none of the rest of us possibly could. So we, uh, I, I personally appreciate the opportunity to have worked with him uh, on this committee and um, we'll, we'll go forward. Thank you, Kevin. Any other uh, comments or questions from board members? Uh, very briefly, this is Ray. I'm, I was also on the uh, ad hoc audit committee as I have been for a number of years. Um, goes without saying, I also um, would like to thank Bob for his leadership on this committee. Um, very thoughtful, very careful, and um, really dives into the details and asks the questions that need to be asked. The other thing I just wanted to comment on, you know, I've been involved, even though I'm not an accountant, um, but I've been involved in lots of audits having run public companies and, and, and the like. And you just don't get clean opinions like this. You just don't. And so, you know, it's, uh, it's a major achievement. And one of the reasons why you often don't get um, uh, clean opinions is because of usually you fail on some form of internal controls. And because of the way we've set up our accounting system with moderate accountancy, and, and it's, it's meant that you, you don't trip up on segregation of duties and that sort of thing. And so um, the structure that we have has really enabled us to um, just be top of the, top of the, the heap in terms of um, accountancy. And so um, 
that's a great measure to our staff and our consultants. Great, thank you, Ray. Um, anyone else who'd like to comment? All right, I'm seeing none and Darlene will let me know if I missed anybody. Um, but assuming I have not, uh, let's move on to the next item on our agenda, <clears throat> which is MCE responses to 2020 events. Ooh, and there's a lot of them. Dawn, want to yeah, introduce a, this? Quite a few items. It's hard to fit into one retreat discussion, but um, we're going to start off with um, item A, and we have Vikan Kasarji, and I'm going to turn it over to Vikan to get us started here. Hi, everybody. What an honor to be part of uh, this group, uh, the MCE, really appreciate it. Um, and you, uh, please feel free to load up the presentation. So uh, just to set it up, um, the next page, please. Um, just to set it up, so when, when the COVID hit us in, in, um, earlier in the year and, and we went, <clears throat> Uh, to a, a remote operations, we collectively, internal to MC, wanted to uh, kind of see what what are the things that we should be anticipating as to what could happen, given this significant variable um, in our operations. So, um, what we thought that, um, and by the way, feel free to stop me anytime if you have any questions. Uh, that's fine. So. Um, the, some of the possible impacts we took into account, we uh, anticipated uh, lower retail sales and therefore revenue. Um, you know, the second item, surplus hedge contracts liquidated that depressed market prices because of that. Um, and uh, probably with the lower usage, lower energy consumption, uh, surplus resource adequacy could be, you know, in our portfolio. In a, a depending on the, you know the assumptions, what kind of an increase we may have in uncollectible accounts, and in what kind of a write-off we may be looking at in our budgets. So to do that, we looked at uh, three possible uh, models to capture the range of these variables that we could be anticipating. Next page, please. Okay, so we started with a base case. And the base case we talked about um, that we would have uh, the, the COVID-19 load impacts, uh, you know, and, and we would have an, a, a reduction in usage with a, with a partial recovery. We assumed that we could have twice the amount of uncollectable accounts. Uh, our normal range is 0.67%. So we thought to multiply that by two basically. And uh, we uh, assume that for the base case, uh, if we liquidated uh, excess resource adequacy, we could have captured probably half the value that we had paid for. So that was our base case. Next page, please. On the adverse case, uh, we said it could be that the load impact is so great that we could not recover, depending on you know, how things go. Uh, the second biggest uh, option or the assumption was that we could have up to four times the of the uncollectible accounts that we had assumed. And otherwise, the, 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 the other assumptions were the same as the base case, except these two uh, major drivers. Next page, please. And then we had a positive case. You know, we always like to look at things on the upside in case, you know, they do happen, that how what would happen. So we thought um, on the uncollectible accounts about 1.7 times, uh, we assumed 100% recovery or resource adequacy, the surplus resource adequacy uh, liquidation value, and the rest of the assumption we assumed to be the same. Next page, please. Okay, so this is a slide um, that shows from uh, our uh, start in March, where we went uh, shelter in place on March 17. Um, the dark, the blue line represent what non-resident, I'm sorry, I'm gonna back up. On the title, it says T plus 48 final settlement. Let me just take a moment and explain. So. 
Uh, the ISO has three major demarcation lines about uh, when your final bill is settled with the ISO, in, in generally speaking. The first one is in the, the early stages, which is called a T plus eight, basically eight days after. T plus 48, it's about 48 days after, after a particular date that is basically you can assume as to be a final settlement for that day that happened 48 days prior. So these numbers, they go from March 1 through June 27, when at the printing of this document, it was our final information that we had from the ISO. So if you go to the far left of the graph, you see that the blue line, which is the non-residential load, and the red line is the residential load. Typically, the combined non-residential load tend to be higher than residential load prior to COVID-19, prior to shelter in place. As you can see, once you draw the, past the dotted the vertical dotted red line, you start going to the right into the days of later on in March, April, May, and later on in June, we saw this phenomenon that basically residential took a big jump up uh, in usage because people were at their uh, home or residences and the non-residential load took a took a dip uh, compared to what they used to be what our expectations were in their consumption and this trend continued significantly uh, across uh, all the way through june basically that uh, depending on weather patterns the, the gold or the yellow line, that's the average max, maximum temperatures that we saw. And uh, the, the, the grayish line on top is the total load in megawatt hours. So as you go into June, you see that we had some increasing uh, usages combined. But in general, I would just want to say uh, that uh, as Don had reported to the board and to the committees previously that um, our residential load seemed to have uh, consumed of the energy that the non-residential were supposed to consume. So we were doing good. Actually, we were doing quite good compared to other load serving entities. And the other thing is that most of this captured timeline is when uh, residential load had higher rates a seasonally adjusted rates than the non-residential load. Uh, next page, please. This is, uh, again, so if you look at the title, this says T plus eight. So these are non-final settlement numbers from the ISO based on non-final settlement numbers. And it goes one day after of the T plus 48, June 28th through August 25th, where we have data as of the printing preparation of this uh, PowerPoint. So uh, the trend seemed to continue, but we started, we started seeing some positive behavior from the non-residential load as in, in increase a little bit as to you know, the, the, the health of the economy seem to have been improving a little bit, but it kind of goes back to the previous page at the, uh, in August timeline, when you see residential, especially with the, with the temperatures, uh, highs that we hit all over uh, board members, uh, cities and counties, we all lived through some, some really, high temperatures in the 90s and 100s, uh, even in Contra Costa. By the way, I just want to make a point that when I was uh, in the California ISO, for the system peak calculations, we had set our gauge to be city of Concord at 90 degrees. That's when it gets very tight across California. And California reached the 90 and passed it. So. It was, it was shown that consumption is going up. So, um, and then you see at the end in August, significant uh, DVA, you know, increase on the residential side also. Next slide, please. 
Okay, so this is an, uh, um, an interesting uh, slide that captures uh, our load forecast uh, versus our actual load. So the, uh, the, with the white background, March, April, and May are based on T plus 48 data about where we have settlement on. And the far right two columns, June and July, are for based on T plus eight. So, and it depicts how load behaved based on customer load in gigawatt hours, uh, small commercial, medium CNI, large CNI, and residential. And this is basically a more graphic form of representation of the previous slide altogether that shows how individual types of loads behaved across the past five months uh, that are captured here, March through July. Now, please note that our March numbers, about half the month is so-called normal times, and the rest of the month is shelter in place with COVID-19. And as you can see, again, the significant presence of uh, residential consumption uh, across the months. Next slide, please. This is a, a I'm really, really proud and happy to, sh to share this graph with you on the load forecast versus actuals for the uh, budgetary, uh, the budget forecast versus COVID-19 adjustment the settled load, and more importantly, to the cumulative variance in everything. You know, and this is uh, something that all the CCAs, all the load serving entities, everybody was looking at the reduction in load, the reduction in consumption. So if we start in March, you see that the budget forecast and the COVID adjusted, uh, you know, were about the same. The settled load was a little bit less. In April, there's significant reduction between the budget forecast. In May, this is final settlement again for T with T plus 48. The settled load is higher than the budgeted. And you see the trend continuing for June and July, but those are not final settlement numbers yet for June and July. But the most important item in this graph is the actually the, the orangish line that says, by the time everything said and done all the way through July, MCE was less than negative 1%, had less than negative 1% reduction in total, load, uh, in total uh, usage. Uh, across California, there are places that hit all the way to negative 10%. Um, that includes, uh, you know, a lot of load serving entities. So this is really, really good news that our consumption did not drop. Next slide, please. <clears throat> this is uh, to give you a flavor of um, what our, we decided to show you uh, a comparison between um, last August and this August about how the COVID uh, uh, has impacted on the delinquencies. And there is uh, quite a bit of a driver behind it as uh, the rules are um, not to go in and um, take through the process of what to do usually with uh, delinquent payments, uh, delinquencies. So as you can see that um, the largest bar is zero to 30 days delinquency. And I got to tell you, those are usually are paid within next month. There's uh, almost a doubling of the size of 31 to 60 day delinquencies. And the chart continues to show the 61 to 90, 91 to 120 days, 121 to 150 days and so on about the delinquency. So what we tend to concentrate on at the tail end, the, the, the final right-hand corner about those delinquencies, and it's only a few handful of accounts. But as you can see, if you take the total blue bar, even it shows that the August 2020 is 
bigger than the August 2019 estimates. As you can see, as you move to the right, you see that every single rectangle is diminishing significantly. So basically, the story is that vast majority are paying only a little bit later than normal, and there are, I'm sure, there are a lot of reasons behind it. Next slide, please. This is an interesting graph about uh, the participation in uh, different uh, programs. Uh, CARE is California Alternative Rates for Energy. Uh, FERA is Family Electric Rate Assistance. And the, the green one is the medical baseline. And based on uh, all the programs and, in hand, and, and, and uh, more facilitated participation in these programs, you see that we have a, a significant increase in customers participating in these, in these uh, programs. So all together, I'm sorry. So altogether, the cumulative is about uh, 100,000 uh, participants in all three programs. Next page, please. Um, as uh, you know, uh, uh, Director uh, Sears, you mentioned our uh, betterment in our credit rating with Fitch, and we talk uh, about it with Moody's too. Uh, it, there's always a concern about opting out with CCAs. I just want this is a, a, a showing of the total opt outs across. Uh, from uh, January 1 of 2019 all the way to July 1 of 2020, we're seeing a very small, very small number of uh, opt-outs in our service area. So uh, the opt-out transactions, you see that are in the hundreds, but the total amount is uh, very low. And this is something that uh, did catch the eye of the credit uh, uh, agencies for the health of uh, MCE and is with its customers. Next slide, please. That's actually very nice to see. <laughs> Good. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So uh, to in uh, watching our total uh, budget for fiscal year 2020, 2021, uh, when we look at uh, April through July in all the uh, ups and downs that we have gone through, I would uh, point your attention to the right number in the revenue less expenses, $1.381 million that we are under of our budget. This is, uh, I just want to convey that everything that has happened with all the variations, uh, this is a, a to me, this is a very healthy existence for MCE. Now we haven't had, we, we don't know yet what the, the uh, uh, August and in, in later on in the year will bring, but uh, for, the, for the time being from April 1 through July 31st, this is a very healthy showing for MCE compared to our, for our budget. Next slide, please. And this is the, uh, for our um, uh, projections uh, with the pro forma, uh, the, uh, including COVID for the fiscal year. Um, so if the, the change in net position, if I may bring your attention to the bold numbers, uh, the budget had shown a $48 million plus number. They go back to our base case assumptions, that's a 40 uh, reduction of 7 million, $41 million uh, in the net position. That's a positive number. Uh, for the adverse that we had assumed in, in possibilities, it's 30 million. So that's a reduction of 18 million. And the for, for the positive, that's 45 million, shows a slight reduction of 3 million on our net position. And when you look at the sales volumes, it's basically flat 
we are not seeing, as you saw in the graph, uh, basically almost any reduction. It's very healthy consumption, and um, which shows in the numbers. I think that's the last one. Next, next uh, Vic, slide. Yeah. Could yeah. you go back one, please? Kind of go back one slide to the one prior to that last one, please. This and you could that one. Oh, that one. Yes, please. Just okay. Look for one second. Sure. Uh, this is Greg Lyman, and I would, I've got a question based on this slide and slide nine, so I don't know if this is a good time to ask the question. Is the um, revenue less expenses for this quarter based on the delinquency that your the extended time to pay that is on slide nine? Yes. So, so we, in essence, it's not that we're not going to see this one point $3 million revenue, $1.4 million revenue. It's just, it's behind in being paid. You're correct, Director Lyman. That's an excellent point. David, yeah. did you have a question off the slide or, or just uh, wanting to- It just, to I, uh, you know, uh, different accountings uh, use positives and negatives in different ways and mm -hmm. Some of these negatives are, are negative for the institution and a couple of the negatives are positives for the institution, such as uh, when uh, the loss goes down, right? And so I was just trying to get aligned with that and how it all adds up to the only the one point, less than 1.4. Yes. Um, it's looking good overall. I just uh, wanted to get straight in my own dim mind um, which which are positives and which are negatives for sure. Yeah, I'm I'm and with you. The positive negatives never always just fries my brain. <laughs> <laughs> my, yeah, my apologies. But, not, not, so hard. No, not it, it. Just it just means it takes a, a little bit more to, to read. But we're yeah less than one percent uh, variance all, ultimately on the original budget. Um, great, thank you. Thank you. So I'm gonna. Would love to go back to slide nine, Enya. Nope. The, Dead one. Sorry, not slide nine. Uh, go for it. It's the delinquent one. It's I thought it was slide nine. It might be slide twelve. One more forward. This Dead one. one. Um, of the the yellow, the the yellow and the dark blue on the on the far right for August of twenty twenty. How much of that are you planning to write off? as never going to get paid? Uh, very good question, Director Lyman. Um, we uh, have a standing internal uh, group that discusses this. We are not writing off anything at this time. Uh, we are uh, working with our public uh, relations group. We are uh, reaching out to customers to understand uh, what's going on. Uh, you know, it is a higher percentage but we have not decided to write off anything or to basically eat the cost. Yep. We are working on it, it will go from there. It, the total looks like it's about 21 million and the, each, uh, the yellow bar and the blue bar look like they're about a million or three quarters of a million each. Mm -hmm. So does that yellow and blue area represent that 1.4 million, that 1% that, that we were just talking about on the, on the later slide? Uh, no, Director Lyman. We did uh, did not take a take into. Yes, yes. I'm sorry. Yes, you're no, right. I'm, I'm just looking. I mean, this is a graphical representation yeah. of dollar values. The the orange, yellow, and blue probably add up to that amount that we're missing in the later slide. Under and that, and I'm asking, how much of this are we planning to write off? Uh, at you know so so that we're actually you know at some point going to close the books with less revenue or or a variance um, I'm assuming that we're gonna we're gonna have some variance and this is part of the reason why we had took some of the actions we took at the last meeting to create a deferred revenue mm -hmm. so that we can potentially close this gap uh, using some of that deferred revenue. 
And I yeah. think Garth wanted to jump into the conversation here, Garth. No, he's there. Does Garth need to be promoted, Darlene? He's been Garth, promoted. Okay. Um, Sorry about that. There he is. Hi, yeah. Hi, everyone. <laughs> so uh if I can find my, I just, um, sorry to, to interrupt here. I just wanted to point out that uh, that differential that we are showing, which is really through the first four months of the year from a, um, in the finances, um, is not representative necessarily of delinquencies. That is just the differential between our actual revenues, our actual expenses that we've, uh, we've experienced through that period, um, and um, versus the budget. So, um, as Vic and mentioned, you know, our sales are slightly lower. Um, our, um, and so too are some of our expenses and energy expenses. But that 1.4 million or so isn't necessarily representative of delinquencies, okay? Um, uh, so just want to make that clear. So it was, that was sort of reference that might be the difference. And that really isn't the difference. Um, the, and on the graphic here that's up that talks about delinquencies, um, what what's important to realize is we fully expect to receive most of, of these delinquent payments or that are considered delinquent because they're over, um, you know, from zero to 30 and zero to um, and 31 to 60. We receive 98% of those uh, of those payments. They just come in a little bit late. Uh, the ones where we're seeing an uptick and the ones that we're more concerned about are all these last these last few bars uh, that occur know, the, the 121 to 150, 151 to 180, and so on. Um, um, and, you know, as you know, PG&E is not um, pursuing um, delinquencies right now. They're not turning people's power off. Um, MCE is also not uh, turning customers back to PG&E, which is, which is what we're able to do as well. So, um, again, what we've done in our budget is assume more uncollectibles in the end, um, Again, we don't know what that'll be until the end of the period. Um, but the point, I think the point to realize also, and given our assumption of twice our, our, our uncollectibles, which we eventually will not collect at all, we're not experiencing that yet. Um, so we've assumed that we'll double it. We haven't experienced it yet, but we do anticipate that we're gonna have more uncollectibles this year, this year than we have in the past. So I hope that clarifies a few of the questions that have come up from, uh, from the board. Okay, great. Thank you, Garth. Uh, Greg, did you have any other questions? Or are you? Uh, no, you that that, that uh, does um, satisfy my curiosity about how we're going to handle this and and the relationship between this chart and the uh, budget chart. Thank great. you. Super. Any other comments or questions from directors? Okay, that's. I'm not seeing any. I don't know if you are, Darlene. I just want to add one more thing, if I may, Director Please. Sears. So uh, again, very happy about the way things have turned out so far. But as we all lived through uh, the month of August heat and uh, the, the blackouts and things of that sort, uh, you know, we will bring it to the board as soon as we can the, the next level up updates as to what all this market and availability disruptions have cost to us. Great, super, thank you. A really helpful presentation, Vic, and that was great. Thank you. All right, so if there aren't any other questions or comments from directors, I think we're gonna move uh, on to our- Kate, yes, it's Kevin. Sorry? Just, just, yeah, Kevin. Yeah. Just, real, just real quick, I, um, Garth actually answered uh, my questions on that. Um, so I appreciate that. Uh, this is a challenging time and we just need to keep up a firm watch on those delinquencies, but I don't, I don't really see anything unusual here. So uh, thank you. Great, thank you. All righty. So John, do you want to move on, move us on to our resiliency activities? Yeah, I'd like to turn it over to Jamie Tucky, who is our director of strategic initiatives, and she's going to talk about how we've reacted to the events of the year with resiliency activities. Uh, take it away, Jamie. Thank you so much. Um, good morning, board. It's really nice to be here with you all today. Um, I hope you and all of your loved ones have been able to remain safe throughout these fires and the recent outages that we've seen. 
I feel really lucky that I get to talk to you about the resiliency activities that we have underway in our communities. And this is all really a direct result of your board's commitment and leadership with the establishment of the $6 million resiliency fund. Next slide, please. This summer, we launched our energy storage program, which is so exciting. We have a two-year goal to deploy 15 megawatt hours of dispatchable customer-sided storage. And I like to think of these batteries as really having two levers. So when the power is out, you pull one lever for resiliency so that the battery can provide backup power. And during all other times, you pull another level, another lever um, for load shifting away from peaks. And this has lots of benefits for our customers and um, for MCE and the community at whole. It can result in bill savings by reducing demand charges and peak pricing, um, lower greenhouse gas emissions, and also um, promotes a healthier grid because we can reduce grid congestion. Next slide. Um, now, how we accomplish this is actually a lot more sophisticated than simply pulling a lever, of course. We never ask our customers to do that. So we are programming and controlling our batteries with this software called Envala Concerto. And um, that program can set up our batteries to automatically charge and discharge depending on the use cases that we, de that we determine. Um, the goal of the first use case for the batteries is to reduce demand on the grid during peak times. That means that the battery will be charged in the morning and early afternoon off peak periods when rates are lower and there's lots of solar production that can be used to charge those batteries. Um, and then the battery will discharge during on peak times later in the day. That's typically between 4 to 9 p.m. when rates are higher. And that means that the house or the building uh, will actually be powered with the stored energy from that battery instead of needing to pull costlier power from the grid. The other two use cases are about how the battery will work as backup power to provide resiliency during outages. And so with a planned public safety power shutoff, we have notice. We, there's a, a certain amount of time given um, that says there's going to be a shutoff. And the batteries will um, plan to charge to full capacity in the smartest and most efficient way possible in the timeline that's allowed. So the battery will consider, can I charge from on-site solar first? Can I charge from um, electricity from the grid during off-peak hours so it's lower cost? And will I have enough time to do this in advance of the outage? As soon as the power goes out, then the battery will automatically switch to um, a resiliency mode. And the only difference with emergency outages are that we typically don't have any notification or we have very limited notification. So the battery will immediately switch to providing backup power and won't have the ability to charge itself um, with the smartest and, and most <clears throat> efficient method. Um, it's also worth noting that the batteries always maintain at least a minimum 20% charge so that there's always power available in the batteries um, to provide backup power. We are also requiring that all customers in this program have existing solar or are willing to install solar so that the batteries can capitalize on that solar production. And in the event that there's a multi-day outage, the battery can continue to recharge it with the on-site solar. Next slide. What we're offering to customers is really an incredible opportunity. Um, MCE will plan, design, and install uh, the battery that the customer will own so that the battery, I'm sorry, so that the customer really can um, have their home act as an energy island during an outage. So whenever there's an outage, they can keep their lights on even when um, you know, their neighbors might not have any power, the grid is no longer working. We do this um, for our customers at a greatly reduced or even no cost, um, depending on how vulnerable the customer is to these types of outages and the impacts from, from outages. Um, we're able to provide these batteries at no cost or greatly reduced costs uh, by stacking incentives. 
So MCE provides funding from our resiliency fund um, in exchange for allowing us to control the batteries to offset the cost. And we're also utilizing a statewide program that we lovingly call SGIP. Some of you may have heard of it. It stands for Self-Generation Incentive Program. And it's um, a program that helps cover the cost of these batteries as well. They, um, in some cases for our most vulnerable customers have incredibly generous incentives that cover almost the entire cost of the battery. We were also um, fortunate enough to be awarded a grant from the Marin Community Foundation to support these efforts um, and uh, help cover the cost of batteries for low-income multifamily properties and nonprofit social safety nets in Marin. Um, in addition to these funding sources, we provide our customers with a monthly bill credit depending on the amount uh, or the size of the battery that they install in exchange for allowing us to program those batteries. Um, and let's see, next slide. Um, I want to talk about the emphasis um, that we have on this program to prioritize our most vulnerable customers. That is hugely important to us. So um, we are prioritizing them by giving them the lowest cost or no cost batteries. We're looking for customers who are most vulnerable based on the fact that they've had multiple um, power outages in the past. They're located in high fire threat districts. We're looking for facilities that provide critical services to our communities during emergencies like fire stations, homeless shelters, food banks. Um, we're prioritizing low income and medically vulnerable residents and also uh, customers that are located in disadvantaged communities. So since we launched this program in summer, uh, this summer we've submitted SGIP applications for state uh, funding and um, got these customers through our program. Um, we have 79 of our most vulnerable customers that we have submitted applications for that uh, we are essentially covering the cost of these batteries. And we have 10 more that just came through in the last couple of days. Those customers will need to be waitlisted. We just found out yesterday that um, this pot of funds for SGIP for the most vulnerable customers has been allocated. Uh, we are still going to submit applications to get customers on the wait list because we are hoping that more funds will become available for them. In addition to this group of customers, we've got 89 other customers that we are preparing applications for. Um, it's for a different bucket of funding for SCHIP where there are still funds available it's called general market and really any customer can get in for those funds that will cover a small portion of the battery. Um, and it's worth noting that um, this SGIP program has been a blessing for us, but also a little bit of a thorn in the side um, just due to lots of complicated uh, rule changes and um, variations with requirements for participation. So that is something that we are juggling um, to ensure that our customers are meeting the requirements, that the applications are being approved and that we can actually secure the funding for our customers. I'm excited to um, report out to you in the coming months about installations that we will actually be having for these customers and the other progress that we make. Um, but I wanna hand it off now to my colleague, Alexandra McGee, to talk a little bit more about some other resiliency activities that we have underway, also to support our most uh, vulnerable customers. Alexandra, are you on the line? Yes, I'm here. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you, Jamie, and good morning, members of the board. It's lovely to see you. Um, would you mind going to the next slide, please? Excellent. So I'm here to talk a little bit about um, a related program. So as Jamie mentioned, it's been a pleasure to participate in the energy storage program. She and I personally have been calling folks and learning about pets and, you know, how are your kids and do you know about batteries, do you know about MCE? It's been a really um, refreshing opportunity to reconnect with some of our most vulnerable customers. And another way that we're supporting some of, some of these customers is through a complimentary program. So I'm gonna take a minute or two to talk about this um, medical baseline specific program 
uh, to complement this longer term battery installation that Jamie has been talking about, MCE wanted to simultaneously invest in an immediate uh, solution. So this program that I'm about to present to you is actually an off-grid system. Um, the purpose being to, we wanted to support our customers immediately, even if they're not grid tied. Let's make sure that folks who have devices that they depend on for their medical needs have power if there is an outage. Um, and I'm pleased to present to you to you the fact that we purchased 100 three kilowatt hour batteries. What you see here is um, the Goal Zero Yeti 3000. So we purchased 100 of these with permission from uh, the board uh, to work in partnership with local actors to deliver it to the to deliver them to the most vulnerable customers in our service area. And I wanted to point out, even though we're very focused on the grid and renewables, we need to consider um, the additional benefit that these off-grid systems have. Because previously, if your power went out and you needed to charge up a, a medical device or a CPAP machine, you might go to um, a local community center, for example, and, and charge up there. But now with COVID, we really want to minimize the opportunity for uh, group gatherings like that in order to um, ensure that we're doing our part to minimize spread. Would you mind going to the next slide, please? So uh, this is us at the storage unit in San Rafael. The big thanks to a, a group of MCE staffers. We all went out and helped uh, unpack this set of 100 batteries. Um, from here, we met with three of our Centers for Independent Living. We partnered with um, people and experts in this area who know about what kind of medical um, devices draw different types of power. So we partnered with them to use their expertise. They're listed here, the Marin Center for Independent Living, Disability Services and Legal Center, which operates in Napa, and the Independent Living Resources of Contra Costa and Solano. And these were three key incredible partners. They received the intake forms and the interest forms evaluated for greatest need and we were able to offer them these batteries to support MCE customers to be able to shelter in place in their home. Next slide please. So this is just, it, it warmed my heart, so I thought it might do the same for yours. Here's a, just a quick testimonial I got in my inbox last weekend. This is an email from Joanne Jeanette. She lives in Lafayette, and she's a sweetheart. And so it's, um, it's just heartwarming because folks really do need these devices to be powered during times of an outage. It can be, it's really stressful time for everyone, um, and specifically for folks who need these equipment to to breathe and to, to, to shelter in place safely. So I had actually invited a member of the public to see the, my two more minutes of time here. Is Mr. Blair on the line? Yes. Hello, I'm so glad you were able to join us today, Richard. Um, Thank you. So just a quick introduction. Richard has lived in West Marin since 1988. He has two books, The Point Rays Visions and Visions of Marin, which have been defined or called the Definitive Visual History of the County by the Pacific Sun Editor-in-Chief. And through MCE's partnership with the Marin Center for Independent Living, Mr. Blair received one of the Yeti 3000s that we purchased and has prepared a few remarks about his experience. Over to you, Richard. Hi, my name is Richard Blair. I've been a photographer for 50 years. I was park photographer for the Park Service in Yosemite. Now I do coffee table books. We have 10 of them. And the books always encourage environmental conservation. Uh, my pictures have been a lot of Bay Area museums. But I want to talk about the Yeti power supply that we got. Um, I live on Inverness Ridge by Point Reyes National Seashore, which is an unbelievably great place to be. But it's uh, forested and uh, it's prone to very strong winter storms. In fact, um, about two weeks ago, my house was almost destroyed by the Woodward fire, which came within a mile and a half of the house. And what saved it is the wind was going in the other direction. But um, my, my, I and my wife both use CPAP machines to help us breathe at night. We both have some heart problems. And uh, because because we live in, in 
this fairly extreme area, uh, we frequently get power outages, particularly from winter storms, but also the, the planned outages for fire safety. And uh, when the fire goes out, what we did is we went, we have a, we bought, a Costco bought gas generator and we used to go out, fill up our car with gas, with uh, gas cans, take it up to the generator. The generator was outside because it generates a lot of fumes. We'd be pouring gasoline into this thing. Sometimes it was hot, there'd be extension cords in the rain. Not a good idea. So it's really been uh, a tremendous, we really look forward to using this Yeti uh, power supply. It's much, much safer and really great. So uh, the main thing I wanted to, the main reason I'm here is to uh, thank, really to thank the board, um, the Marin Center for Independent Living and all the folks that worked hard to get this stuff. It's really, really a wonderful thing. And, um, you know, I, I really believe that um, because of the, our political situation these days, uh, that if you're working on a local level like you folks are, and maybe we can improve things specifically and then work our, hopefully work our way up. Um, but uh, in, in closing, um, I have, uh, we have a nonprofit, environmentali.org, and we donate free pictures to good causes such as um, MCE and um, Marin Center for Independent Living. So we look forward to giving you folks free photographs for your outreach. And uh, the last thing I'm saying, as, a, as, a, as an old hiker, besides doing your good work on the board, I suggest you go out outside to have some fun. So thank you very much again. And Alexander, if I could just jump in here and Richard, I really appreciate your being here. And, and I want everyone to know what a fantastic photographer you are. <laughs> and to look for it's Richard. Fish in the barrel. <laughs> uh, <laughs> to look for Richard's books. And um, it's wonderful that you do give away some of your photographs um, to organizations you respect. But your skill is tremendous. And, and I'm so glad you're able to participate in this program. And it's a benefit for you and your wife. No, it's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you all. Director Kuhnhart, you had a I, comment? I have one of those visions books on my coffee table. Um, oh. Alexandra, Alexandra, great presentation. Um, to what extent is this uh, Yeti program aligned with solar? Are there, is there any uh, motivation or, or uh, effort to bring some of these customers um, online with at least some solar for charging, or is that a totally separate program? No, it's a great question. Um, the answer is twofold. So because these are off-grid systems, they do have um, kind of an add-on that you could purchase separately. So they charge, again, they're not integrated into the home, but there is an option for folks to, to buy a solar kind of click in to allow for it to charge even, um, even during extreme weather events and prolonged PSPS events. The slightly longer answer is that we are simultaneously running the program that Jamie, that Jamie mentioned, where we are calling similar customers who are on medical baseline and in high fire threat areas to see if they would be interested in a longer term installation with a bigger battery integrated into their house to pair with solar. And we are using the low income solar rebate fund um, to also layer grid alternatives, nonprofit solar installation for these customers who qualify. And one, how many of the hundred are allocated, spoken for? At this point, 100, um, well, we did receive one dud. So 99 of the batteries um, have already been given to the partners. Um, they have been the ones identifying customers. I do believe all the, all the ones in Napa have been allocated, all the ones in Marin. And I believe there might be a couple more in Contra Costa that we're still waiting for a couple applications, but the grand majority are already allocated and either in people's homes or on their way. Do you expect to get more? So this was a, a one-time purchase that your board approved. Um, I would be leaning on you for that answer, Ford. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. It's a great program. Director Kohler. 
um, You're muted, Barbara. Barbara. I thought I unmuted. Okay, thank you. Um, it's a similar follow-up question about possibly doing more. Some of you may be aware that in Fairfax, we just opened Victory Village, which is very low, low income, senior housing, and many of those slots were allocated to disabled people. It's independent living and chronically homeless. So I think there's an opportunity there to potentially connect. I know there's many people all over in our jurisdictions. So I would encourage um, our chair and others on the board to consider trying this again. We also have Bennett House in Fairfax, which is another very low, low income, which I believe the LIFT program's working with on energy efficiency right now as they remodel. And I know there's many other worthy folks out there, but particularly because we're so worried about these power shutoffs and because Fairfax is in the, all of Fairfax is in a high fire threat area, um, we will probably be experiencing the longer PSPS uh, because PGE is not doing the substation work in our area because we're high fire threat. So I'm sure there's many other jurisdictions in MCE that would love to have these batteries. So I, I would just suggest maybe we have this as an agenda item in the future. Thank you. Thanks, Director Patterson. Thanks. Uh, so I would second that is having it as an agenda item. Solano County is always a challenge to get information out and to get participation in these programs. And uh, so part of my retirement goal is to accelerate the adoption of these kinds of programs. And we have a huge gap in the county in terms of awareness and taking advantage of what's being offered by MCE. Uh, so I'd like some consideration when we do have this agenda as to how to do a, a more robust outreach to get more participation by Solano County and the two newer members, not to mention Venetia. Okay, do we have any other comments or questions from board members? I don't think so, Kate. I think Super. that's Super. That, oh, that well, yeah, yeah, I David. do have a bit, so kind of a big picture, uh, future oriented question. It, it's uh, expensive to sort of have MCE buy and and, shel and uh, shoulder 100% of the cost and put these out there. Uh, is there consideration or could there be consideration of a cost sharing program? Um, I, I have already gotten questions from NRG folks, neighborhood response group folks in our uh, Twin Cities and Central Marin Fire Department area uh, about uh, future availability and um, uh, and I'm just thinking that possibly a way to multiply would be a um, cost sharing program. That's a great idea. I think that's definitely something we should look into and consider whether uh, it's a possibility. Yeah. We have so, a member of the public who ah, would like to speak. Fantastic, Anio, please. Anio, can you engage them? Hi, this is Howdy Gowdy. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. very well. Uh, Thank you for allowing me to speak. Um, my name is Howdy Gaudi. I live in El Cerrito and I applaud MCE on uh, both this off-grid and on-grid uh, resiliency program. Um, I wanted to speak to the on-grid program specifically and um, I could be wrong but my understanding is that um, it's uh, the battery uh, is not allowed to export to the grid. It can only meet uh, the on-site consumption. And I was wondering if MCE has looked into this regulatory um, uh, situation and whether it's possible to advocate for changing that. Um, because I think if you look at the, the resources that you're installing, um, at least on that daily um, peak shifting capacity, um, you're not able to realize the full capacity of the equipment, both in, in peak kilowatts and in kilowatt hours, because you're, you're limited by what that customer actually consumes in terms of the impact to the grid. 
And so I think uh, changing the structure that would allow um, sort of net export from the battery would, would improve the efficacy of this equipment and its benefit to the grid. So I would really encourage you to be part of looking at, at that regulatory environment and how it could possibly be changed to an, increase the impact of these uh, great programs. Um, the other comment I would make about it is I hope that as MC deploys um, the battery systems that um, there's an effort to reach as, as many customers as possible rather than um, doing a, a lot of larger systems which might be oversized for uh, the, the backup power aspect. Um, I think it again because of the limit of um, on-site use you know distributing resources over more customers would be a beneficial thing for the program. So thank you. Great. Thank you, Howdy. Great ideas. Director um, Kohler. Yes, uh, just one quick thing. I want to thank uh, Jamie and her staff for working with uh, Bruce Ackerman and folks in Fairfax and our Climate Action Committee on the possible SGIP for converting our pavilion into a uh, microgrid. And so I'm hoping that we are in that second pot of money that isn't completely used up. But thank you, Jamie, for all your efforts and please thank your team. Okay. All right, I'm not seeing anyone else if you are, um, Darlene. Kate, yes, there is one more um, okay. member of the public and Enyo ah. is engaging them. Great. Good evening. Madam President, members of the Peter. I see you the directors. Hi, good to see you. My name is Peter Mendoza. I'm the director of advocacy as a Marine Center for Independent Living. And we just want to lend our voice and really thank the board and also thank Richard for, uh, Richard Butter for telling the story of our value community member. This is a really important program for our communities, through our batteries, along with um, resources from PGE. PGA and the California Foundation of Independent Living Centers really go a long way to keep people with disabilities and all their adults who depend on energy for their life safety and mobility needs. Our community is really concerned about public safety power shutoffs. It's so along with the batteries and also the work to make sure that people sign up for the medical baseline program which allows people to have more outreach when there's a public safety power shut off and uh, work to help people create disaster plans. Um, this is really an important program. <clears throat> I would just support MCE, uh, the previous suggestion of uh, trying to secure more batteries because just at Marin Sill, we have about 50 people on the waiting list. We're going through other sources to get batteries to, but this is really an important program. So thank you very much. And thank you, Peter, for being here. Appreciate it. All right. Okay. Are we good, Darlene? Anyone else? All right. You're muted, but I got the point. So, um, so John, I wanted to just raise a question. We have two other pres presentations in this part of our agenda, one on social equity and the other on customer engagement, participation with COVID-19. We're also behind uh, the time for our break. And I'm wondering how folks are feeling. Would you like to take a little break now and then come back to those two presentations or hang in and get this section done and then do our break? Any strong feelings one way or the other? Your break, I'm getting a break. <laughs> nodding heads for the break. I think I think the break is the way to go. So, Don, if that's workable with your team, sure. yeah. why don't we take our 15-minute break now, and then we'll come back better, more able to pay attention to the next two presentations. Sounds great. And um, great. we're going to have a screen up for folks with a countdown clock to make it easy for you to know when you're really needed back, um, and you're going to get that up for us. I, and while we're transitioning, just a big thank you to. Um, both Enyo and Evelyn, who are helping behind the scenes with um, all of the Zoom uh, functions. So I um, hope everyone enjoys their break. We'll be back in 15 minutes.
I was getting so happy listening to the music, I thought I might never actually have to come back to the meeting. <laughs> like this, huh? Was that the the uh, Ben uh, Ben Choi, uh, Lindsay Saxby, and David Potofsky trio? <laughs> <laughs> it was very good. That was great. Really Thank good. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, now that we've had some music and a little more coffee, do we have most people back? So we should get back at it. We have uh, um, a Kate, it's mass. Kevin. I'm, yes. I'm back on audio, but I gotta get back on video here, so it'll take me a minute. Okay. But go ahead. You're okay. on video, Kevin. We can see you. We can oh, see you, can. Kevin. Oh, yes. I can't see myself. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so. Vic and Don, I mean, um, Kate, Vic and had his hand raised apparently before we went off on break, oh. so oh. I'm not sure if he needs to um, yeah. speak. Oh, Sorry wow. about that, Vic. And uh, Gee, somebody's watching. Uh, I just wanted to thank Howdy for his uh, comment about uh, our resiliency effort. And I wanted to assure him that our uh, design is such that uh, we will value capacity and energy that will flow back into the distribution system and eventually into, uh, into counting towards MCEs capacity and energy requirements. So uh, our program does capture both components that uh, how you said. Great, thanks for adding that, Vikan. All right, and John, I'm gonna turn back to you I think, so we can move on to our social equity presentation. Great, so um, we are going to hear from Jennifer Green, uh, manager of customer programs and um, a couple of other folks with our team, including um, Shaheen Khan, who is our Director of Human Resources, um, and I believe also Justin Marquez. So um, we can get pull up that presentation and I'll turn it over to the team. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm going to be starting off the presentation here. So this section item that we're going to be discussing is um, social equity. So we can move to the next slide, please. The section of this presentation that I'm going to be talking about is how MCE is diversifying our outreach. So as COVID has changed the way we operate both internally and externally, the HR team has built out processes and procedures, leveraging our cloud-based systems and tools to ensure we can conduct our work remotely. And we have broadened our recruiting and outreach efforts when we have staff transitions. These increased efforts include a focus on recruiting, through a balanced approach of targeting local-based communities and CBOs, diversifying our affiliations with member-based organizations and targeted markets, and have worked with LinkedIn to create brand recognition of MCE to attract talent locally and across the state and country in an effort to cast the widest net of candidates possible. Some of these examples that are included on the slide here is we've increased position posting to targeted markets like AABE, American Association of Black Energy, ALPFA, Association of Latino Professionals for America, NBMBAA, National Black MBA Association, American Indian Chamber of Commerce, and other position-specific websites. Our job announcements are emailed to our community education, employment, and energy affiliates like County of Marin, Richmond Works, Contra Costa Workforce Development, Lean, and other CBO partners. And we also share all the job announcements with our staff to distribute to their individual networks. LinkedIn Recruiter and Talent Hub has allowed us to streamline and automate our recruitment processes with LinkedIn expanding our brand recognition and Talent Hub streamlining our processes through an applicant tracking system commonly known as an ATS. Next slide, please. Our job announcements highlight MCE's commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion. Our offices accommodate persons with mobility issues and full ADA compliance. And depending on the position, MCE allows experience in lieu of education to minimize any barriers to entry. Our interview process includes cross-team panels, clear and transparent messaging to candidates and panelists. Next slide, please. This has all culminated to our commitment to diversity statement that I'd like to share with the board. Um, I'll read it out now. Diverse opinions, ideas, and experiences push and challenge us as individuals and as a team to work better and smarter. 
we know that the more diverse our workforce is, the better we support our customers and the diverse interests they represent. We are committed to providing an inclusive, empowering, and supportive work environment. MCE welcomes individuals from all backgrounds and walks of life as colleagues, customers, and community partners. Thank you. We can move to the next part of the presentation. Thank you, Shaheen. Good to see you. Yeah, same here. Hi, I think I'm next. Um, my name is Jennifer Green, and I work on our customer programs team uh, where we design and administer energy efficiency, uh, distributed energy resources, and transportation infrastructure programs. Um, and I'm very social equity is one of the cornerstones of MCE's work. Our commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion provides a really fitting backdrop for all the work that we and our implementers do and are planning to do related to um, one, training the current workforce and two, bringing in new talent to the energy industry. Uh, next slide, please. This is a um, couple of photos of our contractor training and education implementer, who is the Association for Ener uh, Energy Affordability. They're working with contractors and property owners through existing uh, programs that we administer. Uh, this one is in San Rafael, um, the one on the left. And uh, the one on the bottom and the one on the upper right are our newest effort, which we're calling the Workforce Education and Training Program. Um, in the bottom, they're on a ride along, uh, what we call a ride along with a participating contractor in Napa. And the upper right photo is a virtual round table that we had with some job seekers. Um, our mission at MCE is reducing greenhouse gas emissions while offering economic and workforce benefits and creating more equitable communities, as you all know. This new program, again, the Workforce Education and Training Program, is funded by ratepayers through the Public Utilities Commission. So it's one of those programs um, in our portfolio. It'll provide training, and already has, uh, for energy efficiency, electrification and high performance homes contractors and their staff. Contractors that are part of the MCE family, uh, which is those contractors that work on MCE programs already or plan to, are eligible to receive no cost training and education on the latest energy efficiency best practices. And in return, we require that they follow MCE's mission in every installation they complete. Next slide, please. Um, as I said, we're facilitating ride-alongs through this program with contractors, as well as uh, educational workshops through our program implementer, the Association for Energy Affordability. Some people uh, might know them as AEA, and they have um, an office in the East Bay. We're also collecting information about educational needs uh, for both contractors and job seekers through our industry roundtables. From these ride-alongs and roundtables, we've confirmed what we thought, that contractors are looking for staff that are ready, willing, and able to hit the ground running at their organizations. So for the second part of the program, um, which is pictured at the top here uh, for the job seekers, we're developing an internship component. We'll invite contractors to become mentors as part of our no cost internship program and link them with qualified job seekers. For the job seeker side of the equation, we'll be building pathways to sustainable jobs, focusing on recruitment of disadvantaged workers, people of color, and women. In short order, we'll be co-developing curriculum with local education and training partners um, 
once the job seekers complete a training program, which typically takes around 12 weeks. For no cost, approximately 160 hour internship. Job seekers are going to be paid to participate in the internship. And at the end of it, through our careful planning and matching, <clears throat> we anticipate the contract. Next slide. Jennifer, I just wanted to let you know that some of your, some of your audio is a bit garbled. Um, so folks are having a little trouble hearing you, but um, I think if you can just run through the rest of the slides quickly, we'll see if there are questions. Thank you for plowing through. Okay. Sure. I just moved my internet connection, so that may help. Okay. Um, here's our plan for the remainder of the year. Um, we'll continue with skills development offerings for contractors and we'll be vetting them to participate as mentors for the job seekers. Um, we're also developing and starting the pre-apprenticeship training program with our new partners. Um, we'd like to start those trainings in Q4 of this year or Q1 of next year, depending on COVID developments and our partners' ability to ramp up and recruit uh, job seekers. Um, and then in 2021, we'll continue working on training contractors and vetting them as mentors. And we'll funnel 20 job seekers through the internship component of the program. And then we'll rinse and repeat that whole pro, uh, process. Um, in closing, we see this program expanding into the future to include um, training for non-residential contractors as well. Uh, so at the end, I welcome any feedback that you have and, and questions, and thanks so much. Good morning, everyone. So my name is Justin Marquez. I am MCE's Community Equity Specialist, and I'm also a member of MCE's internal Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Tiger Team. Um, and I'm here to represent the Public Affairs Team and talk about our DEI work as it relates to community engagement. Uh, next slide, please. So we broke it out into three buckets. And the first I wanna talk about is our partnerships with community-based organizations. Now this is one of the main ways that we're doing our community engagement through strong partnerships and communities with organizations that are grassroots and based in the communities that we serve. So we're working to build and further those relationships, especially those in vulnerable communities and we're targeting those with risk factors that are heightened by recent fires, as well as COVID-19. We're also growing our sponsorship dollar spend um, on diverse communities, and that includes five new CBO partnerships, and we're actually currently working on further, furthering our spend on diverse communities this year. In addition to sponsoring organizations and making those relationships, we're also engaging with them through the Community Power Coalition. Uh, many of you are already familiar with this organization, but this is our coalition of environmental justice and sustainability and community advocates from all 34 member communities of MCE service area. This year, we've actually introduced new organizations to the Community Power Coalition, including Puertas Abiertas, which is based out of Napa, and they're actually focused on providing social services for a predominantly undocumented and farm worker constituency. So we're really excited to work with them and reaching those consumer, those customers uh, up in Napa. We're also working with Opportunity Junction, a nonprofit that provides workforce education and training in East Contra Costa, and Safe Return Project, which provides social services and workforce development for formerly incarcerated folks, and they're based out of Richmond, California. So we're excited because these organizations that do really deep and important work in our communities are providing diverse perspectives. Uh, we've added six new members this year and we're continually growing the Community Power Coalition so that we have a more diverse and inclusive coalition that really represents the communities we serve. Uh, and the third piece that we're really excited to share is that we're working on a community ambassador position. And this actually isn't a position within MCE, but it is again, a partnership with our CBO partners that are in the service area, in our communities. 
Um, the goal of having community ambassadors in the community is to increase representation and participation among our most underserved customers. And we're targeting partner organizations that are located in disadvantaged communities. Um, the goal for this role is to support MCE initiatives, but also to support and build capacity for the CBO partners that we're uh, building relationships with. So these are sort of the three main ways that we're really incorporating DEI in our community engagement. Um, and I'm really excited to be here to represent this. And on this presentation with Shaheen and with Jennifer, it's exciting to see how DEI is really being threaded in multiple and all of the departments of MCE, but this is just a slice of it. Um, so this is, if you can go to the next slide. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for the time and please uh, we'll stick around if you have any questions. It's great, great presentations, good work, all three of you, it's terrific. Um, comments or questions from board members? For the public, I'm not seeing anyone, are you? Ah, Tom, please. Nope. Um, so we've seen some great presentations this morning. And um, one, one thing that I would like to, like to get um, would be some kind of a quick summary, like in a table form, um, about all of these programs and projects um, that are being done. You know, we've talked about resiliency programs today. Uh, we haven't had a presentation on it, but we typically have presentations on our energy efficiency programs. Uh, we just talked about training. Um, and and what, what I would like to see just for my own use is a table that, that shows the program, uh, what the cost is, where the fun, what the source of funding is, and then maybe some metrics like, like uh, uh, you know, for our EV charging stations. This kind of came up because somebody, I, I put out information about the, the new EV charging stations in general and the ones going into Richmond. And I got a question from somebody. I, I think they were I think they were motivated because they thought, well, maybe I'm paying for this because I'm an MCE customer. And uh, so staff provided a response and explained that no, this, these funds were coming from somewhere else. But um, I, I think it'd be good to have a summary that just has those basic facts. You know, for each for each one of these programs, um, what the program is. Uh, what the cost is, where the funding's coming from, and then some metrics like, you know, how many have been installed or how many, you know, how many people are being served, something like that. That, that would be useful for me, you know, maybe an updated on a quarterly basis. Well, that's a great idea, Tom. Supervisor Joya? Uh, yeah, first, th thanks for the presentations. I am, um, can you go back on that slide on the, on the community power coalitions that you listed? Can you put that up? And by the way, I, I agree wholeheartedly with Tom about getting a full summary of all of that. That would be good to put together. That would be great. I think you're putting up the slide, I think. We are working on it. Should be okay. up in a moment. Okay, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, it's the one on the community power on the uh, power. Yes, the Yeah, community power coalition. So um, can we give you suggestions? Uh, and we don't have to do it now on on others. I, I'm, I'm very familiar with Opportunity Junction and Safe Return Project. Um, Safe Return Project we work with them a lot on criminal justice reform issues. Um, but there's some other organizations that have focused a lot on, on power, uh, especially in the Richmond area, as Tom knows. Um, so maybe just shoot, send me an email. I mean, because I'd we obviously like to broaden the kind of work you're doing. Um, um, I work with a lot of them in, in my work. And so, uh, and especially on my work with the Air Board and Air District, and it would be nice to tie those folks in. Yeah. Safe Return is great. They just focus a lot on criminal justice reform issues. They're a great organization, but um, 
there's some others that are focused on, on um, green power, air quality, those kinds of things. Of course, I would, I'll follow up separately with you, Director okay. Joy. We definitely appreciate all the recommendations. Great, so yeah, yeah, we can, give me a call. We can have a conversation about that uh, at, at some point. Um, and um, in fact, there's specifically a, a coalition that's working on, on power issues. And, and what's the kind of work you're doing specifically with these organizations? Yeah, so our Community Power Coalition is one of our most important ways that we connect with advocates. It's a two-way communication street. We provide general updates around MCE. Um, we give regular policy, legislative and regulatory policy updates to our advocates. Um, and similarly, we also use this as an opportunity to get feedback from the community on programs or outreach and also assistance for outreach. Yeah. Um, so in broadening the scope of the coalition um, to include organizations like Safe Return, we're hoping to reach a broader audience. Yeah. But definitely we have plenty of uh, organizations such as Asian Pacific Environmental yeah, Network, yeah. Right. Communities for a Better Environment. Okay, so we'll talk separately on that. Thank you very much. Yeah, super. I think Director, Director Patterson, Patterson had a hand and, up. Yeah. And then Bursan. Yeah, th thanks so much. Um, so one of the reasons to be engaged with MCE is that it's so inspiring and just uh, re-energizes all of my interests. Already I have sent the PowerPoint presentation on the batteries off to our interim uh, city manager and he's responded by once again contacting uh, fire, but I want to get to what I'm very proud that the city of Benicia just did, which was um, adopt a policy for equity, diversity, and inclusion uh, with the advice of Benicia Black Lives Matter organization. We're 74, 75% white, so this is a kind of an interesting uh, path for us to be taking. And um, and my neighbor Vallejo who will soon be a member, participating member in MCE, um, has many needs that uh, Richmond has been one of the leaders in, uh, as presented in some of the ways of helping, giving people a second chance and incorporating that with some of the power projects. So what I'd like to do is see if we can take the inspiration from these PowerPoint presentations and spread them wide and far. And then as a, a sister ambassador to Vallejo and to some degree with Fairfield as, as well, is advance this because the opportunity is so um, uh, great and the, the eagerness with Vallejo in uh, um, addressing some of the uh, problems that you all have been hearing about and reading about and watching. Um, so I just want to say thanks to MCE and thanks to the staff and thanks for your constant leadership. It's just so refreshing. Thanks, Elizabeth and Darlene. Who, Bar Darlene, you're muted. Who was had their hand up? Director Bearson. Thank you. Hi, it's Eddie Bersan, and I'm in Concord, and I would like to somewhat echo what John was saying, but I'd like to give it a Concord twist. So I'd like, I have some Concord uh, operations that I would like uh, included on this. I'm also curious if uh, you reached out to all the various building trades and whatnot uh, for seeing what their input would be. Director Bersan, thank you for that. Uh, and we'll follow up with you separately regarding uh, Concord-based organizations. And yes, we have been in touch with um, the local unions. Um, happy to follow up with you on that as well separately. And I see Director Cunart has a hand up. Yes. Quick question. Um, one of the things that we, in evaluating the barriers to additional solar and batteries uh, in the Drawdown Marin program uh, ha uncovered really was private contractors saying that there was just an out and out shortage of competent electricians who could handle the 
the controls, the solar and the battery combinations and so forth. And so I was curious if uh, part of this excellent outreach that's being described also is reaching to our uh, very good community colleges and uh, bringing along um, new, new additions to the workforce. <clears throat> Yeah, I can speak to that. Um, we have been in touch with the community colleges um, over the last few years on um, internship programs and um, and other uh, opportunities. Um, we do a lot. Of, we share our recruitments with local community colleges as well. Um, so we do have some good connections. We've actually been looking at doing some resiliency battery installations at, at some of those locations. Um, so we have good relationships, but if there's anyone you'd like to introduce us to, um, we're very open to that. Super. Do we have more hands up from directors? We don't have any directors, but there is a member of the public. Okay. Please go ahead, member of the public. And you know, do they have access? Yes. Okay, thank you. I think that's Howdy. Go ahead, Howdy. Howdy, howdy. He's, he's, he's muted. muted. We're not able to hear you. Howdy, are you muted? We can't hear you. It looks like Howdy's muted. I've given permission to speak though. Okay. So he should be able to unmute. All right. Uh, well, we can always come back once once Howdy's back in action, um, technically. Well, Not a problem. Sandra, um, has a question as well. Okay. Thank you. Can you hear me? Uh huh. Ah, here I am. Um, thank you. I just wanted to weigh in on the community colleges um, question, uh, which I, I thank you for, for posing. I, I wanted to assure the board that we are, through the Workforce Education and Training Program that Jen described, we are engaging with uh, specifically College of Marin uh, and 4CD, the Contra Costa College Community uh, Contra Costa College Community College, is it? College. College. Four CD. <laughs> thank you, sorry, um, for CD, uh, as well as um, our partners up in Solano, though I will say that um, Mayor Patterson, if you have some connections up in Solano, um, it'd be really nice to have your, um, up, your uh, introduction because I think those have been slightly less um, willing to engage but we are engaging with con with colleges in order to connect them through the workforce education and training program to get students into these pipelines to to green jobs so Alexandra um, if I through the chair if I could speak um, yeah so that's uh, less than enthusiastic participation in so many things here in Solano but I am prepared to add some of that energy and I will make the connection. Uh, I'd like to put a plug in for the Solano Community College actually has a working agreement with Sonoma State so that students can um, get credits for Sonoma State at the Solano Community College. And I think it's the only community college that has that relationship with Sonoma State. So huge opportunity and let's get together and exchange some names. Terrific, great idea. Is there anyone else um, on the board who'd like to ask a question or comment? Okay. There, there is another member of the public who has access to speak. Okay, they're welcome to speak now. Is that, is that me? Yeah, Doug, hi. Oh, hi. Um, we were just having a conversation about potential outcomes of the election um, in November and potential Biden plan funding for both clean energy and employment and, and uh, the economy and so on. The thought is that sometimes um, there is a burst of money that comes out in some omnibus type bill that might do funding, particularly for 
so-called shovel ready projects or projects that are ready to go and might be funded? Has there been, has there been thought on the part of MCE and its community about doing some preparation for that kind of thing? Of course, money will go to people who are ready for it. And if there's, if there's a, a project that has been thought about in advance that needs funding, it might, might uh, give, give us an advantage um, if there is some big unknown bill early next year. And of course, the, the right people win the election. Just that comment, thank you. Great, thank you, Doug. Appreciate your positive energy about the, the election. And um, could we take the slides down so we could get more folks on the screen, be helpful? Thank you. Uh, Darlene, anyone else with a, with a hand up who'd like to comment? No. Um, Howdy, did you um, return with the audio? I if am. Not, sorry, oh, was I asked something? <laughs> no. Howdy, we thought you wanted to speak, but we couldn't hear you, so we're just checking in. Okay, well, thank you for that. No, I, I didn't have any intention to speak, but thanks for the inquiry. Okay, like Great. your screensaver. You. Really cool. Nice. All righty. We're, We're good, Kate. Great. Thank you so much. Okay, I think we have one more presentation in this part of our agenda, which is on customer engagement and participation with COVID-19. Great. So we're going to hear from uh, Heather Shepard, who is our Director of um, Public Affairs. And um, I realize we're running a little bit behind schedule, um, but if we're able to get through that item and the first part of item 7, um, 7A, um, I expect we'll be able to get lunch started by 1230, um, if that's uh, acceptable to folks. That sounds um, good. Okay, so um, with that, um, I'll turn it over to Heather Shepard. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Um, I'm really pleased to share the res some results from our recent customer engagement efforts. And I wanted to just note that a lot of the information that I'm going to share with you is the result of the great work from the Public Affairs Department, the Customer Programs Department, and also all of our great collaboration with our community members. Um, I'll quickly go through the slides and save time at the end for feedback and questions. So if that works, we can go to the next slide. So absolutely influenced by COVID, we've really had to pivot and strengthen our digital platforms and virtual customer engagement over the last six months. Um, a lot of these were efforts we are planning to do anyway, and it really just forced us to double down and strengthen um, more quickly. So I think there was a bit of a silver lining there. I would just say that the headlines are that we're seeing very encouraging results um, from these efforts. And every month we see deeper engagement from our customers. Um, I did just want to note, I heard the comments. Those are great suggestions from Director Butt and Director Joya. We do have a section on our website under community benefits that highlights our customer programs. But I think there's more that we can do to explain some of the benefits and do it in sort of a more digestible way. So that feedback is noted and stay tuned for that. Um, we can go to the next slide, please. One of the things we decided to do back when Shelter in Place started is to use our 10 year anniversary celebration to do a couple things. We wanted to strengthen um, our thought leadership and show uh, our community in a stronger way um, our, all the things that we've done and also provide our 10 year anniversary as a way to engage with customers. So the next few slides, I'm just gonna share with you quickly what some of those efforts look like. And all of these uh, platforms are things that we'll continue to build on even after, uh, we'll, even after we get into our 11th year and beyond. You can go to the next slide, please. So one of the things we did is focus a lot more on providing information through our blog. So when folks are out, um, maybe there's more time at home and they're Googling information that they need for practical energy um, advice, we wanna make sure that MCE shows up more and more in their search results. So what I just wanted to share here are some of the recent blogs that we've developed to address that. And so you'll see a lot more focus on 
practical information, how can MCE help you get started. These are, of course, just adding another pathway for customer program participation and also just letting folks know um, about the variety of things that we offer in the community. And so far in the last five months, we've seen a doubling of the views on our blog site. So we're really encouraged and we do see that working. We can go to the next slide, please. Um, the other thing that we've created, which is great, is our new expert advice webpage. When we had planned to do a community celebration um, originally before COVID and shelter in place, we thought, how can we bring that spirit of a community event um, and some of our vendors and partners in an online forum? So we've created a new energy expert advice page. Um, we've also introduced more short videos, sort of how to and get started. So some of the videos we've populated there, we've used our in-house experts, um, David Potofsky and Justine Parmley are featured. Um, and, you know, just talking about answers to uh, public safety power shutoffs. What does that mean? How do I get started with battery storage and other topics? And this is going to be a platform that we will continue to build on and we absolutely welcome ideas. So we're really excited on that. Um, you can go to the next slide. Another thing that we did is think about what can we do to celebrate and commemorate our 10 years in a lasting way. So we've decided as part of our 10 year anniversary, we redirected some of our funding that we would have spent on other in person events and funded um, EV charging stations at two of our community partners. So we have provided 100% covered EV charging for Napa Valley College and also Atchison Village in Richmond, which is a multifamily um, complex. And the exciting thing about doing that is that through our commemorative efforts to bring EV charging to their communities, both of these partners have decided to use this investment to go beyond and use our work and partnership as a launching pad for a much larger project. So I think that's a great example of us um, being a catalyst in the community and also providing EV charging um, where there was none. And another important aspect is that we intentionally chose partners that had that were very aligned with our diversity and equity inclusion mission. So that was also part of the consideration. Next slide, please. Some of you have, may have seen our Because of You ad campaign. Um, we are running a bilingual campaign this month and next month is also part of our 10 year celebration. Um, and one of the themes in choosing Because of You is it's really important that we showcase the importance of the collaborative partnership. Um, and the programmatic benefits. So here I've just given you a snapshot of what some of the ads look like. Um, it's a very broad based campaign. We have spots on cable, on radio, print, web, um, and also transit stops. So we're very excited to have that, um, to have that campaign running. You can go to the next slide. And last but not least, I wanted to highlight, I believe you've received um, an early copy of our 10 year impact re report, but we spent some time, we felt like it was really important to document um, all, the, all the great accomplishments that we've made across a lot of areas in our work. And we're really excited to have been able to share that copy with you. We'll be sending out a press release later next week on this, and there'll also be some digital links. So you'll have opportunities to help us disseminate that um, more broadly in the community. I did just wanna pause on this report because um, we partnered with the finance team to unveil a new metric in this report. And I think this was brought up earlier, but if you think about our collective and total community reinvestment, it goes beyond energy savings, it goes beyond local projects, it goes beyond workforce development, and we really wanted to look holistically at our impact and add a dollar impact to that. And we've unveiled that uh, metric in this report. So I'm pleased to announce that that's in there. And over the past 10 years, we have $180 million that MCE has reinvested in our community, um, in our service area across all of those efforts that I just mentioned. So we're really um, excited to share that metric. I think that just speaks to uh, the depth of what we do. Um, you can go to the next slide, please. 
So I wanted to pivot a little bit on the last slides and just talk a little more specifically about some of the customer engagement that we're doing. And what I've done here is, is highlight it by customer type. So right here, I'm just giving you some highlights on general community engagement. Um, and what you can see here is that despite COVID, we've absolutely continued to connect with our communities and, and very successfully so. And I'd like to just note that we um, are at uh, in the high 80s with our unincorporated Solano enrollment. Um, and I think that's fantastic. That was a lot of work. The enrollment, the community meetings that we planned hit right when shelter in place started. And I really commend the team. They pivoted quickly and the results are there. So um, I'm really excited to share um, some of the work that we've been able to do virtually throughout the community. Um, you can go to the next slide. Um, now focusing a little bit more on some of our customer segments, what I wanted to highlight here is some of the specific programmatic work that we're doing that's targeting our residential and especially our vulnerable customers. Um, We've really expanded a lot of the work that we're doing, combining um, health in the home and energy with our, our Healthy Homes program. We started that effort in Marin and that's being expanded into Contra Costa. Um, we've been able to complete virtual site visits on uh, low income and multifamily properties and have site visits completed now for over 300 units. Um, and we've also spent some time redesigning our programs to be able to support virtual assistance. And I think the last bullet speaks to that. Um, where we had folks going into the home, we've really tried to reimagine that and, and offer that other option. You can go to the next slide. In terms of our top 250 largest energy users, um, I wanted to pause here for a second because you know, we, those users represent a large percent of our energy load. And we've spent the last 18 months really building a fantastic engagement platform. And that's really a small but mighty team that are working with them directly. So this is less of a broad-based email campaign. This is not um, advertising. This is folks talking to those customers, meeting with them. And we've built some great relationships. And that's great because when COVID hit, we couldn't do the same kind of engagement that we were doing. And that team has done such a fantastic job. And I just wanted to highlight here that this customer base is very stable, which is great. Um, and that we've also been able to increase their participation in our services over this time as well. So it's not just a message of sort of holding steady but really being able to continue to engage them. Um, so I just wanted to call that out. And this has been a really important investment and I really, uh, the team has done a great job. You can go to the next slide. So in terms of other business engagement, we do work um, with smaller commercial enterprises as well. And as you can see, even despite COVID, we're continuing to look for ways for them to save money. Um, and, you know, that's through a variety of things like technical assistance and qualified contractors helping them access rebates um, and do energy assessments. So all of that work um, is continuing as well for um, commercial enterprises who are, are a little bit smaller in nature, but no less important. You can go to the next slide. And this is my last slide um, before I, I end for questions, but I wanted to highlight our transportation electrification work. There's so much good stuff to share here. And I, I wanted three things I wanted to just, um, that, that stood out to me. One is the headline here that we've increased our public charging capacity by 40% across our service area. That's amazing. And that's in, in less than two years. And this is absolutely a collaborative effort between customer programs, public affairs, our community advocates and community partners. And when we bring all those elements to the table, this is the sort of work that we do. And, and it's really amazing. I'd also like to point out, we've been able to have 50% of those stations powered by Deep Green or planning to be, right? And that's equally um, important, right, to deepen our work. Let's make sure that when we're bringing new energy load that it's in the cleanest possible um, delivery option. The other thing I wanted to mention here is a shout out to all of you. Um, 
we reached out to our cities for help to do a co-branded email outreach and 18 of you worked with us so far and I think there's more to come to partner on that. And, and when we do things like that, what we're seeing is we're seeing a much higher customer engagement rate in these programs. So I just wanna thank you. Um, that's amazing. We didn't expect to get 18. Um, and, and again, the results really show when we can bring all of those partners to the table in a really focused, coordinated way, um, the results are there. So I wanted to sort of end with our EV work on a, on a high note, not that the other notes weren't equally amazing. Um, you can go to the next slide. Um, so I wanted to, I hope I didn't go through things too quickly, but I know, I think what we wanted to do today is just really pause. There was some earlier feedback about sharing more information on our customer programs. And I really wanna hear a little bit more from the board on um, what we can do to strengthen communication, strengthen programmatic work in our communities. And if you have any additional suggestions for future presentations or discussions, um, we're all ears. Great, thank you, Heather. That was really a good presentation. And I'm so glad to see that you're making use of us and, and all of our networks, um, because that, as you've experienced, can be very helpful, but terrific information. So board members, comments, questions? Director Beersan. Yes, um, on the marketing of the commemorative 10 year uh, EV stations, I'd like to, to know that we are putting some kind of plaque or something on these that says this in commemoration of our 10 years of service to this community, you know, we've expanded by providing this. Uh, this way, it's one thing to for us to know that it's commemorative, but it's more important that the rest of the world knows. So if, uh, if we don't put it out there, they're never going to know. So blow your own horn. No, absolutely. Can I just add, I should have mentioned, um, those stations probably won't be operational until May next year. And as always, we will toot our own horn with press release. Hopefully we can do a ribbon cutting, right? That would be something to strive for, even if we have to have a mask on. But we absolutely will make sure that there's a plaque, something physical so that folks know, and that really to highlight that partnership with, with Napa and with in Richmond as well. So absolutely, stay tuned. Director Kuhnhardt and then Director Wagon Connect. Heather, if Cordomandera is not on your list of 18, please add us right away. Yes, sir. Heather, I'm not sure if, if this is the right place to ask or, but I just want to put a bookmark in. Um, one of the issues that I've discussed with my, my um, people is that um, they would like to be going, we would like to be going to electric um, heat pump water, water tanks, hot water heaters, and um, there is no, there are no technicians. And so when you try to, when you try to buy them, there's no one, they, you can't buy those because you can't get them put in. And if we could figure out, I don't know if this is the right place or somewhere else, but if we could figure out training for um, electric heat pump technicians to put in electric water heaters, there, there would be a market. Duly noted, I think Jen, I don't know if you're still on or Alice's team, but I think there's an opportunity there on the workforce education and training that you just mentioned. So we will follow up with you on that. I'd be happy to work with our, our uh, workforce group. And also I see Alice from uh, our director of customer programs is um, wanting to chime in here. Go ahead, Alice. Yeah, hi, I hope everyone can hear me. I just wanted to respond to that comment because um, we do have a new program that we just went in on, a partnership between um, MCE, Bay Ren, East Bay Community Energy, and soon to be um, San Francisco. 
And uh, what we'll be doing there is we'll be offering training for contractors who want to learn to install heat pump water heaters. And then we're also offering them um, an incentive to keep heat pump water heaters stocked. So we'll be giving, giving them a bonus for every time that they install a heat pump water heater in replacement of a gas water heater to help bring up the knowledge base and also just the availability of those when emergency replacements come up. So um, that program has been launched. We have 14 contractors enrolled and we are just waiting for our first projects to come in now. And as is typical with MCE, your answer is perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Director Athis. You need to unmute Denise. I agree with what's already been stated and really like the idea about tooting our own horn. I think that's very, very important. Darlene, when you have a director, director Peel. Actually, I'm an alternate, but thank you for that title. Um, <laughs> Um, I don't know where it fits, Heather. Thanks for the update, but I'm being approached. I'm grateful to be approached by some high school students now locally in one of Sonoma Academy who want to roll their sleeves up, get more involved with climate change issues and things that are happening. And I'm, I'm directing them to MCE as well. Is there, I've heard a little bit about the um, college piece in the prior presentation, which was kind of exciting. I think Sonoma State. Um, is there uh, uh, outreach efforts or, or what is some of your guidance to direct this really youthful energy uh, to MCE? Thank you. I agree. And that is on our radar. And what I will do is Leanne Hoadley, who's our director of community and customer engagement is working on with in some pilot efforts with some high schools and we're planning to broaden that out and use high school students to help us run that program. So we'll connect and absolutely 100% in agreement. Anyone else? Kate, it's Kevin. No speakers. Kevin, please. Yeah. <clears throat> if you, if, um, I don't want to uh, get in the way of anybody else who's already. No, you're fine. Go ahead. Okay, good. Um, well, uh, just a couple things. I just want to really express uh, a lot of appreciation for all the work that Heather has been doing um, and her team um, in terms of community outreach, um, media presentation, and a variety of other things. Uh, it's just been noticeable in the last year um, that we have uh, increased our efforts in that regard, and um, it's, it's impressive. Um, uh, on on the uh, particularly on well the one thing I wanted to bring up particularly was the that um, we've been pursuing um, with t television ads and other things of that sort um, we're kind of like all over the place right now and I think it's it's terrific to see um, the one comment that I would have about that is um, although I think that uh, is terrific um, it tends to be um, uh, uh, it, it highlights the role of MCE within our communities, and that's, that's an important thing to do. But the other thing that's going on in the mass markets is PG&E, um, and their kind of relentless um, uh, advertising efforts to support uh, their presence in uh, in the public safety sphere. You know, encouraging you know people taking um, actions that will allow them to protect themselves and will actually allow pg e to protect itself uh, when we have public power shutoffs. So um, uh, just a, a just a thought, and I'd be happy to have this conversation with you a little bit more offline. Um, but to think more about being aggressive in um, counter marketing. Um, uh, well, not counter marketing, but uh, complementary marketing, I guess, to highlight um, MCE's role in uh, in facing uh, the challenges that we may um, uh, have to endure uh, with public power shutoffs and other actions that PG&E may take. 
And Kevin, I think this is a great idea, and, I, and I'm assuming that part of where you're coming from, you know, we as electeds get sort of endless emails from um, the uh, out outreach folks at yeah. PG&E, and, uh, you know, if, it might be very helpful for us to increase our outreach to electeds uh, in all of our service area and city managers in our service area so that we are balancing out that communication from what people may be hearing from PG&E and then they can share the information that we provide with their networks as well. That That's exactly my point and I appreciate you re reinforcing that because there's a lot of confusion that is introduced by PG&E's media outreach in terms of even who's providing power to our mm -hmm. customers um, and uh, what actions uh, MCE is taking in order to ensure the integrity of our power supply to our customers throughout our jurisdictions. Um, I think it, I think there's some counter messaging that could be helpful. And as I said, I'd be happy to have, to have a conversation offline on, on that. Great, thank you, Kevin. Any other comments or questions from directors or the public? No public. Okay. I, I right, was well, just, I was slow. Sorry. Excuse me. I was slow. Yeah, come on. Speed up there, Elizabeth. <laughs> Um, totally agree with uh, Kevin's request, and I'm wondering if we could actually have a working group of directors and former directors. Um, our counties are different, and our levels of expertise um, cover a broad spectrum, and the way people communicate, I believe, is quite different in different counties. So if we could do that, I would love to help get that started and work with with everybody as, for instance we have a, a newspaper for benicia that's several on 100 and some 10 years old and so it's on under trust and so it can't fold <laughs> and so so but they're desperate for news and they will print anything so <laughs> let's keep sending you know and and okay. and uh <laughs> so uh, that's just an example. I love the suggestion of getting information to city managers and finance directors, please. And uh, so in any case, the suggestion is having a, a working uh, task force that can further this. Great. Thank you, Elizabeth. And Heather, I think it was a terrific presentation and I really just wanted to note um, which I think many of us, of us have experienced is the increased opportunities for participation virtually with COVID-19. And so this pandemic actually has opened up a lot of new opportunities and I'm glad to see that you and your team have taken advantage of them. In some ways it's been a benefit. It's gotten us out of our old ruts of thinking of how do you communicate, right? Uh, and that's, that's a good thing. And I think that um, some of the ideas of the directors have had are gonna help push that forward. Uh, and adding on new ways to communicate. So it's it's all good. It's great. All right. Director Thier. Oh, I just wanted to echo uh, the chair's comments about the um, uh, great magnitude of communication uh, from PG&E. And um, I know that when I first came in as a town council member, um, I, I got, I received so many emails uh, and they continue. There's a lot of misinformation. I think the public does get confused. I think some of the ideas brought up today would be very, very helpful uh, in order to clarify uh, that. And uh, also, uh, there is an opportunity for more attendance uh, because of uh, the virtual nature of the meeting. So I just wanted to echo some of those comments. Great. Thank you. Anyone else? All right, seeing none. Ray, please, yeah. Oh, uh, sorry, I should have raised my hand. Um, no problem. Yeah, I just to sort of, sort of end, end this particular piece, I would just add the perspective um, that we have been too nice, too restrained <laughs> um, in countering PG's misinformation, and we need to take the gloves off. You know, Ray, you've been saying that for a while, and maybe we really need to start listening to you. <laughs> Th thank you, Ray. 
wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. Retiring Ray is asking us to take the gloves <laughs> off. He's no dope. <laughs> All righty, that's a good note to end on. Oh, Barbara, did she want to say something? No. Okay, I think we're good. I'd really like to get us onto the horizon. Um, so if we could move on to the next section, that would be terrific. Yeah, fabulous. Um, so we've, we've got some slides um, that uh, are going to be pulled up here in a moment. And I just wanted to, as we're transitioning now, I just wanted to acknowledge and appreciate all the great discussion that we're having because, you know, this is a board retreat. We do this once a year. And really the goal is to hear from the board and to take in all of your good suggestions, incorporate them into our planning for the upcoming year. Um, and so far, we've really been successful today getting a lot of really valuable feedback from all of you. So thanks for all the participation. Um, Sean Delessi, who's with um, Pacific Energy Advisors, uh, and I are going to spend just a little bit of time talking to you about reliability. And um, this is a good topic to introduce before lunch because it uh, gives you a lot to think about and chew on. Um, we may run out of time for um, a long discussion before lunch, um, but we can certainly continue the discussion um, in the afternoon uh, section where we have a little carryover uh, placeholder there if there's a need for additional discussion. Um, I think we'll be able to push item B here to after lunch. So um, with that, uh, I'm gonna jump in and uh, Anya, you can go to the next slide. Actually, I think it's Evelyn that's uh, clicking through the slides. Thank you, Evelyn. Um, so I wanted to spend just a couple of minutes on this topic by talking about what happened in August, uh, particularly on August 14th and 15th when there were rotating power outages around the state. We, we got a lot of questions about this uh, from board members and the public. Um, and we, we have a little data. Some of what I'm gonna present to you is information that's been um, collected from uh, the California Independent System Operator. Um, that's the grid manager for the state. We sometimes refer to them as CAISO or ISO. Um, and we've also um, collected some of this information from uh, CalCCA, the CCA Trade Association um, for the state. So um, just quickly, the extreme temperatures that uh, we were seeing in the middle of August were happening across the West. And it's unusual to have such a pervasive um, heat event that covers multiple states. Um, and that contributed to part of the, um, the impacts on the grid that we saw. Um, typically, uh, California is able to uh, buy and sell power from other states, um, but what we saw was very high demand across um, the West, and um, this combined with a couple of other factors I'll talk about led to the first supply-induced rotating outages that we've seen in California since 2001, so it really was a, um, a rare event, something we haven't seen in, a, in quite a while. Um, the supply shortage is really focused um, in the evening hours, um, and uh, it's no, no surprise there, the sun goes down. So, um, and as the sun is going down, um, CAISO has to prepare for that by uh, ramping up other supply sources um, before the sun has completely gone down. So between six and eight, that's where we um, saw the, the primary grid impacts. Um, CAISO called what is referred to as a stage three load shedding event. Um, this um, is a, an event that requires the investor-owned utilities um, uh, like PG&E, Southern California Edison, San Diego Gas and Electric to shed some of their load, um, which in effect means turning off power to some of the customers. Um, and that was because there, it was looking like there wasn't going to be enough supply for everyone to keep the grid balanced. Uh, after that, there were um, some close calls where CAISO um, went to stage two, um, and that occurred both on Monday the 17th, uh, the 18th, and the 19th. And I'm sure you all uh, got tired of hearing from me and probably many others encouraging uh, conservation on those days. It made a difference. Uh, so big kudos to all of you um, for your efforts, for spreading the word. Um, what you were doing, I think, was replicated um, with elected officials and, and folks across the state. 
um, it made a huge difference and it meant that we didn't have any other rotating outages um, after the, the Friday, Saturday events. So let's talk about why this happened. Go to the next slide, please. Um, and I guess a, a quick moment here on how unusual the event is. Um, the last stage one that we saw was in 2017. And, and what that means is that uh, conting contingency reserves are um, um, forecast to be needed. Um, the last stage two that we had was in 2006. Um, that was where CAISO had taken all the mitigating actions it could, meaning calling on generators to start supplying. Um, and th that was a close call back in 2006. Um, and then the, the last time we went, we had a stage three was in 2001, as I mentioned. And you all probably remember that time um, because there were rolling blackouts across the state. Um, and in that case, there was some market manipulation that was happening that seemed to lead to, to those events. Um, it was not a heat induced event. Next slide. Right. Um, so let's dissect this briefly. On Friday the 14th of August, um, we saw load really uh, very high because of the heat. Um, a lot of folks, uh, not all of us here in, in, uh, in the coastal climates, but a lot of folks have AC and, and they're running it, uh, uh, both in commercial and residential settings. And um, in the evening hours, uh, as we start to um, taper off on the solar supply, um, that's where we see the, um, the peak load um, hitting at the same time that our um, supply is starting to uh, shut down. And so what you can see here, if you look along the, the bottom axis here, um, we, these are hours in the day. It's uh, military time, uh, as you can see. So um, it's, it's at around um, between 6 and 8 p.m. that we ran into the event. And if we go to the next slide, we can see what was happening with our supply. Um, and what you can see here is the different resources that were in play during this time period. So our, our renewables, the green line, um, usually has sort of this hump shape during the day where it's, you know, it's um, helping a lot with the demand. Um, and because we have a lot of um, uh, rooftop solar residential installations, those really act as a um, negative load. Um, so what you see on the grid is, you know, if those weren't uh, there, um, our demand would have would be a lot higher on a regular basis. But you can see the renewables start to taper off there um, in the evening hours. Well, our natural gas, unfortunately, has to ramp up, and um, it has to be ramped up in advance. It takes a couple of hours for uh, many of our natural gas generators to um, get up and, and running. So they start turning them on um, there in the, in the mid-afternoon. Um, you can also see um, a little bit of impact there from imports. That's the, um, the dark red line. But you can see the imports really start to drop off towards the end of the day, and that's because there is so much um, heat across the state. Um, and let's go to the next slide. This is a... Um, a closer look at the renewables trend. And you can see that a lot of the resources, uh, the baseload resources, geothermal, biomass, biogas, are very steady, um, but it's the solar that has a pretty dramatic uh, shape there. And next slide. This is a very close up look at um, what happened with, I think the one that's interesting here is what happened with the wind. Um, the wind is the, the blue line there. And unfortunately, what, what we saw was um, two, a sort of a, a perfect storm of um, bad luck, where in addition to the high heat across the, the west, um, we had a, a bit of a monsoon effect happening in parts of the state, which was causing cloud cover, diminishing the um, output of solar. We also saw uh, a somewhat atypical reduction in the amount of wind being generated. So less solar, less wind, high heat, high demand um, is, is what led to the kind of this perfect storm. Um, next slide. 
And then on Saturday the 15th. Don, um, just, just real quick on your, your yeah. note, it's Kevin, I'm sorry. Sure. Um, your note, renewables are not at fault. And this kind of go back goes back to the previous conversation we had about media outreach. Um, there's been so much in the national and to some extent regional media that suggested that um, California's reliance on renewables was at fault um, and during this episode, and that's just false. And I think it's important for us to keep that in mind in terms of our media outreach. Absolutely. Because yeah. I think we got that's that in that. Why we've got it here. I think you're absolutely right. And, and yeah. it's also important for us environmentalists to continue to recognize that the two rock solid straight flat lines of supply are geothermal and nuclear. Yeah, that's an accurate observation. Um, and this next slide is really the last uh, of our deep dive here, just looking at what happened with the renewables on Saturday. The wind really picked up um, a little earlier um, that evening and um, it was determined that right really moments after the stage three was called, um, the wind picked up. Um, but at that point, um, some customers had already been turned off. So it took, took a little time to get them back online. But um, it just gives you a sense of how close things can be. And this, yeah, the, go ahead to the next slide, um, Evelyn. This, this one's a little bit scary. Um, the, the cost of energy during these evening hours can go up really high. And just to give you a sense of it, when, you know, when we're buying um, energy on a, on a regular day, it might, might be $40 a megawatt hour um, or somewhere thereabouts. Um, but in the evening hours on, on hot days, it can really shoot up. And we did see the the cost of energy go up to a thousand dollars a megawatt hour. So um, you can lose a couple million in a, in a day or more if you're not well hedged. Um, thankfully, we, we have continued to be pretty well hedged and um, we've made it, made it through um, these sorts of days uh, for years uh, now. Um, but that just gives you a sense of how the volatility can impact the markets. Next slide. Um, so just taking a step back now away from what happened in August to, you know, what are our everyday reliability challenges? And, um, you know, when we say reliability, I want to emphasize that, you know, MCE is, we're required to purchase resource adequacy, um, which we also refer to as RA uh, or capacity. Um, to, to provide reliability for the state. And this is a, as a result of the, um, the power outages we saw back in 2001. Um, CAISO requires every load serving entity, including MCE, to have a, an extra 15% of power supply for our load available. Now we have, to, we have to pay for it, we have to get it under contract, but we don't control when it gets used. Uh, once we pay for it and get it under contract, it, the, the reins get handed over to CAISO and CAISO decides if and when they're going to use these resources. And we actually don't even have visibility to whether they're being used or not. So they're separate from what we include in our portfolio of resources. But because we get to choose where that supply comes from, we are looking for um, ways to transition away from fossil resources to the extent that we can. Um, and that's a, that's a challenge, that's hard to do because intermittent resources like wind and solar have a, a low RA value compared to our baseload resources like geothermal and natural gas because those intermittent resources aren't available all the time. So they have a lower value. You have to have more of them to create the value you need. Um, and the, the last point here is just, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis with our reliability purchases, the CPUC is calling for RA resources like natural gas um, to help um, integrate or help balance out the production of renewable energy that we have on our system. So um, we, as you, as you may know, we just um, uh, updated our integrated resource plan and the, the CPUC compliance plan really had some requirements that we include uh, a good share of natural gas in our planning 
for reliability um, to balance out the renewables in our portfolio. Um, Tom, did you have a question on this? Um, yeah, in, 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 in this discussion of all the sources, you know, we even talked about nuclear, but I didn't see any, I didn't see any discussion of large, large hydro. And uh, I, I really haven't seen much discussion of it in the media coverage of this, but it seems to me like that large hydro uh, is a source that that has a lot. It, ha it has a lot of a lot of power, and it's also flexible. I mean, they can decide, you know, when they want to let the water out of those dams. And yeah, that's maybe maybe you could comment on that briefly. Yeah, that's a great point. And Evelyn, if you can go back a few slides, um, we did have hydroelectric showing up. Uh, go back. Yeah. Okay. So we've got small hydro showing up there. Um, the large hydro, I don't see that showing up. But I think that you are correct that, um, that hydro can be a, um, a helpful resource for reliability, but it's not as um, helpful as I initially thought, you know, the more I learned about it. Um, a lot of the, um, there are a lot of environmental regulations that um, are tied to um, uh, environmental impacts, um, fish, fish spawning and um, that sort of thing that have some, that create some limitations for when water is released, um, what times of the year it's released. We tend to see more hydro availability in the springtime and it tends to diminish by the fall, um, at least in California as the snowpack has melted out. So I think if we were looking at a chart from earlier in the year, um, that would have played a much bigger factor. Um, but you're absolutely right that that's a, a really valuable and important resource to, and to, part of our to, to Tom's point, uh, one one slide prior to that one, or even two, has the large small hydro. One more, you had. I thought you had hydro yep. large hydro there, mm -hmm. and it yeah. does hum. It does. It does vary. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's a good point. So I, I just think, this is Elizabeth, I just think that there's a, a huge problem in dealing with hydro because you have, as Don was saying, there are all these other factors, variables. So there's private and public hydro. There, are, uh, as water contracting, water futures becomes more and more part of the water marketing, you're gonna see um, much more difficulty in utilizing hydro to drive energy during um, necessary energy uh, supply issues. Um, not to mention the fact that there are also environmental impacts with when you release a lot of water at the wrong time of the year, it tends to wipe out a lot of the environmental attributes that you're trying to maintain in a stream system. So ju just be cautious about projecting large hydro or small hydro. Yeah, thank you. And Evelyn, if you can cue us back up to where we were before, I wanna um, turn it over to John DeLessi to talk about how we're handling our everyday challenges with RA. So John, over to you. All right, fantastic. Is my audio okay? Yeah, we can hear you and see you just fine. Okay. Well, um, I'm going to, I guess, um, continue on a little bit in the same vein, but and try and uh, you know, focus a little bit more of you know, where we where we go um, with respect to some of these challenges. And um, you know, so this concept of renewable integration is really, um, it's, I think, the terminology is a little narrow, but I do think this is. Uh, probably the the most important challenge that we do face, and and the way I see it is, how do we um, how do we move to a, a, a low or zero carbon uh, electric sector, uh, and do that while maintaining reliability and also cost effectiveness, right? I mean that's that's the big challenge. So what, what I want to go over is just um, a few few charts here that illustrate the the challenge, um, and then we can talk about potential solutions and what MCE is, is, is thinking about here. So um, starting off here, this is a uh, representation of a, of a 
kind of a summer day, very similar to the the, um, the curves that that Dawn just went over. Um, and so I've got two two uh, two visuals here. On on the left, we have the demand, uh, the daily, the hourly demand for a for a summer day. And the real important um, metric here, the real important figures, is, is the net demand, and that's that purplish curve. And what that is, it's it's the the total total hourly demand less the uh, solar and wind resources. So this is really sort of you know what's left over to serve with non-solar and wind resources. And so that net peak is really showing up there in those critical hours, right, that we had the blackouts in. So it's sort of that you know, 6 p.m. to maybe 9 p.m. range. That's really the, the, the new peak period that, that we need to focus on. And then if you look at, okay, what resources are we in? And when I say we, this is, this is CAISO. This is the state, not MCE in particular. Um, so what resources... Uh, is California relying on to serve that net peak? Well, in summer, it's mostly natural gas, right? That's that top line. You see it you know, ramping up until we, it, it covers the peak. We do get some contribution from the large hydro um, during the summer, but you know, a lot of that stuff, a lot of the hydro is, is, is more a spring runoff. And so you know, as we get later in the year, there's just less available. Um, and then we also do get some, um, some support through imports, right? So I think that's the, the red curve there that sort of dips during the day and then starts to pick up. So those are the pr primary in the summertime. I'd say it's primarily natural gas um, and then also the, um, the secondarily the imports in the large hydro. So if we go to the next slide, now this is a look at a sort of a typical spring day. It's a very different situation. Springtime, we have you know, low loads, you know, no, no air conditioning to speak of. We have abundant supply, typically sunny. We get a lot of solar. There's a lot of hydro available. Um, so you know, that, that, that net load, you can see it really dips down during the day. But then, man, there's a real steep ramp there in the evening. You can see that there's, um, we need to rely on about 13,000 megawatts of resources that can go from sort of, you know, zero to 60 in a relatively short amount of time. So the real challenge in, in spring is that, you know, having flexible resources to, to pick up when the, when the sun comes down. You can see on the supply chart there to the right, um, you know, that big during the day, you've got the renewables coming in heavy. In fact, they're being curtailed. You can kind of see in the middle of the day, there's the dip in the renewable supply. That's because prices were so low, uh, potentially even negative, that the renewable uh, generators actually cut their production. Um, but then when we get into the evening, then in the springtime, what's picking up prim primarily are imports. Um, so, you know, the, the order here is, is, has changed a little bit, whereas in summer, it's, it's, we're really leaning heavily on natural gas. In the spring, we're, we're leaning heavily on imports to kind of pick up that, that ramp, that, that late evening peak. Good news is most of those imports during the spring are hydro, large hydro. Um, but, you know, there are issues, uh, there are issues with being reliant on imports. Can go to the next slide, please. So what are the challenges? Well, most of the new generation capacity that's that's being built, that's been built in the last few years and that's being built going forward is solar and wind. Um, so these are non-dispatchable. They don't really help with that evening peak. Um, we're really quite reliant on fossil fuel generators, on natural gas to, uh, to meet the reliability challenges, which of course we're, we're in a time here where we're trying to diminish our reliance on natural gas. Um, the policymakers are increasingly concerned about the reliability of imports. Traditionally, California has relied heavily on um, power coming in from our, from our neighbors. And you know, as supply mar margins tighten up, 
and as um, our neighboring states, you know, they, they start to implement their own renewable and carbon-free programs, um, there is concern, and, and frankly, and there's just less control as well. The CAISO doesn't have as much direct control over imports, so there is um, more concern about, about our reliance on imports and, and what the implications are for reliability. Um, so what's needed here are clean, flexible resources, right, to, um, to reliably integrate the renewables as we move to a carbon-free supply. So the question is, all right, what, what are those resources? And we'll kind of get to that uh, after a slight detour to, um, to, some of, to, the, to the existing reliability program that's in place. We'll go to the next slide, please. Here's our, our slight detour, and, and this is just really a, a level set that you know, the um, our reliability obligations uh, are really defined by the resource adequacy program, and um, this is a sort of a, a trifecta of agencies here that are involved in the in the resource adequacy program. There's the CPUC, the, the CAISO, right, the grid operator, and then also the California Energy Commission is, is involved in it as well, um, primarily on the demand forecasting side. But through this program, MCE and PG&E and all other load serving entities you know, have certain reliability obligations. And um, you know, in, a, in a nutshell, uh, we need to have uh, contracts with generating capacity that's equivalent to our, our projected monthly peak demand, so the, the highest you know, hourly demand in, in each month, plus a 15% reserve margin. So the, the idea is to ensure through this program that there's, there is enough physical generating capacity to um, ensure adequate supply. There are also sub-requirements of uh, for in, under the resource adequacy program. So a certain percentage of the capacity needs to be in lo geographic, local uh, reliability areas. And a certain percentage of the generating capacity has to be flexible. And there are certain defined attributes of what that means, but it basically means it can be controlled up and down um, to help with those ramping requirements. And then as, as Don mentioned, you know, RA contracts, they, it's, it's purely a reliability uh, construct. The, RA, the resource actually contracts do not convey any energy to the buyer. Um, what they do is it, it, they, they create an obligation to the seller to make themselves available to the CAISO um, for dispatch as needed. So it's really a reliability program our resource adequacy does not impact MCE's power content label. It doesn't impact the um, greenhouse gas emissions metrics. Um, it, it's a separate requirement from MCE's energy supply. Doesn't mean it's not important, but it, it's just a different, it's kind of a different animal. Go to the next one, please. This is Kevin, before we uh, move off of this slide. Just on the on the last bullet item, I, I think that's probably not at a point that all of us really did, because we do incur significant uh, financial obligations to create um, those RA resources, but we have no control over them. And I think that was certainly part of my frustration as we went through the most recent round of, of um, temporary uh, shutoffs. We've spent money to assure uh, uh, reliability resources, but they, you know, we have no control over uh, how they're dispatched. And that may, that's, a, that's kind of a policy issue. I don't think that's something that's today, but I think it's something that we may need to, uh, uh, we, may, may, we may want to have a further conversation about. Yeah, that's, that's a great point. And um, some, it kind of leads me down a path here because some of our resources do provide RA, right? So um, 
you know, some of our renewable contracts or the long-term power purchase agreements that we have with maybe a solar or a wind facility, we get energy and we also get RA. Um, so it is possible to you know, have the sort of the full bundle of both capacity and energy under our control. The problem is that um, since the problem is that solar and wind provides very little resource adequacy value, um, which I'll, I'll, I'll show you some more specifics on that. So as a result of that, we need to go out and, and buy resource adequacy, you know, through these RA only contracts. And those are the, those are the contracts where we really have no control. Like you said, you know, there, these, these, uh, resources are made available to the system, but they're, um, you know, disconnected from, from MCEs energy operations and load serving. You know, and then we get calls from customers saying what, what the heck is going on when we've already spent a lot of money to procure those, uh, those uh, uh, reliance um, uh, resources. Right, that's another control. source of frustration is that the, you know, the protocols for, for the rolling blackouts, there's no reference to whether or not MCE was fully resourced. Um, you know, it's, it's done, it's done by the, the utilities based yeah. on, you know, kind of dropping load, um, uh, around the system. And, and so that's a little frustrating too, because, you know, MCs right. met all their obligations and yet our customers are, are still getting, getting, um, blacked out. Right. When right. Short. So that, 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 again, that's a conversation that goes beyond what we're doing here today, but I think it's a conversation that's, that's worth having at a policy level. Okay, if we can move to the next slide, please. Because this just illustrates then I, I mentioned that there are these sub requirements. So um, on a percentage basis, um, about 45% of our resource adequacy capacity needs to be in these geographic areas. So there's the Bay Area, um, I think 18%, and then there are numerous other areas. Um, so even though we don't serve any load in Fresno, a certain 9% of our resource adequacy capacity has to be in the Fresno area and so on and so on. So there's a variety of local um, areas that the CAISO has determined you know, require a certain amount of physical capacity for reliability, we need to carry a share of that just like any other load serving entity. It really doesn't relate to where our load actually um, you know, is located. And then on the, um, on the right side here is the breakout between flexible and just generic or you know, non-flexible. And so about 28% of our resource actually capacity has to, um, has to be flexible. And again, that's to help with the, with the ramping and the, and the integration as defined by CAISO. Oh, uh, note here, which is important. So the local obligation, which is that you know forty five percent of our overall requirement, that will be um, sort of going away. It'll be being taken on by a central procurement entity starting in twenty twenty three. Um, so you know. We won't need to, MCE won't need to uh, procure local RA anymore at that point. Uh, uh, MCE will still need to procure system resource adequacy. Go to the next one, please. Okay, so this um, shows, you know, the different, how the different types of generating technology how they contribute to resource adequacy. And so each generator is more or less assigned a rating, a reliability rating, it's called net qualifying capacity. So this is the, uh, the amount of megawatts that the generator is good for uh, to meet, to meet a, a resource adequacy obligation. And so for solar and wind, you know, those, those bars there, they're only rated at about 14 or 15 percent. So what that means is, if you have a hundred megawatt solar resource, it's only rated for about 14 megawatts of resource adequacy. 
And that's why um, it's, it's really not feasible to you know, meet MC's entire RA obligation with renewables. We would just have to have so many multiples of our load um, in order to, to meet those requirements. And we also wouldn't be able to meet our flexible um, requirements. So, um, you know, the other thing to know is that the most cost effective renewable resources are solar and wind, right? These other uh, types of resources, biomass and geothermal uh, in particular, even though they have, they have high reliability ratings, they're quite expensive relative to solar and wind. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, this is this is the dilemma, uh, more or less, is that you know from a from a cost perspective, you really are, are looking at solar and wind, but then you're not doing a lot for reliability. So you know what what can we do? Well, one of the things that we're doing and planning to do in in a pretty big way over the next ten years is storage. And so um, as recently, I think. MC's first hybrid contract, which is a combination of solar and storage, uh, was, was approved. That'll be the first of probably many over the next several years. And um, so bringing in storage can, along with, with solar in particular, is a really good way and a cost-effective way to get renewable energy and also get that reliability contribution. We can go to the next slide, please. Here's an illustration of sort of the trajectory anticipated over time, and this comes from MCE's integrated resource plan. Um, so we expect that uh, over the next 10 years, the MCE will be adding storage to displace about half of uh, the resource adequacy that's currently provided by fossil resources. Um, the expectation is that the technology will improve over time. And so you know, we're not going all in on storage, you know, it, it, this year, the, the idea is to, to build this out gradually and take advantage of declining costs and improving technologies. Um, and the types of storage we're, we're likely to see would be uh, hybrid type configurations, similar to the, to the recent contract, which was a, a PV and a lithium ion, four hour lithium ion battery combination. Um, we all, may also uh, see just standalone storage projects, grid connected as an as a, uh, alternative to RA contracts with fossil units. And um, we're also looking hard at long duration storage. So most storage, the, the most common storage technology right now is just lithium ion batteries. And um, those usually are, are either two or four hour duration uh, capable. And so long duration is eight hours or longer. And so there are different technologies that potentially come into play there um, that MC is, is looking at and, and is expecting to, to utilize um, going forward. And then, you know, there's still, at least in, in my opinion, a, a need or a, a role for uh, fossil resources. I think the goal would be to minimize the time that they actually run but and, and keep them available as backup. Um, you know, I think with the uh, recent events in 2020, it sort of opened my eyes a little bit to you know what could go wrong, right? Things that uh, it's a good reminder that the unexpected could happen. So it may not be a bad idea to um, to retain some fossil resources as a, as backup, um, but try not to run them, uh, just you know, minimize the, the actual burning of fossil fuels by replacing uh, the dispatch with, with battery storage and other storage technologies. But maybe a good idea to, to, to at least keep those around, keep those resources around. We can go to the, so the, that's really the, the end of the presentation. And I don't know if there is time for discussion now or if it's better to, to pick it up after lunch. Um, but um, you know, a couple of things that we're focused on, like I said, storage in a big way and also load shifting. It's not something I mentioned, um, but 
the customer programs, particularly the resiliency programs, um, are really focused on trying to to shift load out of those those super peak hours, so we can sort of address the problem from the supply side, and we can also address the problem from the demand side. Um, and, and I think both of those will be needed to to really, really you know legitimately transition to a to a lower zero carbon uh, resource mix. So maybe we could take five minutes now to start the discussion if there are board members that have comments or questions and then uh, continue the discussion later if, if there's an interest in doing so. Does that make sense to you, Dawn and John? Sounds perfect. Great, okay, Ford, you have your hand up. You're just stretching. Uh, no, I'm not stretching. I do have my hand up, thank you. Uh, so this is a, a pretty illuminating um, presentation in a in a challenging and scary kind of way. My takeaway from it uh, is that when we get to the months really of August through October, uh, there are unprecedented uh, challenges and, and threats that uh, you know start with way high temperatures and and concomitant way high loads on the system uh, and then just kind of throwing in you know fire risk as a as a sweetener on top of it uh, with uh, the risks and potentials for for power shutoffs um, and it, it really seems to uh, the resource adequacy requirements push us into a position whereby we have very little choice but to rely more on carbon-based power uh, because uh, solar uh, doesn't, doesn't suit uh, when the, the load goes on and uh, wind is, is not reliable. Uh, so John's point about uh, how to deal with it is primarily, um, or, or one of the ways is, is by load shifting. Uh, that makes a lot of sense. Although uh, being able to get people when they come home to turn off their air conditioners, that's uh, gonna be, present a, a really big uh, compliance problem. So I, it's just uh, to, to see the graphs and be able to better imagine really what it is that we're having to face is, is really valuable. And then uh, on top of that, uh, under the, the resource adequacy rules where we have to pay for uh, the power, uh, but don't get to control its availability and are at the mercy of PG&E's shutoffs uh, and uh, puts us just in a very vulnerable and in a very delicate uh, kind of position. And that comes back around to a, a theme that's been hit on a number of times today, which is the whole, uh, uh, you know, media presence, or on, on the other hand, to call it out more blatantly, um, dealing with, uh, with PG&E, not load shifting, but blame shifting, and, and propaganda. Uh, so that in, I, those, those really are, don't, my comments don't involve any answers, but they certainly do uh, express an appreciation of having a pretty clear picture of how difficult um, our position is, and that's always a, a good place to start. Yeah, I would like to respond to that for because I, I think these are the um, this is the type of conversation that I'm really glad that we're having it, it you know, at, at the retreat level, you know, what, 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 are, what are we grappling with and how can we solve it and I, I've kind of um, my shifting has, uh, my thinking has shifted a bit um, in the last year as well to where, you know, I think initially we were trying to resist getting fossil energy under contract through, through our RA obligations. Um, and I think be, because, you know, the things that you listed, there are many things that are outside of our control. 
one thing that we can control to some degree is how our load behaves. And that's why mm -hmm. we've really put a lot of time and energy and resources this year into our resiliency programs and our customer programs to really, and even our electric vehicle programs, to really shift load to the middle of the day when all of our solar resources are generating. If we can do that, the natural gas that we're having to pay for is maybe just sitting in the garage, you know, as much as right. possible in the case of an emergency, in the case that we can't shift our load as much as we want. And, you know, it's going to take time for us to transition to where our load really matches our generation shape. But ideally, if we can, we can work towards and strive towards making our load shape match our generation shape, which peaks in the middle of the day and diminishes in the evening, then we will have solved our part of the problem through things we can control. And that reliability that we're required to purchase and get onto the grid can be used for emergencies or for folks that haven't quite aligned their load and gen shape. And it's gonna take us a while to get there, but I think it's the right objective for us to have because it does align with you know, what we can control. Um, and the battery program that Jamie Tucky was talking about is really designed to um, you know, suck up that energy with batteries in the middle of the day and then deploy that energy back onto the grid in the evening. Um, and we're, you know, Vic and our COO has been helping spearhead um, a program that will be a next layer of that where we're also getting our, um, our water heaters into that system. And we're, you know, um, I, and ideally we'll have AC kick on to pre-cool houses in the middle of the day and then taper off in the, in the evening hours. So we can control our load a lot more than we can control CAISO's rules and the CPUC's rules. Um, so I think shifting our focus a little bit in that direction could really pay off in the future. Well, and adding on to that, John, you know, I mean, I, we played such an instrumental role in really pushing and, sh and shaping the market for renewable energy and developing the CCA program. And I think it's, uh, you know, we need to play as we're starting to an important role in, in pushing forward the battery storage market, um, which is developing and, and hopefully will develop much more quickly given the recognition of the need because of these power shutoffs. So um, I, I'm glad that we're taking the steps that we are with respect to battery storage, but I think that's something we need to really keep pushing forward uh, and figuring out how we can help even more to, to develop that market. And in, in, in the yeah. um, uh, it's just, it's, uh, Don's comments really bring forward how important our relationship with our customers is because that's the only way, well, not the only way, but that's a, a big way that uh, aside from battery storage that we can, sh we can do that load shifting is by getting the cooperation of our customer base. And uh, our customer base, I think, because of the nature of the product that we provide is more sensitive to these issues and perhaps more availability more available for reasonable persuasion. I agree with that, Ford, and I think that's another one of the, the benefits that we've seen through Heather's presentation of yes. this COVID-19 period is that we've actually gotten old fashioned and we're reaching out and talking to customers on the phone and uh, developing those relationships. And I think, you know, really focusing on some of our larger cu customers and again, with pushing forward both behavior shift and also the battery storage, um, there's opportunities there. So I think that piece of it is very, very important and getting rid of, getting away from this idea that if we just do public events and we put out press releases that somehow people yep. pay attention. So I, I think a lot of how we've changed our behaviors um, mm -hmm. over this COVID period is, is a plus and will, right. will continue to be a plus. Thank you for letting me take up so much time. Well, yeah, about to shut you down. <laughs> and uh, and uh, is there any other, because, you know, I get hungry and then I get cranky. And um, Director uh, Patterson. Uh, Director Patterson. Yeah. I'll, I'll try to be brief. <laughs> <laughs> You've been warned. <laughs> um, so def I th the advantages of uh, uh, understanding the control of the load and the individual responsibilities is that I think people connect more with our our sources. But I also want to ask is what is the future uh, looking like for the diurnal uh, tidal 
turbines, which are being implemented in places like Scotland. And we have we had a study done for Carquina Strait, and uh, the differential at the time wasn't good enough. But he said in five years, and that was about five years ago, mm -hmm. that we should be caught up. But in the meanwhile, we have other places for that. So, I, so that's a question I have. Is that a future thing that we can look at? And then also I want to know, because I, I just don't know this stuff very well, is that on hydrogen uh, generation and batteries, wh where, where are we with that? Yeah, I'm, I'm so glad you asked about that. Um, you know, those are, those are new technologies and um, they certainly have a lot of promise. I know that um, up in Humboldt, they're testing they're considering some offshore offshore wind pilots. Uh, Monterey Bay also is looking at, at something like that. I think Tidal um, is another uh, opportunity. And uh, after lunch, we're going to have a presentation on uh, green, uh, renewably produced hydrogen, um, which is a fuel that you can store just like natural gas and use it when you need it. Um, there are challenges with all of these technologies. Um, but they, some of them are gonna probably be the winners and we're interested in piloting some of these technologies you know, on a small scale. Um, and if they prove to, to uh, work on a small scale, then we could scale them up. I, I think we're, we're all aware that you know, batteries aren't um, risk-free. You know, they've, they've got some elements to them that aren't great for the environment. So I don't think we wanna go crazy and you know, put our, all our eggs in that basket. I think right now it's necessary for us to, to um, engage uh, with, with some of that resource, um, but we're looking at other opportunities. And we're also partnering with other CCAs through a joint um, procurement effort and a uh, putting together a procurement JPA, a super JPA that will allow for us to uh, potentially contract for some newer technology where we're spreading the risk among multiple agencies. So that could help us with, with your suggestion. That's great. Great. Anyone else in our uh, flexible five minute opening discussion? I'm not seeing seeing anyone right now, but I think you know this is a really important discussion, and if people would like to continue it later this afternoon or at a point in the future, I definitely think we want to do that. So let's talk about our schedule, um, and I want to take the the board's temperature. Often in years past, we've put an hour break for lunch on the agenda, and we've shortened that up. Um, to 45 minutes or so. What's everybody's feeling about how long a break you would like at this point? Shorter is okay. 40 minutes should be sufficient, I think. 40 minutes you think is okay? Yeah. Let's, yeah. let's, let's resume at 1.30, huh? I think that'd be fantastic. If, if, if the board yeah. and staff can handle that, great. let's do it. That would be great. And, uh, and so then just so state of play, I'd like to start off in the afternoon with our second round Robin of board member introductions and then come back into part B of this section that was <laughs> skipped, if that makes sense to you, Dawn. Yeah, what we may do actually is um, take up our hydrogen item, item 10, um, ah. and then push the, um, the part B to carry over items 11. Oh, okay. That gonna, makes sense too. That's we're great. We're going to lose Supervisor Joya at 2.30. Let's not now do that. Sure. We don't want to lose Supervisor Joya. So. Yeah. Okay. Good. Okay. All right. Perfect. We'll see everybody back at 1.30. Thank 130. you so much. Great. Thank, Thank you. Thank you all. And Daniel, are you um, prepared to queue up for 45 minutes? It is queued for 45 minutes. It'll be Thank 40 you. minutes, actually. And for, 40 minutes. 40. I will adjust it really quickly, so it's going to pause for a quick moment before I okay. shake. <laughs> okay, that's fine. Thank you, Anya. <laughs> Thank you. Welcome back, everyone, or at least most of everyone. I'm hoping people are back. <clears throat> We're getting there. Yeah, no, I'm just kind of taking a pause. <clears throat> so, Darlene, we do want to get into the second round of our board member introductions. And oh. before we start that with the board, I wondered if my colleague Katie Rice is on the Zoom or not. I know she was going to try to get on. So, uh, Katie, I would like to include you in this round of 
introductions. Katie Rice is my alternate for MCE. And uh, we can always put her at the end after the board meetings, but I'm glad you're here, Katie. All right, Darlene, do you want to jump in? Absolutely. I'm close. Give me just a sec here. Increase my microphone. Are you guys able to hear me well? Yes. Yeah, yeah, I can hear you. All right. So Where's remember everybody way? its name and where you're from and why you're why you're here. And I thought this morning was terrific and I, I know this round will be too. All right. So Katie, are you on the line? I am. Here I oh, am. Great. All right. Why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself while I get my act together over here? <laughs> you don't. Uh, hi everyone, Katie Rice. And yes, I'm Kate's alternate to MC and have been and I poke my head in quietly over the last couple of years, off and on to try to keep up with what all that MC is doing and all you are doing. And every time I do, I am so impressed, not just with the quality of the work that's coming out of your staff, but the quality of the dialogue of this board. It's always super impressive. And I was listening this morning as well to the sort of second half of the morning and Again, just really impressive and um, glad to be part of this as an alternate. Great. Thank you, Katie. Okay. Um, let's see, who do we have? Oakley. Hi, I'm Sue Higgins. I'm Vice Mayor of Oakley. And I was trying to remember what year MCE came knocking on our door to ask us to join. And let me tell you what, when I said yes to my council, they said, Sue, then you're on the board because you're pushing for it and you're gonna be our voice piece. And I said, I'm happy to do it. I wanna say thank you to everybody at MCE who works for us and with us and all our partners and all our board members. I can't tell you a greater board to be a part of. My outstanding memory of MC for the rest of my life will be going to the Mojave Desert and seeing <laughs> our wind farm and everybody knows my struggles there and it was a once in a lifetime experience that i'll never forget and i can't wait for covid to get over this is a great group to work with and i'm proud to be a part of it great thank you sue we're glad to have you richmond thank you um Oh, I attended a, um, a local government commission meeting in uh, Yosemite in the spring of 2010. And uh, one of the presenters was Charles McGlashan. And he talked about, uh, uh, about the process they were going through to form uh, what's now MCE. And uh, I was very excited about it. And I asked him if he would come over and, and do a presentation to our city council. And he said he would, but it turns out he was a very busy person and it took me about a year to get him to come over. So uh, he came over in the uh, spring of 2011 and uh, made a presentation and people were very excited about it. Unfortun unfortunately, he had a heart attack and died a week later. But, um, but enthusiasm remained high. And uh, in 2012, uh, we actually uh, joined MCE. We became the, the first city outside of Marin to do so. And in 2013, we went online. And uh, the rest is history. So thank you, Charles McGlashan. Great, thank you, Tom. Um, Ross. Yes, hi everyone, uh, I'm Bill Kircher. Uh, I am a town council member in the town of Ross in, in Marin County. I'm a, a new council member just elected in the election in March and started serving in uh, May. Um, and I, uh, one of the reasons that I, I am, I am Ross's representative is that I do have a very long-standing interest in and commitment to 
environmental protection and conservation. That goes back almost 50 years, actually. And uh, this has been a little bit of a trip down memory lane, starting with seeing Mike McGuire uh, today and, uh, and hearing him talk, because he reminded me of a senator that I worked for, Arlen Gregorio. Uh, when I first started out after graduating from uh, law school. Arlen represented San Mateo County, a county not unlike Moran. And he was a very strong advocate of environmental protection. And one of his priorities and our priorities was moving away from fossil fuels. Of course, it's a little depressing that that was 48 years ago, but um, progress has been made. And MCE is, is I think, a trailblazer and, and so is Mike McGuire. So. Uh, I'm really excited to be a, a, a part of this now. Um, I would add that this morning I had to drop off a couple of times to meet with a roofer because the roofer was inspecting our roof to get ready for a solar installation, including a battery backup. And uh, so uh, <laughs> on an individual level too, I'm happy to be, be trying to do a little load shifting here. Great, thank you so much, Bill. Um, if you dropped off and we did not know it, that's a very good reason for dropping off. So thank you for sharing that with us. Sure. San Anselmo. Ford's not back, okay. San Rafael, city of yeah, San hi. hi, this is Andrew McCullough. I'm a council member in San Rafael. And I was puzzling this morning as people were talking about uh, their joining the board, why and what sustained them. I was puzzling over the origins of my joining the board, which are perhaps a little bit different. I served alongside Damon Connolly as a fellow city council member, and then he, uh, uh, when he left the council to go on to the Board of Supervisors here in Marin County, <clears throat> someone had to be appointed to take his place on the board. And it was big shoes to fill. And the only person who was actually able to fill those shoes was Kate Sears as his successor as board chair. Uh, so, but he recommended that I join the board in part because since I was a very much a self-professed moderate and uh, while by no means a climate skeptic or a climate denier, I had not drunk the Kool-Aid by any stretch of the imagination. And I think he felt that while I might be able to contribute in some part, I might also gain an education. And over the last eight years or six years, I have certainly done that. So uh, it's, been, um, it's been terrific to serve on the board. I am one of the coterie of people who will be leaving in November because I'm not running for re-election. And one of the things I will miss is my service on this board uh, and what I've learned today. Um, perhaps the best illustration or best example of my coming around gradually is that I, like Bill, am putting solar panels on my roof and a battery in my garage. So uh, I will do my best uh, for the climate uh, and the environment as well. Thanks. Thank you, Andrew. It's been a pleasure. Um, Sam, yeah, I'm Ramon. back, Darlene. Okay, I've got you. I saw you. I'll get back to you. San Ramon. <clears throat> Hi, I'm Scott Perkins, um, and I'm I am running for re-election. So, <laughs> should I win, I'll be back. Um, otherwise, you know, you're going to have a pretty big turnover on the board. Um, Don Tatson came and made the presentations. Don was a very credible person. He had been, um, you know, on the Lafayette Council for decades. And he was really credible in Contra Costa County. And so when Don said, this is a good thing to do, um, I started to push it at my own council. And, and of course the winning argument is choice, uh, giving people mm -hmm. choice in their um, power provider. And when the council eventually um, approved this and we joined along with uh, most of the rest of Contra Costa County, uh, I volunteered to be on the board. I'm an engineer. I work at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. Uh, though I'm a mechanical engineer and electrons frighten me, um, I do have a long-standing interest in clean energy 
and how we can promote that going forward. Um, so my, I will continue to participate so long as I'm elected. And should I not get reelected, I'll still be a proponent. This has been a wonderful experience for me. Thank you. Thanks, Scott. It's good to have you. Um, Sausalito. Yeah, hi. Um, I'm Ray Withy. Uh, I've been on the board for about eight years. Um, and, uh, you know, as, uh, as many of you know, and you can probably tell from my accent, um, I grew up in the UK. And uh, um, I'm I, I, in my sort of in my teenage years and um, during my student days um, uh, became quite interested in how things were being run in the UK and what you may not know or some of you may remember who have sort of reached my age is that the after the second world war the UK decided to nationalize a whole bunch of their industries the electrical industry, the car industry, the shipbuilding industry, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It was a disaster. It was a complete and utter disaster. And the reason was is the politicians and their representatives who were running those industries were not focusing on the financial uh, aspects uh, and truly building the industries. They were just giving away stuff, basically. So you can imagine then, after spending 30 years coming to this country, spending 30 years in the private sector, when I joined, even though I was certainly um, very passionate about the need for renewable energy and the whole greening of our um, electrical uh, uh, grid in particular, I did come very at the very beginning to this board with a healthy skepticism that politicians should not be involved <laughs> and running things um, for the very, because of my background, because of my sort of um, somewhat stilted experience. It took me a very short time to realize that that was not the case. And, you know, you're going to hear from me a bit later on when I introduce Garth that, uh, you know, it is an unbelievably talented staff that we have here and an unbelievably talented board that has just excelled and led the way in the whole of the state of California um, in this CCA movement. And uh, it's, I'm now like an avid uh, supporter. Now, unfortunately, I'm also one, as has been alluded to several times, who is not seeking re-election. So um, there's definitely going to be a, a, big, a big turnover on the board. Um, uh, I hope uh, one of my real pleasures has been, uh, and as Kate Sears said, one of the great um, committees that we have is the technical committee, which I've been a member almost since the beginning that I joined. Um, I will be trying to come as a member of the public and listening in because um, that committee does work, good work. This board does good work. And then the final thing I'd like to say was, um, as you see during roll call, I currently represent also the city of Mill Valley. And it's been an unbelievable honor to have had uh, Mill Valley to ask me to represent them. So, um, so anyway, I'm going to be sad um, to leave, but... Uh, I will contribute as best I can up until that time and in the time ahead. So thank you. Thank you, Ray. We appreciate you. Walnut Creek. Did Justin not return? Okay. Let's go back up the list uh, to Director Kohler. Hi, thank you for including me. I, there were some technological problems this morning. Um, I've had the honor to be on this board since 2013-2014, so I've gotten to see the organization grow and grow to, I think we'll be 36 board members soon, and used to be just Marin people sitting around the table. 
with Tom Butt from Richmond and in my experience. So I'm honored to see the growth and having the opportunity to work with staff. I'm an environmental scientist. I've been doing environmental work for more than three decades. So it's part of my passion and I am one of the people seeking re-election. So we'll see how that goes. Maybe another turnover on the board, but I have fully enjoyed my time and really learned a lot that I did not know about energy, in, including today. So thank you. Thank you, Barbara. And last but not least, San Anselmo. <laughs> I was actually online, but I couldn't figure out what button to push so I could show up. <laughs> Uh, my name's Ford Green. Um, I've been a, I'm a four-term uh, member of the town council in San Anselmo, and currently it's mayor. And I've been on the MCE board, I think, uh, from about 2008 or, or 2009. Uh, mm -hmm. Originally, when Charles McClashen and Dawn were going around trying to recruit municipalities to be part of the JPA, in Marin, which was then no easy task. Uh, in San Anselmo, I was the swing vote uh, that got us on board with, uh, with MCE. Uh, I'm a lawyer by trade, and uh, a good portion of my practice in the past has been involved litigating against uh, religious cult groups, such as the uh, Scientology organization. Uh, and I have a lot of experience in consequence in dealing with uh, coercion and propaganda. And so that puts me in particularly good stead to be a constructive member of uh, the MCE board in addressing uh, PG&E's bullying and underhanded uh, political and litigation strategies. Uh, the longer serving members will uh, remember uh, Proposition 16 and AB 2145, both of which were uh, PG&E originated efforts to gut uh, the CCAs of uh, our authority. I'm a longstanding member of the executive and technical committees, and I too am gonna miss our departing members. Um, Kate, for uh, your uh, general uh, unflappability and um, capacity to maintain sustained attention, um, Bob for his finance expertise, Bob McCaskill and, and Ray also, uh, and Greg Lyman also for his um, general expertise. And I'm, I'm really proud to be a uh, member of MCE. Thank you, Ford. Okay, I think that's everyone, but if there's anyone, um, any of the board of directors who did not have an opportunity to introduce themselves this morning and this afternoon, who might have signed in, please raise your hand so that we can acknowledge you. Oh, it's Mike's here. Yeah, yeah so Mike. I'm sorry, I tuned no, in late, so I missed the opening ceremony. Uh, but uh, very pleased to be a part of this group. It's a wonderful board. Does a lot of great work. I will not be up for re-election next year. So I had a short stint, but I enjoyed every bit of it. And uh, Scott Perkins referred to uh, Don Tatson. And Don, re of course, remains very active in the community mm -hmm. in terms of continuing to push for deep green. And I will do the same thing. So you folks are doing wonderful work. It's a real exciting future that I can see for energy through MCE. So well done. Carry on. Thank you, Thank you very much. Um, Walnut Creek. Hi, sorry. I was a few minutes late coming back, so I don't know if you called my name, but Justin Waddell with the city of Walnut Creek. Mm -hmm. I'm sure many of you know that Walnut Creek has a very long tradition of green initiatives. And uh, I was part of the group that uh, was looking at CCAs prior to joining MCE. Unfortunately, I was not the first board member from Walnut Creek, but uh, I joined shortly thereafter. And uh, we just recently moved all of our city facilities to Deep Green, and we have a lot of initiatives. And I, one of the awards that was just given out a few months ago was from Rossmore about moving people over to Deep Green here in the city. 
I am up for re-election, so you may have to put up with me for a few more years, depending on how this, uh, this ends up. Thank you very much. Is there another? Great. I think we're done, Kate. Fantastic. This has really been great. And, you know, it, it, what a wonderful board of people. I think over the years, as, as MC got larger, we periodically would get apprehensive about how are we going to handle adding more and more people to the board. And I think these rounds of introductions we did this morning and this afternoon uh, just shows how fabulous it is to have so many people on this board who are so committed and with d diverse backgrounds and interests. Um, it's just terrific. So I'm, I'm so glad we did this. And I, I feel like I think I might have said this this morning, but I feel like MCE is just in great hands uh, going forward with with all of your leadership. So with that, um, we have an item that actually sounds like real business, unlike just the interesting stuff we've been doing, um, which is the addition of board members to committees. This should be a quickie, but Dawn, do you want to yeah. take the lead? I think it, it will be a quickie. Um, thank you. This is our only action item for today. Um, but we have um, a board member, um, Director Scales Preston, who has expressed interest in sitting on our executive committee, which we're thrilled about. Um, so this is an opportunity to make that um, addition. Um, also, if there are folks that are interested in joining any of our committees at this time, we can certainly do that as well. Um, of course, our executive committee and technical committee are standing committees and there's uh, room on those. Um, we also have an ad hoc bonding committee um, where we are going to be losing um, at least three of the members um, at the end of the year. So we're especially interested in finding folks interested in bonding. Um, we will have an opportunity for folks to join that committee um, later in the year at a future board meeting. So you don't have to uh, volunteer now if you want to give it some thought. But um, in beyond the addition of Director Scales Preston to the executive committee, uh, are there any other board members that would like to um, request participation in one of our committees? Remember, the technical committee is the best. We may need to have people think about it. John, are you going to um, jump on a committee? I am. Oh, I'm sorry. Who are you talking to? You. Oh, I'm on the technical committee. Oh, that's right. I'm on technical. You know, I'm old. I don't. Yeah. All right, I'm on technical. You're technical. <laughs> Smart man. I, 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 mean, I think the exec committee meet, uh, conflicts with some other meetings I have. That's why I think I uh, can't serve on that, but thank you. I, Kate, I suggest that the technical committee be renamed the nitty gritty committee because <laughs> it really is the nitty gritty, real, it is real nitty -gritty. stuff. That's why it's good. Yeah. <laughs> By the way, we are also in need of uh, board members on the audit ad hoc committee as well uh, that we can address at the next meeting, just in case there is interest. Those are the nitty gritty numbers people. <laughs> <laughs> well, we may need to send everybody home with a little homework to think about what committee they might want to serve on if, if no one wants to um, commit right now. Yeah, I, I just want to add, I think it would be helpful if I knew when these committees meet. Do we have that posted somewhere? We do, and, um, and we can resend that out to everyone. Uh, but just as a reminder, our executive committee meets at 1215 on the first Friday of the month, and our, exec, our technical committee meets at 830 um, on the first Thursday of the month, uh, 830 a.m first Thursday. Um, if you really want to be part of a committee and the time is bad for you, we can uh, potentially go through the exercise of shifting times around if you have a standing conflict. Um, that can be a little tricky with some of our heavily, uh, with, with our committees that already have a lot of folks on it, but we're very happy to try to do that. Yeah, Kate, this is Greg Lyman. Yeah, Greg. I, I want to um, acknowledge that uh, a, I think, Kevin, you've said this earlier today, that a, a large number of the people that are uh, terming out and, and not serving actually serve on many uh, committees. I serve on three committees, uh, and I will agree TechCom is the best, uh, 
but I've served on uh, several ad hoc, uh, ad hoc contracts and most recently the ad hoc, I'm serving currently on that ad hoc uh, bond, in, uh, bond investment committee. Um, it, and I want to make sure that everybody understands that um, the comments that have been made today about the people who are leaving is because we have been active and uh, we certainly need to uh, look out to all of you to do your homework to become active members in all of these committees. I just, uh, Kate, I just, this is Elizabeth, I just Elizabeth. wanted to, to explain the 1215 time for the executive committees because I have a conflict with a meeting with the North Bay Watershed Association and it ends just in time enough for me to get down the road <laughs> to San Rafael, or is that up the road? In, in any case, to get to the meeting. And so because I won't be on the executive committee after November, then there's an opportunity for somebody if the time needs to be adjusted. And I didn't sign up for the technical committee because it's called technical committee. And <laughs> I started attending so I could really learn more about energy and some of the issues, the nitty gritty issues. So yeah, if you call it the nitty gritty. It has more appeal if you call it, it the nitty gritty. More, <laughs> more, more appeal. It is fascinating and it's really rich. And I get behind anybody who wants to um, be part of that, um, just even attending. Um, and uh, so it really helps, and it actually kind of helps make our um, regular meetings shorter because there can be fewer questions if you really understand the underlying uh, information. Good promo, Elizabeth. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Anyone, anyone else with any comments or questions? Okay, Dawn, remind us of what we need to approve right now. We just need um, someone who might be interested in making a motion to add Director Skills Preston to the Executive Committee. So we'll move. Okay. That motion. Oh, second. Second. All right, and now we're going to need to do a roll call vote, unfortunately, given virtual reality here. Arlene, you are on. Who was the actual motion maker? There were three of you. Should I just take a Pick one. Sure, just pick one. I'm from Contra Costa and I've known her a long time and I want to make the motion. I, I, I accept it. And I, I accept it. And Barbara, you with the second? I think Edie Bersan is. Okay. Whoever wants I'll, I'll to take it. This is cause such a congenial group. I know, I know. Okay. That's because we're not all on the technical committee. <laughs> uh. <laughs> okay, roll call. Mm. Belvedere. Yes. Benicia. Yes. Concord. Yes. Contra Costa County. Yes. Puerto Madera. Yes. El Cerrito. Yes. Fairfax. Yes. Larkspur. Yes. County of Marin. Yes. Napa and all five Napa cities. Did Brad sign off? Okay. Novato. Yes. Oakley. Yes. Richmond. Yes. Ross. Yes. San Anselmo. Yes, and I'm going to have to sign off. Okay. San Rafael. Yes. San Ramon. Yes. Sausalito and Mill Valley. Yes. Tiburon. Molly left. Walnut Creek. Aye. Thank you. And we have nearly yes from Lafayette. Uh, and Napa is back, and I just got got back in, so I could. <laughs> vote. Thank you, Brett. <laughs> Thank 
you. All right, great. If we picked up everybody now, terrific. Yes. Okay, I think we're good. So we're now at my favorite, very favorite section of every board retreat agenda, which is the new technology section. And uh, as you know, this year we're having a presentation on renewable hydrogen, and I'm really pleased that Supervisor Joya is here um, to introduce this item. And I know it's something you're very passionate about, John, and, and know a lot about. So I'm gonna hand this right off to you. Thank, thanks, Kate. And I am gonna be relatively brief in my introductory comments because I get to turn it over to Janice, who's gonna make, uh, I'm looking forward to her presentation about green hydrogen. Um, she's the CEO of the Green Hydrogen Coalition. And I, I just wanna say, after listening to everybody introduce themselves, it's always impressive to hear, you know, everyone's commitment um, to innovation and, and clean energy. And so it's really great to be working with everyone. And I, I have to say, I think, are we at the point where us Contra Costans have outnumbered the original founding county of uh, Marin representatives? But, uh, so it's great to see, it's a great partnership. Um, and um, I, I remember, serving on some regional government bodies with Supervisor McGlashan and remember seeing when he was going through this fight, how hard, um, how hard he worked and uh, you know, the founders at Marin just to acknowledge um, having done amazing work. So Contra Costa is glad to join Marin. <laughs> um, so I just wanna put in perspective a little bit here. Um, and some of it comes from my work over the last few years being a, a member of the California Air Resources Board which um, implements, um, which helps develop and implement the state's uh, climate action policies and greenhouse gas uh, policies um, through our various scoping plans and regulations. And, um, you know, uh, green hydrogen is gonna be vital to meeting our carbon neutrality goals and our greenhouse gas reduction goals. Um, you all know that solar and wind uh, which are great, also have limitations about you know when that energy can be produced. And one of the um, uh, assets of uh, hydrogen is that it it is high on reliability because you can create um, energy from hydrogen um, 24 seven. You can do it when the uh, wind's not blowing and the sun's not shining. So it's gonna play an important role as, as one of the strategies. You know, you already may know of hydrogen being used. Some of the AC transit buses that you see going around are um, fueled by hydrogen fuel cell. If you know, if you have a Toyota Mirai or a Honda Clarity, um, those are a hydrogen fuel cell. Um, so we think of it a lot in the context of transportation, but it also plays an important role on uh, stationary uh, energy um, for buildings and so it doesn't have to just be in a transportation sector. Um, in fact, I know Don and I and, and some representatives from the Barrier Quality Management District had a chance um, before the pandemic um, to go down to UC Irvine, and, and that, which, is, um, uh, which is a national fuel cell research center, of which some of their work uh, is on hydrogen, fuel, hydrogen fuel cell. Um, so there are things happening in this field. And um, with the, some of the new regulations passed by the Air Resources Board to electrify the transportation uh, sector, uh, for example, every new public transit bus starting in 2029 has to be zero emission. And that means either hydrogen fuel cell or battery electric. Um, half of all, the new truck rule, half of all trucks sold in California in 2035 are gonna need to be zero emission we're doing work on a new uh, fleet rule that's gonna even faster than that require fleets like FedEx and UPS to have all zero emission. Some of them have chosen hydrogen as the fuel instead of battery electric. But I think that's gonna help um, continue the strong investment and kickstart even more investment and research into the, into the various um, uh, technologies to utilize energy from hydrogen and of course, um, much of the hydrogen today, most of it is not green. And that's the goal is moving from fossil fuel produced hydrogen to, um, to green hydrogen. And we're gonna hear about that. So um, 
I, I just want to say that um, it is it is still while it's still a, a developing technology, it is really I think going to play an important role both on the transportation building and general power power electrification side. So that's just a little context. Um, and at this point, I will introduce uh, Janice Lynn, who is the CEO of the Green Hydrogen Coalition. Um, and I know that the, the paper that's been attached is really good and very informative. And so I know we're all looking forward to hearing how we can incorporate this strategy into our own energy portfolio. Thank you so much, Supervisor Joya. And I know that our um, COO, Vikan Kasarjian, has, has um, a few additional words uh, by way of introduction. Um, and I just want to, um, with my eye on the clock, um, want to ask if we can um, move through the presentation as quickly as possible, maybe hold questions till the end, um, and then we will um, be able to have a little bit of discussion uh, before our clock runs out. Um, I know we promised to get folks out of here by three and we may have to defer our, um, our bonding item uh, possibly or part of it. Um, but with that, uh, Vikan, go ahead and uh, I'll turn it over to you for the introduction. Thank you. Uh, okay, I would like to introduce uh, a fan of MCE, Ms. Janice Lynn. Uh, Janice Lynn is the founder and president of the Green Hydrogen Coalition. She brings more than two decades of experience in clean energy strategy market development and corporate strategy. Uh, during this time, she has advised a diverse range of clients, including renewable energy equipment manufacturers and service providers, uh, large corporations diversifying into clean energy and real estate developers building sustainable communities. Uh, in 2009, Janice co-founded the California Energy Storage Alliance and served as its executive director until 2019. And Janice holds a Master in Business Administration from Stanford Graduate School of Business, a Bachelor of Science from Wharton School, University of Pennsylvania, and a Bachelor of Art in International Relations from the University of Pennsylvania's College of Arts and Science. Please welcome Janice. Thank you, Vikan. Thank you, uh, Dawn and Supervisor Joe. I want to um, Say so I was so honored when you asked me to present today. It's a, for a wonky energy person like myself, it's a little bit like getting invited backstage to your favorite band. And, uh, <laughs> and I, you know, I never shared this with Dawn, but, um, you know, that often in my presentations, which I do all over the world, I talk about Margaret Mead and um, her famous quote, that uh, goes something like this, um, never doubt that a group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. And indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. And whenever I mention that quote, I always think of all of you. And um, I really wanna thank you for your leadership. Um, Supervisor Joa, thank you for your leadership at the Air Resources Board. Um, you are a case study of that quote. And when I was uh, getting started with energy storage and CISA back in 2010 and really, really getting beat up by the utilities and, you know, Dawn, you were a huge source of inspiration for me because, you know, I would get phone calls and get yelled at, but then I'd look at what you were going through and I was like, dang, she's tough. <laughs> So um, I would say, uh, you know, I, I'm not only a friend, but, um, you know, a huge fan and, and, uh, and I'm delighted to be here today. So I, I know we're, we're on a time schedule and my goal today is to share with you um, also my personal journey with green hydrogen and why I'm so excited and why I call it a super game changer. And uh, uh, I will share that, um, you know, I first heard about green hydrogen in 2010, right about the same time I was starting CISA. And it was a uh, scientist from Fraunhofer in Germany who came over, sat me down and said, Janice, this is how the future is going to go. You know, we have solar, we have wind, we have renewable energy. And you know what? We're going to be able to use renewable energy to decarbonize the gas sector. We're going to have this thing called power to gas. And we're going to use that green hydrogen to decarbonize transportation and industry. 
And I said, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. I mean, this is 2010. When the guy left, I was like, that was really cool, but about the kookiest thing I ever heard. So I, I just want you to know, I started as a real skeptic and here I am 10 years later, um, you know, explaining to the world, I, I'm so passionate about it. I stepped down from CESA and I founded this new nonprofit. Uh, and and I, I believe that green hydrogen is a super game changer. And I define super game changer as one, the ability to really accelerate decarbonization. And we need to do everything we can as urgently as possible. Two, um, really give the boot to fossil fuels, not only in the power sector, but other sectors too, and to do so in, in an affordable and equitable way. So um, with that, I uh, the last thing I wanted to say is I started to look more seriously into green hydrogen in 2016 when as executive director of CESA, we started to ask the question, uh, when we start, when we achieve our high penetration renewables and 100% renewable goal, what kind of storage will we need? And so we did an analysis to look at um, sort of the net load that we would have to serve under a 100% scenario, just you know, dialing it up from 2016. And we plotted it, we created a flock of ducks through a course of a year. And it, you know, looking at that resulting plot, I'll show it to you in a bit, it was clear uh, after looking at it for about 10 seconds that we would need multi-day and seasonal storage. Um, and I think the events as of late point to a need for that, a need for fuel diversity, and uh, a way of bringing in clean power to provide that that uh, you know needed um, capacity going forward. So um, that's my preamble, and uh, thank you for inviting me. And I know we're going to run out of time, so I also wanted to say I'm a resource. Please feel free to call me anytime. My contact info will be in here. Next slide, please. Um, so first, I wanted to just say a couple things about the GHC. Um, we started the GHC as a 501c3. Um, we're still waiting our IRS designation. And uh, this is a mission-driven endeavor. And our goal is to facilitate policies and practices to advance both the production and use of green hydrogen at scale, we should probably insert at scale, in all sectors where it will accelerate a carbon-free energy future. And uh, we're a little different. Um, first of all, we're an educational nonprofit, but we're really prioritizing green hydrogen project development at scale and looking at opportunities to leverage multi-sectoral opportunities to, again, simultaneously scale supply and demand. Because the situation with hydrogen, it's a little different than where we were with, say, energy storage broadly 10 years ago. Hydrogen is a very mature global commodity. Um, and I think the other thing I wanted to mention, it's so mature, it's been around for decades, used in many industrial processes to the tune of about 100 million metric tons globally. Um, virtually all of that is made from fossil fuels, as Supervisor Joa said. Uh, if you looked at the carbon emissions just from current hydrogen production today, it would surpass all the carbon emissions of the country of Germany. So in its own right, if we can use green hydrogen to displace that gray hydrogen made from fossil fuels, we would have a significant impact. And the other exciting thing is this little tiny molecule has a role in so many other sectors and has the ability to decarbonize sectors we never even thought possible, like aviation. And uh, we have a whole nother thing on aviation. In fact, yesterday, the GHC sponsored a free public webinar that looked at aviation, uh, heavy duty transport and mining. So I invite you guys to take a look at that if you're curious, but zero carbon long haul air travel, that's gonna happen in our lifetime. And the sooner we can get it going, the sooner it can happen. So next slide, please. When I say green hydrogen, um, I'm defining it as all pathways to use renewable sources, pr uh, primary energy um, at the top could be electricity, solar, wind, and hydro, and through a process called electrolysis, use the electricity to split water into hydrogen and oxygen atoms to produce hydrogen. Um, another way you can do it is through biomass or biomethane. Uh, biomethane comes from uh, any kind of biogas, 
and you can, um, through a steam methane reformation process, very similar to how they reform natural gas today, extract green hydrogen. In the biomass case, um, there are multiple pathways today to, at under high temperature in a closed loop process, to gasify that <coughs> organic matter, again, to produce green hydrogen. The resulting green hydrogen molecule is identical to the gray hydrogen molecule. And that's good news because that entire safety regime that has existed for decades under the storage, transportation, management, there's Department of Transportation uh, standards, that's all relevant for green hydrogen. So we're not starting from scratch. Next slide, please. So um, I wanna just talk a bit about um, big picture. These are five reasons why I believe Green hydrogen is a super game changer and why the GHC is per pursuing momentum and its acceleration as fast as possible. Um, I talked about commercially viable. So here's what's different from 10 years ago and today. What's different uh, 10 years ago, um, the cost of renewable electricity was at a much higher price point. Today, renewable electricity, as you are all well aware, is the lowest cost source of energy at the margin in most places around the planet. And it is a very viable and scalable way to make green hydrogen through electrolysis. Second reason, um, this little molecule, because it's so flexible, it can be converted back to electricity through a fuel cell. It can also be combusted in lieu of natural gas. It has the ability to repurpose existing infrastructure and be a great new career pathway for a skilled workforce that has historically worked on fossil fuels. Now they can work on something cleaner and uh, better for the planet, better for society and communities. Um, I already talked about how green hydrogen can decarbonize a pre-existing globally traded commodity all over the world. Um, imagine agriculture. Most uh, fertilizer used today is made from ammonia. Ammonia is probably 80% of the, uh, <laughs> the application where 80% of the gray hydrogen is made today. Imagine if we were using green hydrogen instead to make green fertilizer and now green produce. Um, but uh, next point, so that brings me to decarbonizes many sectors. We've always thought about wind and solar, which is so cost effective now is just kind of limited to the power sector and we're going to have curtailment. Well, now we can take that wind and solar and be using it literally to electrify uh, and, and, and use that abundant, limitless, low cost renewable energy resource to make hydrogen to displace fossil fuels in other sectors. Um, and I talked about aviation and heavy industry. In fact, last Last month, the, um, a, a, a um, hydrogen train was just uh, put into commission in Austria. Um, I think Austria is first. I think they've done this in Canada as well. And then my last, and this is where I started personally, is that green hydrogen is the key to helping us achieve 100% renewable energy in the power sector affordably, flexibly, and reliably. So, um, I'm going to go to the next slide again in the interest of time and talk about my favorite coal plant. So this is a picture of Inner Mountain Power Project. It's the last significant coal plant serving California. It's an 1800 megawatt coal-fired coal facility in central Utah. It's interconnected with Los Angeles and Southern California through a high voltage transmission line. Um, the reason I love this coal plant is this entire facility is getting repurposed to becoming a dispatchable renewable energy facility. Um, the contract has already been awarded to Mitsubishi to replace the coal boilers with a hydrogen turbine. And on July of 2025, initially um, that hydrogen turbine will combust a blend of 70% natural gas and 30% green hydrogen. That green hydrogen percentage will be increased uh, so that on or before, hopefully much before 2045, it will be combusting 100% green hydrogen. This is good news because one, this is a excellent um, uh, uh, 
career path for the existing workforce that's worked on this coal plant for decades, uh, and uh, they see a bright future. Uh, two, it's, it's great because it takes advantage of this land, um, the balance of plant, the valuable interconnections, and, uh, and the other thing that's really exciting about this plan, it's in the high desert of Utah, so it has abundant renewable energy resources. Next slide, please. Um, that's one end of the spectrum, so really large scale. The other end of the spectrum with green hydrogen is, uh, as I mentioned earlier, you can convert it uh, back into electricity with something called a fuel cell. Everybody's familiar with fuel cells. Um, there were two things that really surprised me in my journey. One, uh, this ability to combust hydrogen as a drop-in fuel replacement for natural gas and have it serve also as a long-term storage solution for wind and solar. Uh, and, and I didn't know this, but all, virtually all the turbines that we use today can combust some blend and a few manufacturers, Siemens, Mitsubishi, have announced that very soon they will have turbines that are, like soon as in 2025, have the ability to combust 100% hydrogen, which runs hotter, so there's some modifications that are required. On the other end of the spectrum, you know, I've always known about fuel cells. It wasn't really, you know, my thing, because I've always been a renewable energy person, but, uh, uh, and most of the fuel cells that I was aware of, um, you know, that we see commercialized through the S-chip kind of run on natural gas. But the reality is natural gas has to be reformed to hydrogen so that the fuel cell can use it. Like the, actually the preferred input is hydrogen, one. And two, there's actually several manufacturers that make fuel cells that are optimized for hydrogen and optimized for emergency backup. Here's a picture of one of them. This is uh, from a company called UltraG. They have installations literally all over the country. They tend to be small, uh, but what they're doing is they're providing emergency backup in remote locations. This particular photo is providing emergency backup to this traffic signal. And, uh, you know, when I called, I'm like, really, you guys are selling these things? How do you make that pencil out? Because generators are so cheap. He's like, look, our CapEx is higher, but over the lifetime of the equipment, we're much cheaper because we don't have any maintenance. Our hydrogen fuel, it's there, it sits there, it doesn't go anywhere, and it lasts forever. Diesel and other fossil fuels, after a while, they go bad maintenance costs, so it's just like the overall value proposition is better. Um, next slide, I already talked about the hydrogen turbine. Um, uh, this is a slide courtesy of Mitsubishi, so let's keep going. Okay, remember earlier I told you the picture that we drew in 2016, if you go to slide eight, please. Uh, what would happen if California, this was taking the CAISO 2016 Oasis data, cranking it up, so available wind and solar, the production exactly met demand, and then we plotted the net surplus and the net deficits. And this is what we saw. Anything below that line was a deficit, anything above the line was a surplus, and again, it was a 10-second exercise. Wow, we're going to need some serious multi-day storage and uh, seasonal storage. At the time, CISA, the largest energy storage resource that CISA was representing was pumped hydro and compressed and liquid air, and that was not gonna cut it. And so that's what got me on this search. What else is there? Are there is there some new innovation? And then I came back to my buddy from Fraunhofer, and I'm like, yep, you're right, all along. So um, this was the chart, and, uh, and the reality, this is achievable today. Uh, it is absolutely achievable today, and from my, um, my study, it's the only viable way to store renewable energy cost-effectively at such large scale. Next slide. So let's talk a bit more about Intermountain Power Project, which is the GHC's first priority. Um, again, remember our, our role as, an, as a uh, momentum building nonprofit is we want to accelerate these projects at scale. We're working on some other regional projects in the Western US. Be happy to talk to you guys about that at another time. Um, but Intermountain is an interesting case. It is one of probably a dozen projects of this scale that have been announced globally. It is the largest such project in North America. And I'm, I'm happy to tell you, after having been involved, uh, LADWP is the primary off-taker. This particular plant is owned by the government of Utah. This project's going to happen. 
and uh, and it's timely. And I, I would say, you know, <laughs> hopefully it'll be a role model for doing more of this uh, for the benefit of California and other places. Um, what's really exciting, if you go to slide 10, is not only are we um, utilizing existing infrastructure to transition from coal to a cleaner fuel to ultimately 100% carbon-free fuel, but we're also starting with a beachhead of what can be a much larger at scale hydrogen infrastructure that can serve other power plants, other applications, and other states. So um, we think it's a great opportunity to focus on development of market products and contracting mechanisms to create what I call a regional reliability reserve for the entire Western United States. If you go to the next slide, what's really special about this particular location is it's rich in a lot of resources. We talked about renewables, we talked about ample electric transmission capacity, both in and out of the plant. They have land, they have water, um, and a skilled workforce, and this uh, little, well, this thing here, it's a salt dome. What that is, is uh, you know, this plant just happens to sit on the Western United States' largest salt dome formation. And salt domes are a proven way of storing hydrogen. Um, there's a couple of salt domes already that have been storing hydrogen since the 1980s in Texas. And uh, it is so vast, um, this salt dome has the ability to have like 100 caverns. They're gonna start with one, and the one cavern they will start with will be so large, it's um, uh, probably about the size of the Empire State Building underground, and it has the ability to store the equivalent of something like enough hydrogen for 200,000 buses, to, to give you a, an idea of the scale and scope. That's a very bulk uh, renewable energy resource. So just to wrap up here, because I know we're very time constrained, um, I, I did want to address on the next slide what some of the barriers have been and a potential pathway forward. Um, and since we were just talking about storage, I mean, clearly hydrogen, green hydrogen as a small molecule needs to have some kind of containment facility, right? We're lucky with IPP that the salt dome is literally right underneath the plant. But remember, there are other ways to store energy in bulk fashion, pipelines, are a great way to store um, a lot of energy. Uh, you can think of it as like a 600 mile pipeline is equivalent to one salt cavern. It just happens to be about 600 miles from central Utah to Los Angeles. And you should know that there are hydrogen pipelines that are in commercial operations in the US today, hundreds of miles of them, remember it's a commodity product, mostly connecting oil refineries because they're very large users of hydrogen. There is in fact 15 miles of hydrogen pipeline in Los Angeles today. So, so anyway, just because you don't have a salt cavern doesn't mean that you don't have a storage facility. And the other thing I wanted to say, there are other underground formations that are candidates for storing hydrogen in large quantity, such as retired natural gas storage facilities, retired underground oil wells. We just haven't focused on it. So um, that brings me to barriers. And I will start with item three on this list because you know that's my point about studying it. Uh, we really, um, California has made great, great progress looking at hydrogen, but primarily for light duty transportation, which is a great application. And I would like to see more fueling stations. In fact, I'd like to see fueling stations for heavy duty transportation and take out some diesel trucks. But that application as a consumer of hydrogen is too small to scale the production and get the cost down. Um, the equipment to make hydrogen is a lot like where solar was 10 years ago. Plants don't operate 24 seven, but the equipment that you need to produce the hydrogen is commercially available. There's a lot of suppliers. We just haven't gotten on the scale economy curve. So there's a huge amount of opportunity to building projects and building them bigger to drive down the cost and open new applications. The starting point is we have to start planning for it. 
It needs to be part of the integrated resources planning process. It needs to be part of our SB 100 um, planning process. Uh, I, I, I just don't think uh, it's acceptable that we would have a model for the, for the state that says, yes, we'll achieve SB 100 and we'll just keep a bunch of gas plants online when there is a commercially viable alternative. So that's um, the one barrier. And I think the solution is let's start right away and start modeling this. Uh, They're making a lot of progress in Europe and other places. So it's not like we're even first. Secondly, I touched on the point that the projects have been too small. And so our focus is, hey, we love hydrogen fueling for light duty transport, but let's find ways that we can look at applications, large offtake applications in other sectors, starting with the power sector. Admittedly, combusting a molecule of hydrogen may not be the highest value at the margin, but it's so large that we can use that application to drive down the cost. And by the way, the power sector kind of needs this if we want to keep the lights on and keep everything affordable. So um, demand aggregation is really key. And you know what, if we can scale it and get the cost down for AC transit and you know, 16 bucks a kilogram at the pump is challenging. We need to get that cost down. The high cost of green hydrogen transport and storage. If you don't have a salt cavern, you're kind of stuck. And how hydrogen is transported today is on trucks. Yes, we can do that, it's very expensive. But if we are able to aggregate demand in a particular geography, why not inject in the natural gas pipeline up to a certain limit? That's doable. Hawaii has 12% hydrogen in their gas pipeline. Or alternatively, build a hydrogen pipeline leveraging the existing gas pipeline right away. You can move incrementally. And then finally, and this is an area where I'd love to brainstorm with all of you more, is um, we don't have the right market structure in the power sector to really take advantage of the flexibility and the modularity of electrolysis. Because really, you can make green hydrogen anywhere you have access to the electric sector and access to a power purchase agreement or renewables. Because remember, we want to make this from renewable energy. Um, we need a lot of reform on the market design. We need products for, how about green RA? How about products for green RMR? The liability must run. So I think that there is a missing aspect in the market that we need to incentivize and bring these solutions on board. So, you know, here we need broad ecosystem participation. And uh, I was so excited when Vicken and Don invited me to be here because one thing's for sure, uh, you got you all with your leadership are a leading indicator of what's to come. So thank you. And on the last slide is my contact info. Happy to answer any questions or to drop off uh, as, as uh, per your schedule. Great. Thank you so much, Janice. That was fascinating. And thank you, Supervisor Joya. Are there uh, questions or comments from board members? Director Kohler. Yeah, just a question for Janice. Um, and perhaps this is my ignorance, but I thought hydrogen was uh, poses a health and safety hazard. And you mentioned about storage and natural gas storage. Some of us worked on Aliso Canyon with the mm -hmm. evacuation. So um, how do you deal with the explosive hazard and, uh, you know, not just for transport, but I'm just not so thrilled with the idea of using natural gas storage, which is under a lot of residential properties. So yeah. what's your quick answer to that? <laughs> uh, the quick answer, um, any power or fuel supply is inherently dangerous. It's concentrated. It, you know, it has, it contains a lot of energy. It's very energy dense. Um, the, the reality about hydrogen is this is a very mature industry. Um, there are two salt caverns that have been storing hydrogen since the 1980s. There are hundreds and hundreds of miles of 100% hydrogen pipelines. Again, it's their dedicated hydrogen pipelines. It's a small molecule. They're a little different than natural gas pipelines. There have been no incidents with these pipelines. So um, I would say that's very good news because it means there's a well-established safety regime. And hydrogen also is a little different than natural gas. 
in that it contains no carbon. If there is a leak, it's a molecule, it disperses, it's extremely light, so it disperses very quickly. It's not to say an accidents will never happen, but a large leakage of hydrogen will disperse quickly and it won't, um, it won't, it's not toxic in and of itself. If there is um, some sort of leakage coupled with a fire, just like natural gas or gasoline or any other thing, it can catch fire. It tends to catch fire and dissipate quickly because it's, it's a gas and it rises quickly and it's not going to stay and spill on the ground like well, other I'm not worried about toxicity. I'm worried more about explos explosive hazard, which I yeah. think is a bigger hazard than a long-term toxicity. So I hear you, but I think there are um, some challenges that really need to be looked at. But thank you for your presentation. Director Beerson and then Kuhnhart. Hi, uh, Eddie Bersan here. Um, I always, every time I hear hydrogen, I think of the Hindenburg. I mean, <laughs> it just goes straight there. Uh, now, if I understand correctly, what you're trying to do is displace diesel for hydrogen, you know, in trucking. Is that basically what you're looking at? Yes, um, so hydrogen has the ability to displace diesel. It has the ability to displace jet fuel even. So there are certain applications that we never dreamed would be decarbonizable. Air travel is one of them. Shipping, hydrogen can be used as a shipping fuel in the form of ammonia. In fact, I know Maersk and some of these global shipping companies, they're, you know, they're trying to decarbonize too. LPG. I, I wanted to go back to the uh, uh, the trucking. Um, wouldn't this sort of like require? Right now, we're going through having electrical vehicle charging places all over the place, and we're having, quite frankly, uh, it's not going very fast as far as I'm concerned. Uh, the idea of doing electrical and hydrogen. Uh, I mean, one, it's, it would seem that expanding one technology has got to be, it may be done at the cost of the other uh, because there's just so much construction that you can do. So mm -hmm. is, are the Germans or the Europeans using a lot of hydrogen for transportation and trucking? And I'm curious how that works. Sure, I'm, I'm happy to comment on that. And um, my view and the GHC's view is we actually need all of the above. So i um, a big fan of electric vehicles. Um, in fact, we manage another group called the Vehicle Grid Integration Council. Um, the, where, where hydrogen as an alternative to battery electrics really shines is any time you have an application with a high duty cycle, so not enough downtime to uh, have enough time to recharge the battery and or a high payload. Because anytime you have high utilization and high payload, meaning you have a truck and you need to pull or carry a lot of weight, the weight of a battery starts displacing the weight, your, your ability to usefully carry other weight. That makes sense. So. Um, perhaps, uh, you know, a, a, somebody, uh, UCI did an analysis. If you, a, an extreme example is a, uh, you know, transcontinental ship. If you were to make a transcontinental ship into a battery electric, most of the ship hold space would be used to hold the batteries and there won't be much room left anymore to, you know, usefully carry cargo. But as a hydrogen, because hydrogen is more dense, it's actually very lightweight. It's lighter than liquid fuels. You would uh, a hydrogen fueled ship would have more space even than its diesel or bunker bunker oil counterpart. So my my view is we need both. And uh, what's interesting is there's an intersection between the two between the power sector and now uh, you know another bridge. So power sector can charge batteries. The power sector can also be leveraged um, 
through, say, distributed electrolysis to make hydrogen fuel for fueling stations for trucks. That's, that's a great connection point. When you say electrolysis, you mean like breaking up water, basically. It's Correct. Well. Yes. Okay. Now, when the hydrogen is energized, is water the byproduct? Um, so there's, so when you take, uh, so hydrogen, you can think of it as a storage medium. It needs to be created from some other primary energy source. So let's say we used wind and solar, we split water. The one byproduct is oxygen, which actually has value. You can capture that and use it for other things. The other by is the hydrogen. The hydrogen can be used as a fuel input. It can go into a gas turbine and be combusted either as a blend or as a total um, <laughs> alternative to natural gas, or it can be put into a fuel cell um, and the fuel cell can convert the hydrogen back into electricity. The output of that is water in the fuel cell case because what it's doing is it's putting hydrogen and oxygen molecules back together. And I just want to chime in here that um, the, the transportation application is interesting um, for sure, but the one of the primary focuses that we have at MCE right now is using this as an electricity source. Um, once you've created the hydrogen, it can be stored for very long periods of time and then injected into a fuel cell to create energy, electricity. Um, uh, so that's, that's a big part of what we're thinking about as well. Yes, and, and um, so you can use it locally. Um, there, I mean, you can buy hydrogen storage tanks at various pressures commercially today. They're, you know, you can, they're made out of steel, there's carbon fiber, they can be very lightweight. And it is theoretically possible to make hydrogen locally, say within a, you know, a, a small footprint. Uh, in let's say you're in a wooded area, <laughs> you don't have a lot of renewable resource, you could just make the hydrogen with grid power, store it locally, and in the event of a multi-day power outage, have this green fuel at the ready, perhaps as part of a more integrated um, microgrid that includes other distributed resources as well. Um, so, uh, that's another reason why hydrogen is so interesting because it's so flexible. It can be used centrally and distributed. You can make it, and you can make it through different means. You can make it from electricity, but you know, given that this crowd represents municipal governments, you can also make it from converting organic waste and municipal waste. And I know that there's a law, uh, SB 1383, that requires um, uh, Seventy-five percent of landfill waste that's organic to be diverted either to energy production or compost. This would be one great, uh, you know, application of that waste that would be very useful. Director Kuhnhardt. Kuhnhardt, and then yeah. Wagon Connect, and then we have a member of the public waiting. Janice, this is very exciting and, and really quite thrilling. And, you know, m most of us, especially when we're thinking about new technologies, have the tendency to say, well, a prototype has got to be small because small is beautiful. I think it's absolutely fabulous that you're going for really big with this Intermountain Power Project. Uh, a couple of questions about that one. Are they generating any of their own renewable energy in order to do the electrolysis or are they depending upon others to do that? So um, I can tell you the status of that project is um, IPA, the plant owner in close collaboration with LADWP issued an hydrogen RFP uh, earlier this year. Um, the first stage was an RFI. They just received those responses as of August 27th. From that, by I think early next year, they'll down select and, and decide how to move forward. Um, you know, my, my hunch is that all pathways are on the table. Um, they could procure the hydrogen production as, uh, you know, hydrogen is under like a PPA. They could procure a PPA and do the hydrogen via a tolling agreement. Um, I think there's lots and lots of ways this can go, but it's not 
not decided yet. Is, it, is the electrolysis process dispatchable? Is it easy to turn on and turn off, or is it like a gas peaker plant and it's, it takes a yes. long time? Um, so I love that question. Thank you for asking that because I forgot to mention the electrolysis equipment itself is a modifiable load. And that's one of our recommendations through the GHC that um, when you think about green hydrogen, not only do you think about aggregating demand and getting to scale quickly, but make sure that we value all the benefits that it can provide. And one of the great things about electrolysis is you can turn it on and off. So actually the very act of turning it on and off can serve as a, uh, a resource in the ancillary services market. Um, so that's one. And two, once you make the hydrogen and you have it stored, it can behave like any other stored fuel. It's a dispatchable alternative fuel that, oh, by the way, because it came from renewable energy is hedged, right? There's a, it's just going to, by definition, be subject to less price volatility. On the usage side, I'm aware of Toyota's um, advance in this, but are you working with Mack Truck or Peterbilt or GMC or any of the major truck manufacturers? Volvo? Um, yes, and uh, I, I think Volvo and who owns Mack Truck and Daimler just announced a joint venture to make hydrogen trucks. You probably all heard of Nikola. Um, you know, the GHA, we're sort of a, a brand new nonprofit. We were just started last fall. Um, so, so far, we don't have any uh, transportation folks in the mix in funding our efforts, uh, but we're working on it because <laughs> we think that's a really important offtake agreement. I know in Utah, there's a lot of interest. They have an inland port and have already started building hydrogen fueling stations in their, you know, main uh, thoroughfare. Uh, transport on-road transportation corridor. Um, our focus has, you know, from the beginning has really been around the, the uh, power sector uh, and renewable sector interface and how can we scale this amazing resource leveraging opportunities like IPP. Thank you um, so and, much. Yeah, and um, NCPA has announced their intention to convert Lodi Energy Center they issued a press release about that, um, I want to say, a month and a half ago, uh, which is located in Lodi to a, a hydrogen turbine as well. Director Wagon Connect. Yeah, this, is, this is Brad Wagon Connect. Um, I, I appreciate what you're talking about. We, we got to see a little, when we went on a um, field trip to a microgrid, we got to see a little application of this being taking excess in, you know, electricity made by solar and then using that to, to uh, make, hi make hydrogen and, and use that for uh, when you needed it. You needed it. Um, but I missed your um, contacts. All right, can you put that up again? Your contact information. Oh, sure, yes. And, and I think this presentation will be distributed to everybody. And um, in the appendix, I've listed a number of the global projects that have been announced around the world. Uh, IPP is the largest in North America, but there are so many uh, getting announced. Australia, uh, Germany, Austria, Denmark, the UK. I mean, it's, um, this is not a, a trend. I would say it's, we're already beyond that point where um, this this is uh, going to, this is where the future is headed. Great, and I think we have a member of the public who wanted to speak, is that right? Thank you. That is correct. Ken Strong. Hello, Ken. Ken, are you still with us? We're not able to hear you. Now, can you hear me now? Yeah. Oh, wonderful. Thank you so much, Janice, for the presentation. I thought it was wonderful and very interesting to hear all the applications. Um, I just wanted to, I guess, ask a question or maybe make a comment. It was my understanding, I was originally concerned about the explosion hazard as well. And it's my understanding that 
um, until natural gas became cheaper, that in England, they used to run 50% hydrogen in their, um, in their uh, gas pipelines um, as, as town gas and That's without true. any real problems. That's true. Okay. Yes, and, and uh, um, you know, another evidence of its safety, um, Toyota is probably, you know, one of the most conservative risk averse car manufacturers and they've commercialized the Mirai now for how many years? Um, so for transportation applications on mobile, you know, there's, there's lots of standards that are in place. And uh, that's not to say that accidents will never happen, but there is a very well-established uh, set of standards and safety regimes, uh, not only domestically, but internationally um, for hydrogen. Great. So I'm very mindful of our time. I think this is a topic we'd all like to talk about much longer, Janice, and I really appreciate your presentation, but I'm very mindful of our time and um, we're sort of getting close to three o'clock and we have one more presentation. So okay. I'd like to move us along if I can. Uh, and Thank hopefully so we'll have opportunities to talk with you again in the future, Janice, because I think many of us are very interested in what you're doing. So thank you. Thank you, and thank you for your leadership, and uh, look forward to working more closely on this topic going forward. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. All right, so now we want to come back and pick up uh, item 7B, which was our, our bond issuance issue relating to owning energy projects, and Director Withy is going to take the lead on this one, I believe. Um, in the uh, interest of time, I'm going to uh, shorten and curtail my remarks um, because what Garth has to say is far more important than what I have to say. Uh, but I want to make one general point, which is uh, what Garth is now going to talk about is the next trans financial transformation of MCE, in my view. Um, I went back and looked up a couple of figures. Um, in for fiscal year 2012, that was 2011, 2012, MC he, MCE started that year with a net position of $318,000. Um, the financial statements that you looked at today, we ended up with a net position of almost $162 million plus $10.5 million in operating reserve. And we did that because we put in place a very robust um, uh, reserve policy and we did not succumb to the um, uh, temptation of using this money for popular projects. We actually went back to the basics and put the money in the bank. That builds on itself. Having that money in the bank, having that reserve, allowed us to get be the first CCA in California to get a credit rated. And now we have two and we've just been upgraded. And so the financial discipline that this agency has had over the years then creates success, which builds on itself. Now, with those reserves, with these credit ratings, we're in a position to make a major transformation of MCE to be able to enter into the capital debt markets and that is going to allow us to potentially invest in purchasing assets, which is going to be able to more control the market and more be able to um, actually achieve the incredibly aggressive goal that we have for re our renewable goals of getting up to 80, 90% or whatever it is by 2030. It's all dependent upon our financial discipline and rigor. And with that, Let's hear to the person who actually knows what he's talking about, Garth Salisbury. Uh, great. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Okay, Thank great. you. Yes. Yeah, Thank you can. so much, Director Withy. And you said it certainly better even than I can. Um, <laughs> but as the Director of Finance... Well, certainly with flair. We appreciate that. Yes, absolutely. Um, I have to say, uh, I too am going to miss your guidance and enthusiasm and unwavering support for furthering, further strengthening MCE's financial position. So. It's unfortunate we're losing so many of our directors who have been here for so long and were here when MCE wasn't so financially strong. 
Um, and that includes Director Sears, Director McCaskill, Director Lyman, and others. And so um, uh, I just I just encourage some of these board members who will be with us for a little bit longer to get involved in some of these ad hoc committees, in particular, the audit committee and, and this committee on bonding as well. So um, as, as Director Withy said so well, um, if we're gonna meet these goals of 85% renewable and 90% GHG free energy on a cost competitive basis by 2030, um, we're gonna have to, to do that in a way that is probably even more efficient than the way we've been doing it, which is through, um, we've been very successful with, with providing this, um, these energy and meeting these energy uh, goals through um, short, intermediate, and very importantly, long-term power purchase contracts. Um, and you know, this has allowed so much of this renewable energy to be built. So um, if we're gonna, again, continue to do that and compete on a com with, with PG&E on a price basis, um, uh, we may have to introduce other methods to do that. Um, so doing so probably would utilize um, the debt markets and the tax exempt debt market to, uh, to be able to purchase ownership interest in either generation facilities or storage facilities. And certainly uh, something along the hydrogen was extremely interesting um, presentation we just heard. So next slide. Um, pretty much talked about this already. Um, one of the important aspects of actually entering the, uh, the capital markets is that it would take about a year from a dead start to get there, to be able to do all the things we need to do, to get ready, to hire um, all the outside help and so on. So um, um, I've certainly advocated and the board has agreed that we should take some of these first steps. Um, and by taking these first four to five steps, we would be about only probably two months away from actually to be able to enter the markets and be able to borrow money uh, to be able to purchase an ownership, ownership interest in a project. So I wanna stress that we don't currently have any specific project in mind. Um, there's nothing out there that we're, we're going after at the moment, but we, again, we want to be ready to do that. So in March of uh, this year, the board approved taking some of these initial steps. Um, these steps included hiring a bond council, financial advisor, um, bond underwriters, and to begin working very importantly on a debt policy for the agency, and then the bond indenture, which is the big document that really dictates how and when we would issue debt. Um, the board also authorized the creation of an ad hoc committee, which had its first meeting on August 31st. Um, and right now, I think we anticipate two more meetings by January of 2021. So the first five steps. So um, we, the first step was selecting a bond council firm, and uh, we have done that. Uh, we have selected the firm of KNL Gates, um, which is a Seattle-based firm, but has um, an office in San Francisco. Um, I would point out that the Gates in k &L Gates is uh, Bill Gates' father, um, who was one of the founders of that firm. And so a real um, underachieving family for sure. Um, but uh, they are on board and we're in final contract negotiations with k &L Gates. The next step is selecting a municipal financial advisor. And um, we need to have an advisor um, um, by MSR, MSRB rules to enter the markets. Um, we have an RFO that's in draft form, and we expect to distribute that by the end of September. And then um, we'll, we'll look at these responses, um, probably have interviews, and then hire a financial advisor. The next is uh, adopting a debt policy. And um, this is a California re law requirement. It's SB 1029. Um, and so we'll pull together some ideas around a debt policy. That, those will be reviewed by the ad hoc committee at the next meeting. We should have draft, a pretty good draft of that by the next meeting. Um, and then that will be, um, as we work on that, uh, that will be put before the board for adoption sometime, probably late this year or early next year. Again, the next big one, working with our new financial advisor and with k &L Gates and with staff is to pull together a bond indenture. And again, this is the document that um, has the requirements and conditions precedent before we issue debt. Um, and then keeping within that, that debt policy, it's the pledge of revenues, the flow of funds, all the covenants and so on. Again, it's the document that's going to outlive us all, quite frankly, if we issue 30 year debt um, and will be there um, as a document that will determine how and when we issue bonds in the future. 
And then finally is selecting the bond underwriter. So those would be selected through an RFP process. Um, that's really sort of the last of the five steps. Um, and we would select those bond, bond underwriters. Um, uh, they're the ones that actually price and sell the bonds to the public. Um, and again, that would be, be the last step we would really do before we would really seriously consider getting into the marketplace. But we would, we would hire them, um, get them on board, um, and then, um, then wait until the opportunity was available for us to actually enter the market. Garth, it's Kevin. Just a quick question: Do, do you have candidates for the uh, for the bankers in mind, or is it premature? I don't want to put you in a spot. Oh no, no. I mean, sir, uh, um, having again, I'm an ex banker. Um, I know the firms that are out there. I know the you know the good ones um, and the ones we'd want to consider. So it's a very large list um, of firms that. Um, are in national firms, local regional firms, and so on. So um, it would be an RFP that probably go probably anywhere from five to 10 different um, recognizable investment banks. Okay, good enough, thanks. Okay. Um, so the next step is to, again to secure that financial advisor. Um, we've, we've begun that process. Um, uh, and next and importantly, once that FA is on board, um, the staff and these consultants will be drafting a debt policy for review and consideration by the ad hoc committee. Next step, bringing that to the board. Uh, same to with this bond indenture. Um, a lot of work needs to be done. We, you know, we, we're a unique entity in so many ways, uh, like the other CCAs, because um, there's this, this specter of opt-outs. And so it's a very hard thing, as it's been for the rating agencies, to get their arms around what that means from a credit standpoint. Um, if we issue debt, we're obligated to repay that debt. Um, and so um, getting, having that bond indenture be one that investors can be confident is going to um, secure their investment into the future is going to be extremely important. So it's going to be a little bit different. It's not going to be an off the shelf kind of a bond indenture because we are so unique. The, the whole CCA model is so unique. And so we're trying to put together a team that's going to help us navigate that really that first time effort to have a bond indenture for a CCA. And we expect to report, report back to the full board in about three to four months um, with an update on this debt policy and a bond indenture. So just wanted to open that up. I know we don't have much time today. Um, uh, we're kind of at the end of, of our time, but just wanted to get your thoughts on this and um, really just talk about what kind of projects might, might we consider owning uh, a piece of or all of in the future. Cool, great, thank you. Uh, comments from the board, questions? Ray. So uh, Kate, it's Kevin, just uh, right now. Oh, sorry. Uh, re remind me again, uh, who are the members of the ad hoc committee? I know I am, but I think we're losing some. We, we are indeed, yes. So what, uh, do we need to go through a process here before the end of the year to make sure that we've got um, a vital ad, ad hoc committee still going forward to take this, this project through? This is Dawn, and I can weigh in on that. We're, we are planning to um, have the opportunity for folks to join the committee in our uh, November board meeting. Um, and it is a pretty hefty committee, actually. We've got six members on it. A lot of times our ad hocs are only three or four. So um, we're doing pretty well um, uh, as is, but we'd love to have other folks join. And there will be an opportunity to do that in November. I just, just want to make sure we have good continuity uh, mm -hmm. uh, to carry us beyond the first of the year. Yeah, so. I think there's three members. There's six members now. I think three are will be rolling off. So, yeah. Ray, did you want to say something? Yeah, I did. Um, you know, I'm one of those members who are rolling off, and so I, will, I won't be on the board when this reaches its fruition. I just want to send a couple of messages to my colleagues here. The first is... Um, I, I realize we're a public agency and Garth has shown you the timeline, and, but I would say that don't mess around here. Go as fast as you can. And as a board, approve this as fast as you can. You know, I've raised a lot of money over the years and not for myself, unfortunately, but for companies. <laughs> and um, uh, in- Oh, come on, that's not true. <laughs> in 1990, we were just about to launch one of the biggest biotech financings to do an off-balance sheet financing of, to fund three major um, uh, anti-cancer products. 
And literally the day before the financing, Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait. And the markets collapsed. And literally that financing was delayed by nine months. And therefore those projects were delayed by nine months. So move as fast as you can, because you never know what you're going to suddenly be hit with. And the second thing I've learned over the years is, and this may scare some of the board members, or, because we're going to be talking big money when, we, when Garth gets round to it, is raise as absolute much money as your underwriters will let you and as the marketplace <laughs> lets you. Do not skimp, raise absolutely the most money that you can. So that's my um, unsolicited advice. And Ray's going to be back on open time repeating this every I single will. meeting after beginning in January 2021. I will. Yeah, Ray, I which will. is a good thing. All right. We have, we have Lyman, Biasan, and then Perkins, who'd like to speak. And then Patterson, I think. Yeah. And then Patterson. Yeah, this is Greg Lyman El Cerrito. As one of those uh, ad hoc committee members that's rolling off, uh, Ray stole some of, of, I was going to reiterate, We both Ray and I said this during the uh, ad hoc meeting, and, and so we're bringing it back to the, the whole, is that it? this is an, an exciting opportunity for us to push this forward, uh, to push our goals forward. Garth said it, but I, I'll reiterate it. Um, and we need to take advantage of our unique position as somebody who has this type of income and cash to, and bond rating to push these projects forward and don't dally. Um, we should be able to do this in as quickly as possible. Um, and and as, the, as two members of the ad hoc that are rolling off, we were pushing staff to do this pretty, pretty quick. Um, and so uh, it's, it's going to be a little disappointing that uh, Ray and I will not be able to, to participate in the final outcome, but uh, please know that we both are very supportive of the MCE having this capability uh, to keep the market uh, evolving. So. Oh. Eddie? Yes. Um, I'm very interested in this, although, uh, quite frankly, I don't have a, fine, a banker background. Uh, and if that's not a disqualifier, I'm definitely uh, interested in, uh, in being there and being the guy to ask all the dumb questions. Okay? Okay. Well, because I'm if I can understand it, then I'm sure we can convince everyone else. And as for speed, well, I'm from New York. So, <laughs> you know, I go for speed. I love it. Scott? Yeah, I'm really looking forward to uh, making this uh, come to fruition. I'm really looking forward to what we can use this money for to help our rate payers, our community, and California as a whole. Uh, there's lots of opportunities out there. This uh, hydrogen project uh, look, looks very interesting, and I'm sure there are others um, behind them. Um, but we're really going to need to look forward to things that can either shift the supply curve or we've got to find ways to shift the demand curve. Mm -hmm. And we're going to have more direct opportunities, I hope, in the supply curve through storage and things like this. And this money could go a long ways towards uh, making some of those happen. Thank you. Great. Elizabeth. So a city that's by water has sun and lots of pipes. I'm very interested in the hydrogen. Um, I want to emphasize the issue of speed. I'm glad we have a New Yorker uh, on board. Um, it cost us dearly. There are two things that cost us dearly when we put the city onto a, um, um, building some solar installations. One was a design that was flawed. And so we had to go back and do some redesign and that cost us time. And we had to negotiate a, a property purchase from Valero who had absolutely no interest in speeding things along or making life easier for solar ins installation. And that ran into Congress that was then talking about uh, an, an a serious threat to municipal bonds. And so that pushed up the rate. And so we barely got our project through and and we 
to this day pay a dear price for that. And um, I don't tell that to my community <laughs> generally, <laughs> but we did pay a dear price to that. So the words are really excellent is um, be absolutely thorough in the project design. And in fact, as I would, I would bring in a third party to make sure it is correct. And then uh, with third party to whoever you contract with with the project and then uh, and then all speed ahead. Fantastic. Anyone else who Direct, wants to comment? Director Kuhnhart. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. I think this is one of the most powerful things that MCE could be doing going forward. And I would emphasize as far as uses, uh, sophisticated storage and management that will uh, serve the multi-layer cake of value that exists in our grid, uh, all the way from um, immediate uh, need to uh, standby uh, RA services. I also want to say that there is an additional uh, group of folks uh, starting with an early spring meeting of the um, Marin County Council of Mayors and City Council members, uh, ad hoc uh, policy leaders called the Ad Hoc Green Microgrid Policy uh, Active Action Group uh, that is going to be very interested in seeing progress made in this. And I would, uh, I would generically put microgrid uh, solution of that, uh, particularly one that serves multiple community benefits, I don't know, in the canal, for example, uh, next to the, or a part of the uh, uh, medical facility there, uh, that, that will really be, that will really ring true among all of our publics. So I think it's, it's quite exciting and you've got exactly the right person in Garth to carry this ahead. Director McCullough, did you wave your hand? I did not, but I unmuted uh, at your direction. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. I think that's it for us. Is that it? All right. Any other, any other comments from anybody? Very exciting, Garth. I think, wow, do you have a lot of support for charging ahead really quickly? Yeah, and Eddie's going to hold you. your feet to the fire, I'm pretty certain. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I think we've actually reached the end of our agenda, as hard it is to not uh, go back to some of these great topics that we've covered today. But uh, Dawn, I don't know if you wanted to say anything just at the end of our board retreat here. Well, I just wanted to um, thank you, um, Director Sears, for your leadership. Um, oh. You've hosted uh, many board retreats over the years. and. Um, uh, I, I think we'll get you for another couple of board meetings, which is great, but um, yeah. this is the last time we'll have the pleasure of having you um, facilitate our retreat. So thank you for all of your service and uh, for helping to make today so productive. Um, and then also a very big thank you to each of our board members who um, dedicated an entire day to, um, to working with us on exploring some of the depths of the energy issues that we're grappling with. We got so much good feedback and I just want to um, acknowledge the, the time that you committed and, and thank you all for um, being part of this um, important organization. No, it's been a great retreat. I think every year we say it's, it's better than the year before and I think that's true again, so. And Don, Don and Don and Kate, it's Kevin. If I could just kind of chime in sure. and express my personal uh, gratitude for Kate's leadership during, oh. I think, the entire period of time that I've been on uh, this board and various committees, um, and uh, the, the other folks who are uh, leaving us, um, who I'm mad at still, but that's okay. <laughs> Because <laughs> we will, we will, we will sorely miss the um, the the wisdom that they have provided to our uh, our little group here. So, um, thank thank you all. This has been a great meeting. You bet. All right, everyone. Have a great rest of the afternoon and evening. Thank and you for the goodie bags and the honey and the tote bag. Wow. I mean, <laughs> yeah, we couldn't feed you snacks today, so that was the best we could do. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Hey, everybody. Thank you. Thank Have you. a great Have a day. day.